Good morning, everybody. If y'all be getting into your seats and turning your cell phones off or at least on vibrate, I'd appreciate that. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rob Bizzle, Chairman of the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission, and would like to welcome you to our public comment session where you have a unique opportunity to, on the record, give comments in regards to the MFC's management of the state's public trust estuary and marine resources. I ask you to limit your comments to three minutes. You will be reminded when you have approximately 30 seconds left. Please state if you represent any group if you addressed the commission last night, you will not be allowed to do so at this time. Remember, this is a time to share a concern or gather information, not to be confrontational. Okay, first up we have Glenn Skinner, followed by Thomas Newman. Hi, uh, Glenn Skinner, Executive Director of North Carolina Fisheries Association, commercial fisherman. Uh, sat here last night, I listened to public comment, and what I took away from the comment, the majority of it was, was somehow these other states to the south have figured out fisheries management. They, they've got it right. They took the gill nets out the water, everything's great. Can't catch a fish anywhere in North Carolina. The fishery's going to hell in a handbag to step up News River where they took the gillnets out. I'm not much for computers, but I went home last night, got on the computer, stayed on there a couple hours, found picture after picture of folks hugging 40, 50 pound red drum all up, up and down the coast here, holding up speckled trout, forums where they're bragging about catching 100 striped bass up to Roanoke on the spawning grounds, hundreds of speckled trout, striped bass, everything. They're catching fish everywhere. Did a little more looking, found article after article from South Carolina to Texas. Overfish, Southern Flounder, South Carolina. Overfish, Red Drum, South Carolina. Flounder rules in Florida, overfished. Red Drum in Florida, new rules. Speckled Trout, Florida, new rules. Alabama, Southern Flounder overfish, Speckled Trout overfish. Louisiana, Red Drum, Southern Flounder and Speckled Trout. Texas, Speckled Trout. Southern flounder. The crap we hear here is not accurate. The fact is everybody's struggling with fisheries up and down the coast. These states that I just showed you, they banned gill nets decades ago. You think a gill net ban in the upper part of the Noose River and Pamlico River is going to create abundant fisheries overnight? I don't think any one of you are that fool. I hope you're not. It's ridiculous. If you want to keep a net plan in place, keep it in place. If you think that it's important for managing that stock, do it. But do it for that reason only. I heard anglers last night say that that striped bass stock up in the central management area cannot sustain any level of fish and mortality and then brag about going up there and all the striped bass they were catching contributing to recreational discard mortality. If that stock cannot sustain any level of fishing mortality, take the hooks out of the water above the ferry lines too. 30 seconds. Close it. But manage fairly. I sent some of y'all an email a couple of days ago. You heard a lot about your duties as commissioners. The primary duty of this commission is to manage our fisheries fairly. The Fisheries Reform Act, our statutes put no more emphasis on comfort, conservation, or recreation than they do food production. Time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thomas Newman, followed by Harvey Pye. Yeah, my name is Thomas Newman. I'm a full-time commercial fisherman. I work part-time for NCFA, and I'm here to talk to you about striped bass and striped mullet. As Glenn said, this this has gone on long enough. This is this is just an allocation on these rivers. We reallocated these rivers to strictly recreational fishing, and this stuff was put here falsely in 2019 through bad old data. 
Uh, we need to reopen these rivers. We need to let commercial fishing come back in and have access to these areas that were denied access from in 2019. Uh, excuse me, I'm getting over a flu. But uh, we also need to relook at this striped mullet stuff. If this fish has been over, they've said this fish stock has been overfished for 18 years, yet the last three years our land has continued to get higher and higher. Uh, something's not adding up here. Uh, Commercial fishermen need these fisheries. We we need to be represented equally, like Glenn said. And it's time for uh, for you guys to start voting and figure out what we're going to do to to make as, access equal for both of the, both user groups. Thank you. Thank you, Harvey Pye, followed by Art Thin Golstad, I guess is the way you pronounce it, but we'll get it. Good morning. I'm here as a head of a hundred member women and men's fishing club, the Fairfield Harbor Fishing Club. I'm also here as a concerned resident who lives along the Noose River, upstream from the Minnesota Cherry Point Branch Ferry. I'm concerned about a decision that you may make allowing gill nets back into the Noose and Pamlico Rivers upstream from the ferry lines. As you consider this vote, I want to quote some facts. First, I'm not using facts from the commercial fishing industry or from the recreational fishing industry. My facts are from two other sources that I think you'll find credible. First one is noahfisheries.gov. And I quote, Fish are caught by their gills in the mesh, and as the fish struggles, it becomes more entangled and dies. If this fish is not a legal keeper, it's bycatch. Unintentional bycatch, but killed nonetheless. Preventing bycatch entirely may be impossible, but it can be mitigated through innovative approaches and if you go to that NOAA site, you can read about those innovative approaches that have been used in other parts of the country to prevent and lower the bycatch. However, the safest, most effective way is not to have gill nets. In rivers like the Noose and the Pamlico, the gill net bycatch is devastating to the fishing industry, to the sustainability of the fish. Fish are netted going upstream to spawn and downstream to re-enter the ocean. It's a no-win situation. My second set of facts are from your own document, the draft of the North Carolina Estuary and Striped Bash Fishery Management Plan Amendment 2 that you are considering 142 pages, which I've read. I don't envy you for having to read it. It's a lot of stuff, a lot of data. The goals and objectives, which I'd like to quote from page three of this document, your goal of this amendment, number two, is to manage the estuarine striped bass fishery to achieve self-sustaining populations that provide harvest based on science, science-based making decisions. It goes on to say what your objectives are, to restore, enhance, protect the critical habitat and environmental quality in a manner consistent with the Coastal Habitat Protection Plan. You maintain and increase the growth of the fishing. My question is, is restoring gill nets going to do this or not? Ask yourself that question. Fishery protection can only be done by you making a decision in favor of not putting gill nets back in the water. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Art, is it thing Gulstad? Is that the way you pronounce it? Yeah, okay, good. Followed by Eric Thingolstad. I'm here to uh, ask you guys to consider, gals and guys, people, to uh, consider uh, not letting the nets back up in the river, either river. Uh, I can't see how doing that would do anything to help out with the, your fish management plans. They uh, all, like striped bass is um, no, you know, no tolerance for, um, capture and all of that stuff. It just doesn't make any sense to put more nets around when there's likely to be tangled up in them. 
That's all I have. Thanks, sir. Eric Thingolstad, followed by Jess Hawkins. First of all, you get points for the last name. My name's Eric. Thanks for uh, giving me a few seconds here. I'll keep it short and sweet. Just pull, pull your microphone up a little bit closer to you, please. Or I could lean in. I appreciate your time. I want to keep it sweet. I've been fishing with my brother down here for 20, 25 years. It's been a while. I now live down here. The fishing has gotten better in the last several years a lot. Not a little, a lot. And I don't want to see that reversed. So I'd appreciate it if you would actually protect the spawn even more by moving it past Minnesota because the spawn counts. It's important. Yes, we're catching big drums. Yes, we're catching other fish. But the regular fish have come back so well in the last few years. No, I have no scientific. This is me going out in my backyard fishing, and I can see it. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Jess Hawkins, followed by Ed Kearney. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the chance to comment. As the chairman said, my name is Jess Hawkins. As most of you probably know, I was trained as a fisheries biologist. I was, a, was the MFC liaison for 15 years. I've served on the MFC. I've taught fisheries conservation at both Duke and NC State's marine labs. I'm the owner of a small ecotourism business, and I'm an avid recreational angler and regular seafood consumer. I asked the MFC to not include the gillnet exclusion zones in the Upper Pamlico River and Noose River as part of the North Carolina Striped Bass FMP. I commented on the subject at your last meeting and asked you to consider those comments when you deliberate the issue today. I reemphasize that these measures were not based on science and were not recommended by the state's scientific experts on coastal fisheries. They were not necessary as the DMF had implemented adaptive management measures to minimize striped bass bycatch in the gillnet fisheries. In fact, science shows that the gillnets are not the primary source of striped bass bycatch mortality in these areas. When I served on the MFC, I first considered the science as the cornerstone of my decision making. And when I served as the MFC liaison for 15 years, I recommended that commissioners look at the science for guidance. I would hope also that the commission would consider whether these measures are necessary. The absence of this recommendation in the FMP, the admonishment of the past MFC from the leader of the Department of DEQ when these measures were enacted in 2019 by an emergency meeting, and the refusal of the director of DMF to initially implement the MFC proclamation seems to lend guidance to this commission as to whether these measures are necessary. I would also hope the commission would consider, are these measures fair to exclude one group of users that use this area and its seafood resources to provide food for consumers, but allow other, another group to continue to use these areas' resources for fun does not seem fair. The prior actions could be considered unreasonable in light of all the restrictions that were in place on striped bass in the gears that utilize them plus the lack of science. Your regional advisors took note of that, did not recommend that these closure be continued. Also, a joint legislative committee took the extraordinary action to express concerns about these measures based on their fairness. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Ed Kearney, followed by Thomas Coltrane. Good morning. My name is Ed Carney. I'm a member of the Carolina Colors Fishing Club, which we started last, uh, early last year. I've lived in New Bern for about 10 years. I didn't start fishing the noose until about 2015, four years before the nets were banned in March of 2019. Prior to the removal of the nets, a half-day fishing trip on the Noose River would result in a dozen or so undersized trout, puppy drum, and rockfish. Occasionally, we catch a couple of flounder or bluefish and sometimes a freshwater bass. Seldom would we bring home worth, a fish worth filleting because we were returning 95% of our catch due to the ban on a particular fish or the size of our fish. We had no problem ending the day with little or nothing to show for our efforts. Our hope was that all the 12-inch trout, rockfish, and puppy drum we released was a sign of good days to come. Well, that didn't happen for another four years 
before we finally experience the positive effects of removing the gill nets from the ferry line up. Since the fall of 2020, we have seen a remarkable increase in the quality and quantity of our fish stocks. Our average trip now results in numerous rockfish in the 20 to 26 inch range. It's not unusual for us to limit out on 18 to 20 inch trout and the slot drum we now net and bring aboard outnumber the puppy drum we release. We have also observed a significant increase in the bait fish in the, ri in the river, uh, the, qual the quantity of bait fish in the river over the last couple of years. Our fishing club numbers have continued to grow with each successful fishing tournament. There is no question in my mind that the ban on the gill nets above the ferry line has had a significant impact on the resurgence of recreational fishing in the noose. I strongly recommend to the Marine Fisheries Commission that we continue to ban the use of gill nets in our rivers. At this, uh, in conclusion, I'd like to thank the members of this commission for giving us the opportunity to express our viewpoint on this very critical issue. The outcome of this issue will affect our economy and reputation as a great place to enjoy our magnificent resource, the Noose River. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thomas Coltrane, followed by Michael Brady. Good morning. I am Thomas Coltrane, and I am a conservative recreational fisherman. Why is it so important to put the gill nets back above the ferry lines before a study has been completed to the effects of removing the nets? The last thing some people in this room want to hear is the fishery is recovering after the nets were removed. Look at the history of every state that has removed gill nets and how their fisheries have recovered. An overwhelming majority of striped mullets were caught how? Gill nets, haul seines? Is it the mullet they want or the mullet row? Killing the female mullets for row, and now they are being overfished how and by whom? Einstein was credited with saying, Doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting different results is called insanity. Why does the marine fisheries have to apply for an incidental take permit for turtles and sturgeons? Why does the marine fisheries, why do the majority of the North Carolina marine fisheries meetings have to be held east of Highway 17? It was said that the shrimp bycatch was the lowest and cleanest ever seen by shrimpers. That should not surprise anyone when all the fish stocks are being depleted, overfished, and what few are left are being pulled up in shrimp trawls, otter trawls, and killed. I was not surprised to hear that speckled trout were overfished. When all the other fish have a closed season or very limited season, what else is they to gill net for and, it's, and fish for except trout? Every year, many tackle stores, most weekends trout tournaments are being put on to catch the biggest trout for money. The big females are the ones we need to protect. They are the future. They have survived gill nets, hooks, coal stunts, and everything man and nature have put on them. We need to protect them like we protect the big old drum. Several years ago, I realized that if I wanted my grandson and others to enjoy fishing in North Carolina like my dad and I, something had to be done, and I would do my part to help. I started a little program I'm named after him. 30 seconds. Called it CPR Thank You Levi. I had some decals printed up and mailed them to fishermen that caught, photographed, and released speckled trout over 24 inches. It did and does make some people realize that it was the correct thing to do and I have started releasing every trout over 20 inches in hopes that they will prevent them from going the way of striped bass, flounder, and the list goes on and on in North Carolina. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Michael Brady, followed by Buddy Garrett. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. I appreciate it very much. Um, I'm a citizen of North Carolina native. 
I've been here, uh, retired now, so I've been here a little bit. I've seen the stocks personally, from my viewpoint, go down. I have not seen improved fishing from a recreational standpoint. A couple years ago, I saw increased netter activity in my local fishing areas, and our local fish stocks went down. Okay, that's non scientific, that's a personal observation. I've seen speckled trout fishing steady, good. And then as soon as net season starts, you can't find a speckled trout. And if you do, it's undersized. We all know about the destructive mechanism of gill nets, whether the fish is caught in the mesh size or it manages to escape. It's damaged at some extent. Whether it survives that damage or not, nobody really knows. Okay, we're seeing increased target species and non-target species viability in these gill net areas. Why in the world will we even consider putting gill nets back in that area? All right, we've got a few commercial people. We got a thousand or so more recreational fishermen. This is a public resource. We need to find a way to sustain it for the public interest. If there is a way to work the commercial guys in there, we'll do it. But what I'm hearing is directly from the commercial guys and from their numbers, which by the way, we need to distinguish between catch and harvest numbers, is that recreational fishing is more effective than commercial fishing because we're the culprit that's causing the overfishing. So if our techniques result in effective fishing, should they not adopt our techniques and do away with gill netting? We decrease mortality. We provide selective harvesting of slot size fish. We reduce the cost of a fishery going downhill to all the, all the subsidiary businesses like hotels and restaurants, guides. So there's a lot of people involved here besides 30 seconds. the people in this room. So I support this ban, and I would like to see it extended to all state waters inshore. That's my point. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Buddy Garrett, followed by Woody Joyner. Thank you for letting me come and speak. My name is Buddy Garrett. I'm a North Carolina native. I grew up with my dad teaching me how to dig clams, run crab pots, fish, fish spots when it's too damn cold to be out there, excuse my language. But uh, you could walk boat to boat across 58 where the bridge is. I really enjoyed it, some of the best memories of my life. Coming back, cleaning crabs, sitting around picking crabs, having a good time. I know this is about the gill nets. What I'm trying to get a point across is that I want to teach my children the plentiful of the fish, and I have, and I want them to teach their children and their children, and I don't want this to go the way of the dodo bird. The, uh, what is it? The carrier pigeon, passenger pigeon, whichever one it was. I can't remember what night. Now, the last one died in 1914. It's extinct. Um, I don't dig clams anymore. I don't run crab pots anymore. I try to support our local. I'm sorry. I try to support our local uh, commercial fishermen because they have a family to support. I'll buy my clams now. I buy my crabs. I catch and release fish. I don't keep any fish anymore. Maybe one in a great moon, but very, very seldom. And if we have to put gill nets ban gill nets to protect our fisheries, and that's not fair. Well, I think we should be fair. Well, let's ban hook and line then above the area. Let's make it fair. Just no fishing for a year, two years, whatever it takes to get a good, accurate count on what's really happening in our area. Now, this is not just a North Carolina problem. This is a problem worldwide. The Chinese, I used to say on the uh, news, rammed or tried to ram a Coast Guard ship protecting another country's fishing stock, squid I believe it was, but the whole, 
world is bad. So my basically point is let's, let's work together. Let's unite. United we stand, divided we fall. And let's try to do what's good for the fish. That's fair. And improve the water quality. I think water quality has a whole lot to do with the spawning and grass beds and things like that that we need to keep. And that's my point. Let's work together, not apart. 30 seconds. Let's try to do what's right for the environment and not for our pocketbook. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Woody Joyner followed by Bert Owens. Good morning. Everybody hear me? Good. Um, my name is Woody Joyner. I'm a full-time resident of Hatteras Village, and I'm here representing the Board of Directors and the members of the North Carolina Watermen United. Uh, this is my first opportunity to address the Commission in person, although I've attended each of your meetings and offered written comments uh, virtually for the past two years. And I would like to offer my thanks to the four new members of uh, the Commission, the entire staff of the MFC, for your hard work your time and your dedication towards ensuring all new and existing regulations are both fair and equitable. Um, after hearing all the public comments last night, I, uh, I threw out my original notes and I hastily jotted down some thoughts this morning over breakfast. Um, I feel an obligation to speak on behalf of our hardworking commercial watermen. Um, I'm not going to offer a laundry list of science data or species population surveys, but will make an effort to appeal to the Commission to take a hard look at the real data and not antidotal musings. Uh, without our commercial fishermen, the people of North Carolina that cannot come to the coast to fish, which is an overwhelming majority, do not have access to local seafood. When I visit the docks in Hatteras Village early in the mornings, um, I see an effort by our commercial fishermen to make sure they are selecting their proper net size, proposed fishing areas. Um, I'm reminding that these watermen are dedicated to the conservation and sustainability of all species. Uh, why would they purposefully overfish a species with no regard for future seasons? Uh, the visitors that we have each year on Hatteras Island and up and down our beautiful coast arrive wanting to eat local. Um, I find it sad that so many are actually being served imported products that come from countries with little, uh, if any, uh, regulatory restrictions. I implore the Commission to allow our commercial fishermen to continue to harbor this public trust um, and to put fresh seafood on the tables, but also for their families. The socioeconomic hardships on our local uh, coastal communities when we continue to handcuff these watermen is immeasurable. Uh, this, this historically rich and valuable resource that we have, we have to fight to maintain. And I would like to close by reading the mission statement from the North Carolina Watermen. The North Carolina Watermen United represents the needs of our coastal communities by protecting the livelihood of the people who fish seconds. for a living and provides a voice for fair regulations. Now, this reflects commercial, our charter head bar operators, and yes, recreational. I would like to thank the Commission uh, for offering this public forum and can only hope that you will see the need to keep our commercial watermen uh, working and on the water. Thank you all very much, and uh, again, thank you for your hard work. Thanks, sir. Bert Owens, followed by David Sneed. Good morning, and welcome to the new commissioners. Uh, can you hear me now? It's an important job, and appreciate y'all doing it. Uh, I'm Bert Owens from Beaufort, North Carolina. Recently retired here in the last month or so, so you're going to have to revise your recreational FMPs, I'm pretty sure. I got a little time now. I had noticed, uh, take notice earlier that the MFC always meets in a place with a bar nearby, and this is the first time you ever had a bar in the same room, I believe, but that's progress anyway. <laughs> so, uh, there's been mention of science this morning. I don't know of any science that says by putting the nets back in above the ferry lines, that's going to help the striped mullet or southern flounder overfish situation. No way that'll happen. In 2019, when uh, 
you made the bold and wise move to save a couple of year classes of native spawn striped bass in the central area. It's paid off because in three short years, you're seeing the numbers and size of stripers increase. Stripers in this area are getting larger. You know that the larger fish are the ones that really do the serious spawning. They've got to have time to do it. But now with the change in the commission's makeup, those who were against the move then have seen an opening to reverse this trend and end any potential rebuilding of the stock, even though data from the division plainly shows that none of the adverse impact predicted on the commercial fishing has happened. The catches of speckled trout, uh, striped mullet, et cetera, have not gone down. They're still making the same money, if not more. So let's let these larger stripers continue to spawn and give the stock a chance to really rebuild. Putting the next net back in those waters will kill these fish in pursuit of other already overfished species. Anyone who's lived long and met with any degree of success knows that failure is at the point at which you quit. So let's don't quit on these fish. Let's don't fail on them. And uh, do I still got a little bit of time left? All right, so short. Very quickly, Southern Flounder measures were taken by the MFC in 2015 to end over fishing. 30 seconds. 20? 30 seconds. Oh, that's good. Uh, no. <laughs> he just took 10. Uh, <laughs> the NCFA sued to stop overfishing measures in 2015. Now, the recreational anglers have a, a month and one fish because they sued in 2015. They're the ones that should pay that back. Anglers need to be given access to oscillated flounder as well. Time. Okay. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right. David Sneed, followed by Rich Clare. Good morning, Chairman Bizzle and Commissioners. My name is David Sneed, and I'm the Executive Director for the Coastal Conservation Association in North Carolina. I would like to welcome again our new commissioners and especially welcome Captain Sarah Gardner uh, to her first meeting. My personal thanks to you and all of our current commissioners for your willingness to serve. And you know my thoughts and prayers are with you as well, Rob. And Philip, welcome back. A friend recently sent me a copy of a two-day series printed in the Raleigh News Observer, and I'm going to read you some excerpts from that article and let you guess when it was published. The series was entitled, Fishing for Trouble, Can North Carolina Save a Dying Resource? The first article was subtitled, Falling Catches Warn of a Crisis at Sea. Overfishing, pollution, and weak regulations are slowly but surely exhausting what was once taken for granted. We are at a critical time right now. What we do in the next three or four years could determine if we have a viable fishery in the 21st century. Pollution has hurt some species. Others have fallen victim to fishing practices that have the side effect of wasting tons of immature and unmarketable fish. But the single biggest factor is overfishing. Fishermen armed with bigger nets and faster boats are catching fish faster than they can reproduce. The state's Marine Fisheries Commission, made up mostly of people from the fishing industry, have not acted on the persistent warnings of its own biologists. Some fear the state's fishing industry will go the way of New England and Canada's overfishing of cod and haddock. What happened in New England was you had guys with big boats and big payments to make, and they kept driving that fishery and driving it and driving it. If you do that, then the resource is never going to recover, it's just going to collapse. Sounds like a story that could have been published yesterday, right? But it was published in 1994. And 28 years later, we are still dealing with the two big issues they mentioned, bycatch waste and overfishing. For 28 years, we have been kicking the can down the road. And I bring this to your attention only as a reminder that those who ignore the lessons of the past are doomed to repeat them. Every new commission comes in with a fresh opportunity to reverse the declines in our coastal fisheries and leave a healthy and sustainable fishery for future generations to enjoy. You can argue all you want about gill nets or striped mullet or pollution, and we know you will, 
But nothing is going to change until we stop repeating the mistakes of the past by managing for maximum exploitation. Instead, we have to start making conservation the Commission's goal for coastal fisheries management in North Carolina. Please listen to the hundreds of members of the fishing public that have taken the time to come here and speak and send in written comments in support of our resource. Thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Rich Clare, followed by Lisa McCracken. First of all, good morning to the Commission, and thank you for the opportunity to come and voice our opinions and uh, listen to what, what we're saying. Um, I'm a new resident. Richard Clare is my name. I'm sorry. I live on Clubfoot Creek in Harlow. In Harlow. And uh, I've been here for five years, and what I've noticed in those five years, when I got here, I moved here because I wanted to fish in my backyard, which I do, and I love it. But in those five years, I've noticed increasingly more people coming in and netting in there, and the fishing in our creek has decreased accordingly during that same time. This year, uh, probably because of the restrictions from the uh, ferry up on the river, um, there's more and more boats than we've ever seen netting. They come right in within feet of our dock, and they weave their nets in between our docks. And also fishing at night, their lights shine in all through the night into our bedroom windows and disturb the sleep. There was very little concern for the landowners. And uh, that's just one aspect. The other aspect that I'd like to address is what the netting does to our fish population. The nets are indiscriminate. They don't care whether they catch undersized fish, restricted species, or anything, and the devastation is complete. Most of the fish end up dead. And we can notice a big difference in our fishing because of the boats. We had as many as seven netting boats out in front of our house at various times this year, this fall. And, uh, you know, the estuaries are God's plan for replenishing the species. We have to protect that or we have no species left. And so they, I think the regulations should stand as they are and never be decreased from this point, but they should also be expanded to encompass in, in, uh, the entire river system of the Noose and Pamlico Sound. Protect the nurseries. That's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Lisa McCracken, followed by John Hanrahan. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Lisa McCracken. I am not a recreational or commercial fisherman, but a mom and a grandmother concerned for the future of our amazing estuary. I live on Clubfoot Creek, thus I have the advantage of witnessing everything that takes place on the creek. The creek is not a vast body of water with infinite resources, but a tributary of the Noose River. That being said, I have witnessed more gill netters in the creek this fall than ever before. It's common on a one-hour kayak ride for me to encounter six net boats. The boats will fish the creek until the fish are gone for the season. I question, how is this sustainable? They are removing female mullet that are ripe with roe along with trout, red drum, and several other species. According to the Department of Natural Resources, Japanese demand for mullet roe has increased, causing American stocks of mullet to decline sharply. What I am witnessing in Clubfoot Creek is not sustainable. Last night during the comment session of this meeting, I heard speakers talk about the concern for water quality. Striped mullet play an important role in water quality. 
mullet consume detritus, diatoms, algae, and even top, la top layer of sediments. Mullet are an ecologically important link in the energy flow within the estuary. Striped mullet are a keystone species and their presence or absence can have a profound impact on the overall health of the creek. Without them, the ecosystem is at risk of collapse. Since the data show that the striped mullet is overfished, please keep the current net ban in place and extend the closure to the tie down line so that all creeks have a chance to recover before it's too late. The estuary will be left devoid of life if action isn't taken to prevent overfishing. Our fish stocks need protection for present and future generations. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> John Hanrahan, followed by Matthew Wellen. Good morning, and thank you. Uh, John Hanrahan, as you said, and I don't represent any group, although I am a, a member of a fish club in Moorhead that has 100 members, and we all share the same concerns. Uh, and I'm also a Clubfoot Creek resident, uh, and uh, we're just below the line, so we see a kind of a different scenario than the people that are above the, the line of the uh, Cherry Point Ferry. Uh, and <clears throat> as I hear everything this morning, we're talking about doing what's right and fair, and I, th I agree with that. I don't think anybody is out trying to decimate the fish population. Nobody wants to do that. Uh, but what we're seeing... East Carolina the, is the fastest growing area of the Carolinas. It's one of the fastest growing areas in population in the country. So fishing is just netting or sport fishing. It's, they're just one of the influences impacting the, uh, the fishing. The estuaries are probably the most important area. On Clubfoot, you've, you've heard my neighbors speak. Uh, we've had six, seven, eight boats at a single time in the creek. When they leave, I'll go out in the dock, the creek is full of seagrass, it's been torn up, just floating the root stems, uh, and it's taken out a lot of what we've been working to protect in the area um, is you know, the, the hatchery, the fishery. You know, I've thrown a cast net in, in Clubfoot to get uh, mud minnows or uh, manhaden, uh, <clears throat> and I've come up with baby drum by, you know, loads in the net and quickly release them. But it tells me we're a nursery. We're an important nursery for these fish. And if we destroy it, we're going to take it out. So if we're looking at being fair, I think it's, it's not about me as a sport, sport fisherman or someone else as a netter. It's what's fair to our grandchildren. Uh, what are we going to leave for them? And we've seen the East Coast up and down, and it's the West Coast as well. Uh, the fisheries are declining. So. You know, if we don't protect them, we don't make a stand, it's just going to continue. That's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Matthew Wallen, followed by Chris Elkins. Good morning. Um, Matthew Wallen, I'm an avid angler from um, New Bern, North Carolina. I'd uh, like to thank you, thank you all for uh, taking on the responsibility of managing our coastal resources. Um, that being said, your job is to manage, protect, preserve, and enhance the marine and estuarine resources under your jurisdiction. When I looked up the anonym for protect, preserve, and enhance, I found the words neglect, destroy, and diminish. Well, when it comes to the state of our coastal fisheries, those latter words ring true. DMF data show us that river herring are overfished, totally collapsed, striped bass, overfished, southern flounder, overfished, striped mullet, overfished, American shad, depleted coastwide, speckled trout are now experiencing overfishing. Based on current DMF stock assessments, it would be totally irresponsible of this commission to remove the net ban already in place above the ferry lines on the new St. Pamlico rivers. In fact, to end overfishing status above, up, of the above species within your two-year statutory requirement, I request this commission to continue the net ban, and if you really want to enhance, not diminish, our fisheries, I recommend extending the ban to the tie-down lines. 
Gillnets are an unsustainable harvest method. 60% of commercial gillnet licenses do not report their landings each year, leading to undocumented mortality of our already overfished stocks. I suggest this commission also look into license reform, uh, creating mandatory reporting that is necessary to understand the full impact in our fish stocks. The net ban is working to rebuild our fishery as a whole. Coincidentally, the commercial harvest for trout, red drum, and striped mullet have all doubled since 2019, the year the net ban took place. Common sense would suggest that with the net ban in place, you're allowing the estuarine portions of these rivers to act as the nursery area that they are, creating a sanctuary for bait fish and game fish alike to feed, grow, and spawn in the spring and summer months, while the net-free zones provide trout, striper, and reds a safe place to overwinter when it gets cold. This, in return, improves escapement numbers needed to rebuild these stocks for the future. We are finally starting to catch a good class of 25 to 30-inch striped bass on the Noose River. That is the initial goal of this net closure, was to rebuild a larger, more fecund female population of stripers in these systems. Well, it's working. Why stop now? Once reversed, we will be forced to manage, to manage it as a put-grow-take fishery with nothing but small juvenile fish. I urge you all to manage based upon what is best for our fisheries as a whole. I can promise you that if you manage to protect, <clears throat> preserve, and enhance our fisheries, they will take care of all of us. This is your chance to continue to restore our fisheries. Time. And Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Chris Elkins, followed by Jim Blackenby. Good morning. I am Chris Elkins. Uh, Speaking to Mike, if you would. A Chris. member of the fishing public. Uh, I know you don't have an easy job. I've sat on the other side of the table. Um, but I do want to thank you for your service. I know it's tough. Over the last two decades, I probably made 10 public comments on striped bass. Each comment urged the commission to stave off the decline that were evident then and which continue today. The one single action, removing gill nets above the ferry line, has been the only action that has reversed the striped bass decline without negatively impacting other harvests. And that's DMF data. Bringing the nets back makes no sense given the declines of shad, striped mullet, flounder, speckled trout, and other species they would kill. Moreover, given the success of that re net removal on striped bass, the removal of nets to at least a tie down line is a no brainer. And I know you may not be able to address that at this. Uh, go around, but it should be on, uh, on the table in future uh, FMPs. And as I have said repeatedly in the past, if you want to expand the striped bass stock to its previous geographic range, you must remove gill nets from that same geographic range. Commercial fishermen should use hook and line like in other states, such as Massachusetts, where they have a huge quota that they get successfully. Uh, second uh, note, a critical, critical item has been lacking at these meetings from the commission and the division. They must articulate to fishermen of both sectors that when stocks recover, we cannot go back to the overgenerous fishing rules of the past that caused widespread declines. The commission and the, and the division have been enablers to fishermen of both sectors for decades. For example, look at what North Carolina did in the ASMA after striped bass recovered in the 1990s. North Carolina Im implemented total allowable landings of more than half a million pounds, killing that fishery again. And now it needs a moratorium to re recover. Another example of North Carolina failing to send a message about the future of fishing is the debacle in the flounder fishery. Why is North Carolina granting additional pound net applications? It's throwing gas on the fire. Just this week, someone applied for a mile and a half of pound nets. Are you all really going to rubber stamp another flounder pound net application? Again, thanks for your service. Thank you, sir. Jim Blackenby, followed by Bob Bruce Wart. Good 
Good morning. I'm Jim Blackerby. Thank you for your time. Speak to the mic if you would. Okay. Yeah. Is that better? That's better. Okay. Yeah, I'll try to be brief, or I will be brief. Um, I do support the uh, ban on the gill nets. I support a natural sustainable fishery and fisheries up and down the coast. Uh, I think that's good for everybody, commercial and and um, recreational. Um, and I think we need to let the testing time run its course to see how things pan out. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Bruce, uh, Bob Bruce Ward. Hi, my name is Bob Bruggeworth and I live in Fairfield Harbor. Uh, I've lived here for 30 years, moved down here from Jersey and see what nets did on the Delaware River because I lived right on the Delaware River. And I know what they did with the, with the shad coming up the river and, and, and how much shad was taken by uh, the, 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 not just the little small nets that they do in shad season up around Trenton, but below that and uh, all the other fish fishery uh, that was uh, affected by that. Uh, I'm here because I've seen what's happened here for striped bass, and we keep talking about striped bass, but the one thing you have to know about striped bass is they need fresh water to, to spawn. So they have to get up past the bridge. And, and we're just trapping all those spawning females with roe that are ready to, to, to do their thing. And that is very important to the fishery. So if you think of anything else, please remember what's happened to the striped bass. And that's why we have this, these moratoriums on. And they also affect blue crab. I've been on the blue crab advisory committee for a while, along with the gentleman on my left here. And we know what uh, nets can do for that fishery also. So uh, please, please do not put nets or allow nets above the ferry line. Thank you for your, your attention and your support. Thank you, sir. Has everybody addressed a commission that cares to? If so, our public comment session is now ended, and I will call our meeting of the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission to order. Would everybody please rise with me where we have a moment of silence and thank our, um, and ask our higher power for guidance in this meeting and any special needs followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, uh, we need to do a, a review of our ethics evaluation of our new commissioner, Sarah Gardner. Laura, can you handle that for us, please, ma'am? Chair, may we come back to that item after lunch? Okay, we sure can. Thank you. All right. And in the meantime, I'd like to welcome Sarah to the commission. Sarah, would you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Sarah Gardner, I am a charter boat captain. This is my 25th season and yeah. charter boat captain, uh, 25 years in, full time. And I make my living both in Oregon Inlet, North Carolina, and then I also run my boat out of Harker's Island, North Carolina. So I guess that makes me inner island. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> But um, I guess it also makes me an old-timer now. 
and I, I have um, in the wintertime uh, occasionally will host trips with my husband, fishing trips to other parts of the world. And so I've been lucky enough to fish throughout Central and South America and all over the U.S. And actually, <coughs> for the last two summers, I had <coughs> the opportunity to guide full-time in the state of Alaska. I've taken my summers away from Oregon Inlet and worked up there on a remote river, the Connectock River in Alaska. And uh, it, it fulfilled a lifetime dream, and it really opened my eyes to um, what is involved in sustaining a fishery and all the factors. And so... Um, it, it was a huge experience, but um, I'm incredibly honored to be here. I feel, I felt the weight of the world today because I'm looking around at a lot of groups that I feel a very strong connection to, and I feel a very strong connection to this fishery, and um, I'm here to do my best, and... Um, and, uh, and, and look at the facts and, 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 and listen to the anecdotal stories and, and, and vote with what I know. And um, I just going to do everything I can to do right. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Sarah. And we welcome you to the commission and look forward to your perspective on the issues. Okay, North Carolina General Statute 138A-15E mandates at the beginning of any meeting of a board, the chair shall remind all members of their duty to avoid conflicts of interest under Chapter 138. The chair also shall inquire as to whether there is any known conflict of interest with respect to any matters coming before the board at that time. So does anybody on this commission see any conflicts of interest with what we're going to be talking about? Mr. Chairman, um, yes. um, dealing with the issue of Mid-Atlantic Council nominations, my name happens. Talk closer in the microphone. Is there any volume adjustments? That's been a common theme. Um, <laughs> uh, regarding the Mid-Atlantic Council nominations, my name is on that list. I need. I was going to ask you or council what you would like me to do during that um, time period, whether to step out, just step back from my seat, what would be the correct? I don't think it's a, a, a real big deal, but you might want to recuse yourself from the vote. Sure. I'm just just point of clarification. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Also, I want you all to reflect on North Carolina General Statute 143B-289.54.G2. That goes into further detail on conflicts of interest. Okay, moving on to our roll call. Laura, would you do our roll call, please? Yes, Chair. <clears throat> Commissioner Cross? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Blanton? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Huggins? Thank you. Commissioner Gardner? Here. Thank you. Commissioner McNeil? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Rader? Present. Thank you. Commissioner Roller? Present. Thank you. Commissioner Shellam? Present. Thank you. And Chairman Bizzle? Here. Thank you. We have a quorum. We may conduct business. Before you also is our agenda. Um, with my, if you allowing me to maybe change some things around a little bit, can I have a motion to accept the agenda as printed? So moved. So moved by second. Commissioner Roller and second by Commissioner Rader. Any other discussion on the agenda? Uh, Commissioner Rader. No other discussion on this. Uh, we'll just do a vote, voice vote on this. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Motion passes without dissension. Also, you should have received your minutes from our last meeting. Are there any corrections that need to be made to these minutes? If not, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes as published. So moved. By Commissioner Roller. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Shellam. Any other discussion on the minutes? If not, all in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? 
Motion passes without dissension. Moving on into the chairman's report. Um, you should see, have received your letters and online comments uh, in your briefing materials. Also, um, is everybody up to date or do you not know yet, Laura, on our ethics training? Do you need to do that after lunch too? Do all together after lunch. Okay, fine. Sure thing. Um, also, in your briefing materials is our meeting schedule for this for the future and the commission committee assignments. So they all should be in your briefing books. We're going to take up now an issue that I've spent a heck of a lot of time on, and so has staff. Um, it's dealing with the delineation of inland and coastal fishing waters. And let me explain how we got to this point. A couple of years back, and Laura's going to show us a timeline on um, how all this progressed. We, we have, we are an unusual state agency in that us and the Wildlife Resources Commission has to agree and adopt each other's rules to a degree, to a point. No other, no other set of commissions in the state has to do that, but they all revolve around joint waters primarily. So we had nine rules that they needed to adopt, and they had 12 rules that we needed to adopt. And we ran into some conflicts with that. So we had a, a meeting in Raleigh, and we were directed to go ahead and adopt the rules as they are and deal with future conflicts as they come up. Well, I made the comment that, you know, the reason that we're having all these conflicts is because we have joint waters, which I said joint waters are really silly. Two agencies regulating the same body waters. Wildlife agreed that that was silly too. So we, may, we set out on the path to do away with joint waters and say, okay, and, and we drew lines based on nothing more than this seems to make the most sense. We didn't do with salinity, we didn't do with SAV, we didn't do it with um, species found in these waters. It just looking at the maps that these made the most sense. And what I want Laura to do at this time is to show you all what we had talked about and appeared to make sense at that time and the timeline and the events that led up to this point. So Laura. Laura. Thank you, Chairman. All right, so um, good morning, everyone. And as Chairman Bizzle said, I am Laura Klebanski, the Marine Fishery Commission Liaison. And I'm gonna be reporting to you on the delineation issue, um, as the Chairman said. Um, over the summer, the Marine Fisheries Commission and the Wildlife Resource Commission Chairman uh, held a meeting to continue discussing potential solutions to the ongoing challenges both agencies have faced regarding the joint regulations. <clears throat> Excuse me. The chairman um, is going to be discussing the MOA a little bit later, but um, I'm going to be reviewing the maps that were included in the chairman's report and which you all have in front of you. <clears throat> so before we go into the maps, I'm going to give you a little bit of history on the topic. Um, for this presentation, I'm going to be pretty brief and in no way comprehensive, um, but hopefully it'll provide some context for your discussion this morning. So on the screen here, you'll see a basic timeline of events for the delineation discussion. In 2018, the Wildlife Resource Commission reached out to the Division of Marine Fisheries and requested that the two agencies um, cooperatively evaluate the current fishing water boundaries. So the division director at the time agreed to review and discuss the issue, and both agencies assigned staff to lead a cooperative review um, committee of the boundary lines. In January 2019, the Wildlife Resource Commission chairman sent a letter to the MFC chairman requesting that they each select three commissioners to form a Marine Fishery Commission, Wildlife Resource Commission, Joint Committee on Delineation of Fishing Waters. 
So beginning in January of 2019, the assigned staff and the commissioners from both agencies met multiple times. Delineation um, based on salinity became a primary focus of those meetings with staff reviewing the available salinity data at that time. The committee last met in May of 2019 and at that time they had not reached an agreement. In August 2019, the Wildlife Resource Commission staff presented their recommendations for salinity to their commission and the commission selected a modeled salinity value of 2.6 parts per thousand to derive delineations between inland fishing waters and coastal fishing waters and to evaluate any impacts associated with those lines. So this led to further correspondence between the two agencies that generally um, just continued that discussion of uh, general disagreement. Um, so of note, during this time, the CRC chair, uh, Renee Cahoom, uh, who you heard speak last night, uh, did wrote a letter expressing concern about the Wildlife Resource Commission's proposed changes to the jurisdictional boundaries. Um, in addition, the Town of Kitty Hawk, the Dare County Commission, and the Tyrell County Commission um, adopted resolutions opposing the reclassification of jurisdictional bound, uh, waters. Um, in, so no action on delineation occurred during 2020 uh, because primarily because of COVID impacts um, or 2021. Um, however, both agencies continued to work towards joint rule readoption. So in 2020, the commissions <clears throat> were directed to readopt the joint rules as is and to then commit to resolving any remaining conflicts. The joint rules were successfully readopted this summer. And on June 6th, the Marine Fishery Commission and Wildlife Resource Commission chairs met and laid out a proposal to work towards doing away with joint waters. <clears throat> I apologize, as shown in the attached maps. So as a means to resolve the remaining conflicts between the two agencies. Following the meetings, the chair instructed staff to prepare um, the MOA uh, and accompanying maps based on that meeting. Um, now I'm gonna walk through the maps. And as I said, um, you have the printed copies in front of you. Um, for clarity, I'm gonna begin with the current boundaries um, so you can more easily see the proposed changes. So here on the screen, I apologize, these are difficult to see, but they will be posted. Uh, they are on your map, so hopefully that will, this will help. Um, as I said, these are the current boundary lines. The joint waters are in blue, coastal waters are in red, and the inland waters are in black. Um, the full map has been split into three regions just for viewing convenience, but there's no other significance for that. Um, again, I won't review the maps in detail, but I do want to give you um, a brief overview of the proposed changes. Um, so again, these are the current boundary lines. Um, and just as a reminder, the joint waters, um, which are here in blue again, are defined as those coastal waters in which are found a significant number of freshwater fish. Okay, so now on to the proposed changes. So here you'll see the proposed inland waters in green and coastal waters in blue. Um, the majority of the proposed changes are assigning waters currently designated as joint, as either inland or coastal. There are a few exceptions. Um, for example, there are a number of tributaries of the Alligator River that are currently inland um, that are proposed to be coastal. So there are other instances like that, but the majority of the proposed changes to the currently designated joint waters, or most are changes to the currently designated joint waters. Most of the changes are concentrated in the tributaries of the Albemarle Sound region of the state. Um, and I'm gonna move down into the central area. So again, these are the current boundaries as they stand now. <clears throat> and here are the proposed boundaries, um, the coastal in blue and the inland in green. And um, as I said before, I'm gonna flip back to this current map you can see the blue is current, uh, current joint, and then you can see where those have been either assigned as inland or coastal. And finally, these are the current boundaries in the southern area. And here are the proposed boundaries. Um, and again, uh, you can see if I flip back, these are the joint waters in blue that are difficult to see, and I apologize for that. Um, 
and the proposed boundaries. And with that, that concludes my presentation. Okay, thank you, Laura. Um, let me talk about the MOA, or the Memorandum of Agreement. I won't walk through the entire document, but hopefully you all had a chance to review it. You'll notice the document has not been signed by either chairman. Rather, they agreed to bring the document before the respective commissions before signing any agreement. While the document is not finalized, the Wildlife Resources Commission Committee of the Whole did approve the MOA and the delineation maps. As I stated, the MOA was prepared and is intended to capture the discussions that occurred between the chairman in June. Many of the points that are included in the documents were agreed upon. However, there are two that were not. The first is the fourth whereas statement and would establish a rulemaking deadline of December 2024. The Wildlife Resources Commission Chair feels this is a reasonable timeline. However, I did not feel like the timeline was appropriate. It has been included here for informational purposes only. The other point is not specifically with the document, but rather a change in regulation. Following the June 6 meeting, the Wildlife Resources Commission undertook rulemaking establishing inland water specific rules for marine and estuarine species, such as flounder, black drum, and cobia. These actions were considered counter to the discussions that were had during the June 6 meeting. This is because the proposed lines were discussed based on the assumption that the Wildlife Resources Commission would continue referencing the Marine Fisheries Commission rules for marine and estuarine species. Given that it's no longer the case, lines will need to be reevaluated based on these changes. Recently, the Wildlife Resources Commission has decoupled the, uh, the regulations of marine and estuarine species, creating the potential for incompatible measures and limits. Significant concerns were also expressed by the chairs of the Coastal Resources Commission and the Environmental Commission. These developments have caused me to reevaluate the proposed approach. Um, we do have a duty to discuss this. And I'd like to open up for our commissioners to discuss what has been proposed to this point and what your appetite is for these things. Commissioner Roller. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to start off and thank you for approaching this with this presentation. And thank you, Laura, for putting that together. That was very helpful. Because it's important to point out that this issue predates virtually all of our appointments to this commission, right? Except with maybe the chair, if I'm correct, right? Yeah. It's been going on for a while. Um, you know, we've approached these rules several times, and quite frankly, I've been quite confused by the process. Um, there's been just a lot of back and forth. And to a degree, I feel like I'm a bit of an arbitrator between two different government agencies, something that I'm a little weary of, personally. Um, I've approached this in the sense that, kind of like that was discussed, is this issue of joint waters. I don't like these bizarre gray areas where we have a lot of jurisdiction, right? And so initially in the process, I thought we were going in a good direction to try to figure out a way in which to kind of remove those difficult areas of jurisdiction. But in discussion, I guess, it, just as, as you brought up, Chair, that I'm just not sure that this direction is a efficient and compatible way forward. I just think we have a lot more confusion going on, um, particularly with this area of joint rules, which if you really want to get confused, we can dive into. Right? Yeah. So, and, I'll, and I'd like to hear some more comments from people, so I'll, I'll reserve some of my, my comments. Commissioner Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was actually at the first meeting with Chairman Bizzle when we went to Raleigh. And we had a discussion on the way up the steps. And I told him, I said, be prepared. They're going to drop something on us this first day to look at. And he, he said, ain't no way. We weren't there 15 minutes. They were already dropping plans. And we were to follow them all in. I think the issue that we've fought the whole time is that the Wildlife Resources Commission isn't used to anybody really bucking up against them. And uh, we've steadfast held with our data from the division 
um, on what we believed were our correct responsibilities in our areas and whatnot. And, you know, I, I, I don't like the idea of joint waters either, but I, I'm not so sure that lines right now are the right way to go either. I kind of feel like you do. We're arbitrating between two, and I'm certainly not looking at these maps, not sure that those lines are correct, nor what I would be without us doing further investigation into what we're actually affecting so far as the commercial and the recreational side on some of these places. I don't want to see a, a detailed report on each one of these areas that are shifting over one way or the other to see exactly what we are looking at and uh, who we're affecting so far as, uh, you know, from guiding to whatever, whatever kind of fishing. So uh, I think that, you know, we, we've we held on to what we believed we were correct on doing. I know there's been a lot of uh, back-channel uh, negotiations going on, but I still believe that uh, when we signed our rules into place at our initial meeting where we did sign, we signed them in correctly and in good faith. And I think we've steadfast held on that, and I think we should continue to hold on that until we get to a position that we're certain that we're making the right and correct moves to make this process streamlined and equitable uh, so far as all fishermen on our side of the equation are concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Blanton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, taking into account the... Um, commercial activities that, that take place in some of these systems, um, I would have to oppose any changes at the, at the current moment um, based on access to um, the water bodies for the blue crab industry um, as well as any other fishers that are involved. I'd, I'd like to point out one thing that public comment brought in last night is that uh, in the Perquimans River, um, pound net number one in the entire state of North Carolina exists still to this day. It is the same set. It is the very first pound net that was ever set in North Carolina. Um, doing away with that waterway or with access to that waterway by the commercial industry would make that pound net go away. That is pure heritage of this state. Um, I, 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 that and that alone is, is one reason for me to, can, to explore other options to um, mitigate any detrimental impacts to the commercial industry. Another issue I have, going back to the beginning of this, as I was present as a commissioner then, is that there was no problem, no true problem or, or um, concern brought to us that would initiate any change. Um, we asked multiple questions of why, um, had multiple opportunities for them to present us with issues or problems that they might have. The only thing I, I heard was that their rules were under review and they would like to review them. Well, that's fine. We reviewed them. Um, th they might have different discrepancies than, than we might, but there was no problem presented. And the problem that I can see with this is that it would make significant changes to access from the commercial industry um, and and we cannot afford to lose any more bottom. One river system of note, Little River, is, would be completely changed by this from joint to inland waters. And I personally, this fall, crabbed in that river, personally, within the bounds of that restriction, of, of, that, of that changed area. It would affect me personally. And, and that's another reason I would have to oppose this. Um, I think if, if conversations continue, that we should, we should step lightly towards a direction that, that, would, that would satisfy all users. Um, we should look at the, the issues that, that, that the users um, would need to address by, by making any changes. But as it stands right now, I, I would have to oppose anything 
and everything about this and, and the boundary changes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Bland. Commissioner, let me go to Commissioner Wright first and come back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have three comments. One, based on having been involved over the last 35 years in building a coordinated ecosystem-based habitat protection program here, irrespective of how you feel about its success, nonetheless, there's a, a tremendously important uh, architecture of those rules and regulations that together provide an important surety for the future of North Carolina. Um, more to be done, of course, but nonetheless, the uh, concerns about cascading unintended consequences expressed uh, by the C CRC and to me personally by other members of other commissions um, suggest that this is something we should do very gingerly and with informed, with careful knowledge of what would happen, in fact. And so, among other things, should we, as we proceed down that path, I would suggest that we re-engage the Habitat and Water Quality Standing Advisory Committee and the CHIP Committee in looking at those consequences so that the uh, change in governance landscape and the threat that that presents, the accidental threat, is well understood by all involved, and I don't think that it is. And I, I, did, I do have a lot of sweat in that game in the past. Second thing issue has to do with, I believe this has surfaced an existing and serious problem with the coordination of management between the WRC and this commission. And for that matter, the other commissions managing non-fishing threats. In fact, there are, um, I do not believe that the Wildlife Resources Commission has a history of taking a, purport, a proportion, a quota, an allocation of an total allowable catch and completely implementing that uh, in coordination with this commission. And, and so th that's actually one of the benefits of having joint waters is that the authority exists in both places and it's seamless in terms of coordinating total mortality numbers for every one of our plants. And if, I mean, if you look at the life histories of the animals that we manage, they, <laughs> you know, th there are no lines in those animals' behavior and especially those with complex life histories. So we, we have got to find a way to coordinate the way that mortality in inland waters and, and joint waters, whatever their future, and marine waters together adds up to the targets we have to set. And so I'm, I'm greatly concerned that by drawing a lot of bright and shiny waters, eliminating the joint waters, depending solely on um, Wildlife Resource Commission management, in those inland waters, we actually go the wrong direction away from coordinated uh, management. And the third, the third point has to do with the maps, which is th these waters are, are, are not set. These waters are living things that are changing. We know that sea levels are rising, that waters are warming, the salinity patterns in these things are already changing as precipitation changes with the warming biosphere. I think for us to pretend that there is a technical basis for drawing such a line is just nuts. Um, I mean, it really is. And therefore, we ought to be looking at coordinating and sharing aspirations, goals, and management instead of drawing lines that will not survive 10 years or 15 years or 20 years as these waters solidify and change through time. So three, three reasons that I would support the previous discussions about not proceeding along this pathway now. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Roller. This is more of a point of clarification. Um, I've had a, several discussions on this, and I'm just kind of looking to see if we can get some guidance. Let's just say, hypothetically, that we were to adopt new maps and get rid of you know, joint waters. Can commercial fishing activity take place inside inland waters? And if so, how would that be. I'm just trying to, you know, there's yeah. been a lot of concerns, and I just think it's important for us to have that discussion. That was part of my concern in these negotiations, and um, I have yet to hear back from wildlife how they would allow, manage, what have you, commercial fishing operations. Thank you, Chair, because, you know, it's been interesting in my research on this looking back into the history of joint waters. I mean, I believe they were designated in 1947 approximately. Is that right? Um, yeah. And, you know, and we look at these areas, and there tend to be a little bit of areas of controversy, right? And that just 
it's kind of the nature of those waters, right? You have lower salinity waters where you have commercial fishing activity. You also have, you know, lower salinity waters where you have a lot of prevalent, you know, prevalent saltwater fish. So I, I'm concerned, kind of it's a little bit, if you haven't gotten clarification on that, that's a bit of a red flag to me, or a huge red flag, right? So I just don't, anyway, I rest my case. Further discussion or comments? Would staff like to make any comments about this? <coughs> Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, it does seem that our comments from a division perspective line up with what we're hearing from, from the commissioners. We, um, uh, Commissioner Blanton touched on this, we have struggled to find a problem statement from the very beginning, and I think that is what has made this issue so difficult to try and tackle, and we've approached it from several different ways, um, and we just, haven't had uh, any success, and I believe that is part of it. And I think the Wildlife Resources Commission staff has struggled with trying to um, make this a productive exercise just as much as we have. And I think that is where what, what we would like to see is for us to get back to the table with uh, WRC staff and some small groups and really talk about joint management. What does it mean in uh, joint waters, what does it mean in coastal waters and, and in the waters, and just have some discussions about, uh, and maybe the discussion is about boundary lines. Fish don't know boundary lines, uh, if, as if that's a big announcement, but they don't. And so the discussion needs to really focus on what are the management concerns, not from just this commission, this staff, but also from uh, the Wildlife Resources Commission. And I spoke with uh, Wildlife Resources Commission leadership, uh, some of their leadership yesterday, and they are very amenable to coming back to the table with us and really starting over again because I think we just simply kind of got the cart before the horse. Uh, we, we didn't identify problems or issues, and we went straight to um, boundary line drawing, and that was just put us in a difficult situation by us, I mean all of us. Um, and so I think that getting back to the table with uh, some Wildlife Resources Commission staff and just opening these, this dialogue again from the beginning uh, would be a very useful exercise for everybody involved. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you, Director. Um, it appears there is not an appetite by this commission to take up these lines of delineation and the uh, MOA at this point. Is that what I am sensing from this commission by consensus? which I believe that is the case. Um, we still have something that we need to address because our boss said to address it, and that is the uh, future conflicts with um, not everybody not complying with each other's joint rules. And I, I did my best thinking in the shower, and I, I felt like based on what I've been hearing and what I've been hearing from the environmental people, that this was probably going to be our end point. And so what do we do to try to end the um, conflicts that we're having within the joint rules adoption? And I thought, well, you know, as the director said, fish don't know lines. They, they go wherever they want to go. A couple things I do know that we know is how to manage marine and estuarine resources and given wildlife, they have the knowledge and expertise to manage inland fishery species. So why don't we just look at the resource? That's what we're here for. We're here for the resource. And so why don't we, in fact, I don't normally do this, but I'm going to make a motion that we ask um, um, the staff to come up with a process be it through rule or what have you, where that's the focus. We take care of marine and estuary and resources. They take care of inland resources. And we work together through a, a memo of understanding, a memo of uh, joint enforcement or what have you. And I, th I think that will, if, if we just focus in on the resource and let the experts handle the areas that they are experts in, that should resolve the problem. And so I have made a motion, and I would like second. a second. A second by Commissioner Rader. Any discussion on this? Well, you, 
Mr. One, Mr. one comment, if I could. Yes. I mean, it seems like our uh, history on diadermous upstream, downstream spawning species um, creates a, an immediate need to get some of those underlying questions answered anyway. They're, they they have expertise. We have expertise. It, it is already shared, and it may well be that identifying a short list of, of near-term needs for that coordination might create an interesting um, opportunity to try out some of the ideas that you were thinking about. Okay. Commissioner Cross. Uh, when you're talking about the resource, are we talking about uh, basically splitting up a list of individual species and different, because I mean, I can think of a couple going to be, have to be shared regardless, but is that what we're headed in that direction? I, I think so. I think we identify what is classified as marine and estuarine. We know a largemouth bass is an inland species. And there are maybe some gray areas that the staffs are going to have to work out how to do it, but it's going to be part of that process. Well, the most big elephant in the room immediately comes to mind striped bass. But, I mean, I, I think, the, you know, if you can narrow down the list to a short list, then maybe it's more achievable than what we're trying to chew off now, I yeah. think. That's, that's going to be part of the process. Commissioner uh, Blanton. Mr. Chairman, just point of clarification, what is the, what is the motion? Okay, uh, can we get a mo uh, somebody typing the motion up? Okay, I'll, I'll be glad to. All right. What have you got? Council just said I can't make a motion. So, so you you're going to make the motion, Commissioner Rader? Yes, I, I will make the motion okay. as written, with the exception that uh, can co-manage the resource of uh, with each commission focusing on their areas of primary expertise. Okay. Inland and estuarine or marine, and coordinating on those obvious areas of overlap, including upstream, downstream spawning species. It's just striped bass, shad, river herring, well, let, let, let's sturgeons, maybe not, let's maybe eels. Let's <laughs> identify the species right now. Let's just let that be part of the process. So. Yeah, absolutely. But the point I'm making is that there, as Commissioner Cross suggested, yeah. there are areas we already have statutory duties yeah. to overlap when, right. with, and we should lay those out in, in the third basket. Okay. In, right. in inland, estuarine, marine, and those that we already know we have to coordinate on. Okay, that'll be fine. Okay, all right. Since there is a motion, is there a second to it? it okay. All right. That's actually fine with me. But if you want to clarify for the public later, it would be. With the Wildlife Resource Commission focusing on predominantly inland species, the Marine Fisheries Commission focusing on predominantly estuarine and marine species, and the two commissions working together to develop coordinated management on those whose life histories cross both inland and estuarine marine waters necessarily. All right. Are you, okay, we're good with that. We have a motion. I need a second. Second by. Uh, I'll, I'll second the motion okay. just, just for the discussion. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Any discussion on this motion? Commissioner Roller. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm supportive of this direction. I think that obviously we're going to have to see what staff comes up with, right, and have further discussion on that. But um, my comment here is one of my big concerns with this whole process is in the management of our estuarine species, the importance of proclamation authority in managing these highly volatile coastal species. Um, so I would hope that this sort of process would give some, you know, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, you know where I'm going. And uh, our director does have proclamation authority, their director does not. 
and so that's just that much more of a safety net for the marine and estuarine resources. Commissioner Blanton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I, I'm looking at this, the, some of the language here in this motion, I have some, some very initial concerns. Uh, the the co-manage part, um, and, and I wish I hadn't a second this motion because I would like to offer some amendments and I sort of got into that. Um, I, I don't feel like we need to co-manage anything. And I don't think that's the right word. You know, we, we're, we're the, the Division of Marine Fisheries and the Marine Fisheries Commission is set out to manage the marine and aspirin species. Sure, there is some joint plan, a joint plan out there, and there's some joint rules. I think we need to understand each other's jurisdiction, and and I think we need to to work towards. Um, I'm not sure if collaboratory or is the right word, but. Under, I think more clarification and understanding of what we are responsible for and, and how we approach that. But co-manage, I, I don't care for that language one bit. Um, Even if you seconded this motion, you can offer an amendment to the motion. Okay. Um, and so I, I was or, not or able to get make, my thoughts make with Mr. Chairman, as a maker and the seconder together agree, can also amend the motion. Yes, Isn't that yes. True? If y'all can go, if y'all agree, you can go ahead and, and uh, change Th the thank motion. Thank you. Line. So I, I would accept that as a friendly amendment to the to the motion and reword it, saying can collaboratively manage or so work, with, work together you, to manage. Or? Yeah, you've withdrawn this motion and making a new motion with that change. It's a substitute okay. motion with the change. Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would be okay with withdrawing the motion, having a little bit more discussion here, finding a, a little more fine tuning to this verbiage, for, because I'm not opposed to the division bringing anything, a, a paper back to us, sort of outlining their the concerns. I would like to see that include the concerns of the CRC, the EMC, and all of the things that are valid here. This is you know. Um, an all-encompassing and I think a very much so larger issue by changing lines and 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 so um, I think we just need to uh, to figure out how to stay in our lane how to how to coexist to coexist together and what we're responsible for managing um, and understand there's going to be some overlap and that, that find the discrepancies in the language and sort of clarify that. And that's what I would like to see come back to uh, before us is, is how we can come up with an agreement that, that we both have responsibilities. And it's okay that there's some overlap, but one doesn't need to have sole supreme power over the other necessarily or, or any body of water um, that may currently exist in a joint, in a joint way. Um, and so that's where I'm at with that. Thank you. Uh, Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, <clears throat> I feel like these conversations are kind of taking us right back to the same box that we just, or we're trying to jump out of. Uh, so just to offer from my perspective, if the, the broader that we can leave this to just lead us to a discussion with Wildlife Resources Commission to talk about management of these species. And to Commissioner Blanton's point, um, it, it may be a discussion that leads us in a direction that we didn't even realize we wanted to go. We have to first sit down in a room and agree on the information and what our jurisdictions are. Uh, one of the things that I think is missing from this conversation is that in statute, and I'm sure that uh, Philip will correct me if I'm wrong, but in statute, the Wildlife Resources has jurisdiction over migratory saltwater fish in in the waters, this is a big piece of, of this that I think is misunderstood uh, in, in some situations. So, I think what what I what I visualize is a conversation from with the Wildlife Resources Commission upper level staff that is very new and very broad. That you know, what are our issues? What what do you think jurisdiction is? What do we think it is? Identify the laws and rules that uh, put us in in those situations, and then go from there and identifying any issues that we might have and how we might address those issues. But the, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but the more directions that y'all give us yeah. here, the worse it's gonna be, if yeah. that makes sense. I mean, just in a, in a. Mr. Schrader. 
I guess uh, I understood that you needed a, an action by the commission to back you up. You, you said by consensus, you heard the consensus. And yeah. so if you need a, a motion on the table to decline to accept the MOA and associated maps at this time, I would make such a motion. Or do you think you already have the sense of the commission? I've got the sense of the commission that that is an avenue we do not want to go down. But also we need to do something towards addressing the need and the conflicts in joint rules. That was what we were told to do. Right. And the way to do it, in, in my opinion, is let's us take care of the marine and estuarine resources and let wildlife take care of the inland resources. And there needs to be some discussion on how that would take place, and which is what I think the director was alluding to, correct? Yes, sir. And I think that we, we could have initial discussions with the Wildlife Resources Commission and then come back to, they could go back to yeah. their commission, we could come back to this commission, and this is what our meeting resulted in. Yeah. And just clearly lay out what our discussions were and where we ended on some of the things. One meeting won't get us all the way where we probably need to be, but it'll give us you know, some food for thought for future discussions. Okay. Um, I mean, it, it, I actually believe that we will be coming back to these intercommission coordination issues more generally as we re-engage the Habitat and Water Quality Standing Advisory Committee and the CHIP process to identify those places where the work of this commission is fundamentally impaired by the lack of attention to some of those kinds of issues. So this, this question, I, I would personally love it if staff could come back to us with a proposal about how we would move forward in furthering key and priority intercommission needs, including this one. Um, having declined to accept this MO, whatever it is, UA, um, at this time. I mean, it, so if you could bring us, bring us that. Yeah, and I don't even know, and y'all can decide if you really even need a motion. I hear you. Yeah. And, and, and we'll go and, and meet with WRC and um, bring back what we discussed, and then we can, you know, Rediscuss at another commission meeting how we want to move forward on those items or you know whether or not we even selected any items Um, okay So there is a motion a second on the floor. Um, would you care to withdraw your motion? Yeah, just to make sure we, we have um, That's right, because you didn't second it. Mover and the changes. seconder have both agreed to withdraw the motion. Okay. We have done so. All right, the motion's been withdrawn, and staff has heard what we want to see from them. This is going to eventually, I'm sure, have to end up in rulemaking because there's rules in place right now showing one thing to other. So th this is going to take a while to get done, but at least we are on a proper path to... Uh, address what and manage what we are experts in and them what they are experts in. So do you have enough direction from us, Director? Yes, sir, I, I, we do. Okay, Thank great, you. great. All right. Okay. That does finally end the Chairman's report. Um, why don't we take a quick 15-minute break and we'll go into the committee reports.
Okay, we're getting close to our 15 minutes. Let's get back in our seats and carry on with business. hope you all had some extra backs. So I, I've thought, like, wait a minute, maybe not. Maybe it is. Yep. I know who I am. Second time I lost, I found the first one. Okay. All right, moving on to our committee reports. Uh, Chris Bat Savage, would you take us through our nominating committee report, please, sir? Yes, I will. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, hope everyone can hear me okay. And uh, uh, welcome, Sarah, to the Marine Fisheries Commission. Uh, you, you won't be bored, at least not often, maybe during some of my stuff, but otherwise pretty exciting stuff. Uh, anyways, uh, yeah, uh, I'll be uh, going over the, uh, the nominating uh, committee uh, report um, and just some background information on that as well. Uh, North Carolina general statutes require that the uh, MFC approve nominees for federal fisheries management council seats for the governor's consideration. The governor must uh, nominate no fewer than three individuals for a federal fishery management council seat. And then the U.S. Secretary of Commerce will appoint one of the nominees to the council seat. Uh, Dewey Hemelwright is the current obligatory member from North Carolina on the, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council, and he's completed his third consecutive term, so he's not eligible for reappointment. Uh, the nom uh, MFC's nominating committee met on October 11th and forwarded the following individuals to the MFC for consideration for the Mid-Atlantic Council's obligatory seat. And those, uh, those nominees are Mike Blanton, a commercial fisherman from Elizabeth City, Jess Hawkins, a retired fisheries manager and educator and currently an ecotour operator um, from Moorhead City, Thomas Newman, uh, a commercial fisherman from Williamston, and Robert Rule, a commercial fisherman from Wanchies. Biographical summaries for each are included in your brief material. The uh, commission uh, today needs to approve um, the uh, nominees for the North Carolina obligatory seat on the Mid-Atlantic Council. And as always, uh, we advise that the commission not select uh, preferred candidates for these appointments, but rather leave those decisions to the governor. So that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, questions? Commissioner Roller? I was just going to make a motion. Okay, go ahead and make a motion, please. I move that we approve all four candidates for the Mid-Atlantic seat. All right. Is there a second, second to that? To the governor. Second. Second by Commissioner Shellam. All right, great. Yes, sir, Commissioner Roller. Uh, I just want to provide some discussion. Um, you know, we've got several of these candidates in the room, and I hope they're listening. Y'all have some very, very big shoes to fill. Dewey Hemorrhoid was as bad as fine a commissioner or a council member as we could have for the state of North Carolina. So, um, Also, I'm really proud to see three serious fishermen included on this list, full-time commercial fishermen for this obligatory seat. This is a stakeholder-driven process, one of which I'm a part of. And when we have fishermen willing to serve, I'm glad to see them applying, and they should be given full consideration. Thank you. Okay, any other discussion? All right, we'll take a voice vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes with, with Commissioner Blant recusing himself from the vote. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, do we have, we should have in our briefing materials reports, if any, from our advisory committees and standing committees. So just refer to those, please. Director's report. I, I could have sworn I just heard somebody groan back there when they the director's <laughs> report. I don't know who that was. Yeah, it was my stomach. They're fired. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so thank you, Chairman Bizzle. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to um, welcome Commissioner Gardner um, to the Marine Fisheries Commission. We look forward to uh, working with you and continuing to work with um, the uh, 
other members as well. I wanted to mention again, and I will continue to do this in my director's report, our 200 year anniversary, which is coming up quick. You should have all received invitations to our kickoff meeting uh, or a kickoff celebration that uh, is going to be held December 1st um, from 10 to 12 at the Crystal Coast Civic Center in Moorhead City. And hopefully you got your invitations. We'll have some displays um, some uh, from Marine Patrol, some other sections in our division. We'll also have, we'll hear from Deputy Chief Secretary of the Department of Environmental Quality, um, Tim Watkins, and some of our retired Marine Patrol employees. And we'll have a presentation from David Bennett, who is a curator of maritime history at the Maritime Museum. Uh, there in Beaufort on historical perspectives of fisheries management in the state. So we're looking forward to this kickoff celebration, and I'll continue to update the commission on other activities that we will be having throughout 2023 to celebrate our 200-year anniversary. Will there be an open bar? <clears throat> oh, no, sir. That, that will not be. I, <laughs> I apologize for that, but we, we, we will not. Okay. So you heard that, right, Bill? No bar. <laughs> um, I just wanted to talk a little bit, too, about... Uh, DMF outreach, which is a priority of mine at the division, it a absolutely does uh, take a, a village to do outreach, for sure. And uh, I plan to continue to update this commission on some of our activities, just to keep you uh, informed about what we're, what we're doing and, and the folks that we're reaching out to. Uh, we have had, or DMF staff has attended approximately 17 outreach, outreach events since your last meeting, and I, I feel like it may be a little bit more than that, but that's what uh, was on the report that I see I received. Uh, three of those events were surf fishing tournaments. We attended one in September, October, and November. I usually try to go to these uh, surf fishing tournaments. They are uh, with Marine Patrol. They are um, unique opportunities for us to get out and actually talk to fishermen while they're fishing uh, on the beach. And we get to talk to a lot of locals as well as a lot of people from other states. Uh, where they share information about their state's management, the current uh, status of their stocks, and um, why they come to North Carolina to fish. Uh, so it's really, it does lead to a lot of great opportunities for um, discussing our state's management and um, those types of things, and, and really is, is a good opportunity, I believe, for, for outreach. Uh, some of the highlights for September, uh, staff attended the Hatteras Day at the Docks, and we always are ready and willing to do elementary school programs, which we think are very important as far as educating kids on fisheries in our state. Uh, and we also attended a program at the North Carolina Estuarium. Uh, in October, we um, were present at the open house for the UNCW uh, Center of Marine Science uh, elementary school events. And then we also attended a, a seafood quality and safety workshop. And to round out our outreach activities since your last meeting, uh, myself and some staff from our license and statistics section as well as Marine Patrol, and we were also joined by a uh, NOAA's Dr. Richard Cody. He's with the Office of Science and Technology. He works on the MRIT program, and uh, we held two outreach meetings with the for hire industry uh, in the Dare County area. One of the meetings was in <coughs> Manio, and one was in Hatteras. I really initiated these meetings as a way to reach out to this group uh, in those areas to talk about the importance of to talk about our data program and the importance of collecting data from them and their participation in these programs and to hear any concerns or questions that they might have and um, to me this kind of goes a long way in an attempt uh, my attempt as the director to prioritize outreach for our division and it was very productive the Hatteras meeting was extremely productive and it was well attended. The captains came with a, a lot of really great questions and comments about a, ver a wide variety of topics. And really, we all talked about it. The staff talked about it after the meeting was over, and it was a conversation like, we wish for those types of meetings every time we went out to the public. This would be a gravy job. Um, but that, you know, it was just a really good meeting. And I would be remiss if I did, if I did not mention um, Mr. Woody Joyner. I don't know if he's still here. Yes, he is. Uh, he is, and he gave public comment today, so you know that he is the um, director of the um, North Carolina Water United President, and he is awesome to work with. And we reached out to Mr. Woody about logistics of where to have the meeting in Hatteras, and 
you know, what, what kind of interest did he think we would get? And immediately he, he jumped into action to help coordinate this and, and get folks to show up. So it really was um, a joint effort, and we do appreciate uh, working with him, and we look forward to working with that group moving forward. And we do plan to have these types of outreach events as going throughout the state after the first of the year. Uh, but the, those first two were really, <clears throat> it takes a lot to get get to these type of events and to schedule them, but we do plan to do it in the rest of, rest of the state in 2023. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to move on. And if anybody has any questions, just interrupt me. That's fine. Yep. Uh, quick, Director. Um, why did you choose to meet? Um, I know that it's very easy in Dare County to meet with the for hire community because they're very concentrated at the fishing center in Hatteras Village. Are you going to plan any future meetings? And and I bring that up just because I feel you know as a for hire fisherman, um, particularly in the southeast part of the state, they, they feel a little bit neglected, right? Because we're an important economic um, component of the fishery, and I think. I, and I commend you on all the outreach you're doing. This is something that's been lacking from the division in previous decades, in my opinion. I just hope that you have a plan to do more in the future for the rest of the state. Yes, we absolutely do. And we started in that area because we were having some uh, issues with um, captains participating in our four hire surveys and, and um, interviews from our folks. So you know, we basically said, well, what better time to start than now, and let's start here and, and, and address these things right away and see if we can, you know, talk about the importance of, of, of those surveys and collecting that data from that sector. So absolutely, we plan to move south uh, from that area throughout the state um, next year, sometime next year, as soon as we can, we can get around to it. Okay, uh, thank you. And so moving on, I want to give a Southern Flounder, an uh, update on the Southern Flounder season, and include some general feedback that we've received from stakeholders uh, throughout the season and point out a few statistics that might be uh, interesting to y'all or important. Staff from all sections with the Division of Marine Fisheries were involved in the activities uh, related to flounder during the recreational and commercial seasons. The division certainly recognizes the uh, importance uh, of this fishery to both commercial and recreational stakeholders and also the impacts that a 72 percent reduction can have uh, on these fisheries and we recognize and prioritize the importance of monitoring this fishery to make sure that we're we're hitting the targets that we set out in amendment three so we also tried to be visible to stakeholders so that we can answer questions about management why is it why it is in place why uh, the commission took the actions that they did and I talked about this focus quite a bit at your, at your August meeting as well. So just as a reminder, the recreational season for uh, flounder opened September 1st through the 30th. Um, one fish per person and 15 inches total length. And harvest estimates are not yet available. And we hope to be able to update you at your February meeting on, on what they are, um, <clears throat> what they were. Uh, as a reminder, the recreational sector had a total allowable catch quota of 159,000 pounds and some change. Um, effort was made to be at boat ramps to talk to people during the recreational season. Uh, we also um, encouraged people to donate their carcasses so that we could collect data. And we, um, we received over 500 otoliths for aging um, that were collected from racks that were donated by the recreational um, public to the carcass collection program. So that was really really good and, and great to see. And we did have interactions at boat ramps talking to folks just about uh, the fishery and the resource and the importance of providing those racks so that we can collect that data. The commercial season was <clears throat> a bit difficult to manage, to say the least, uh, but that's exactly what we expected. Uh, and we were certainly glad to get this year under our belt to see. We all talked about what it might look like, but you never really know uh, so until it happens. So. Um, and I know it was difficult for, for the commercial fishermen as well. But um, it opened statewide for mobile gears and for pound nets in the northern management unit on September the 15th, and then for the central and southern pound net management units on October the 1st. The quota is 372,000 pounds and some change, and that is split across the various areas and gear categories. The final commercial statistics won't be available until trip ticket data is entered and verified, and that'll be early 2023. Uh, of course, we, we, do, we did keep up with daily landings through, through um, quota monitoring reports, 
Um, and this season, 146 dealer permits were issued and a total of 4,176 report logs um, were received and reviewed by the division's quota monitoring staff. That's a lot. Um, and I wish, I wish Willow, I don't think, is Willow here? No, Willow and not Marissa. They, they did a lot of work trying to keep up with all these uh, dealer quota monitoring. Uh, it was a big, a huge lift for them as well. Um, majority of the dealers still opted to report by phone daily, and that kept staff busy. Um, and the division actively tracked these landings and opened and closed areas and gears based on the guidance from Amendment 3. And again, we knew it was going to be difficult, um, but it certainly didn't last very long. The Mobile Gear Southern Management Unit closed after seven days, and the Northern U Management Unit closed after eight days. Uh, due to turtle interactions, three subunits of Management Unit B closed to the use of gill nets after two days. And these were the only closures during the short uh, mobile gear season due to protected species interactions. But you can see kind of how there's a general theme here of how quickly um, these seasons were over. Uh, we can, division staff completed over 251 observer trips uh, during the uh, mobile gear seasons when gill nets, wild gill nets were allowed. And these included both onboard and alternative platform uh, trips. Both of the mobile gear management units reopened to the use of gigs and hook and line gear on October 9th, uh, with the southern management unit closing completely to the use of mobile gear on October the 13th, and the northern management unit on October the 28th. Uh, for pound nets, the northern area was open for a total of 23 days, and the central for 21 days, and the southern for six days. So again, it's not long, doesn't take long to land those fish when you're at a 72% reduction. And I think that when you talk about 72% reduction, you still don't know what that's going to look like as a fishery. And now we kind of have an a, a idea of what that looks like. Um, of course, the duration of these openings, we also uh, included step downs in, in vessel limits uh, in an effort to extend the season and control excessive discards uh, from a su sudden closure of the pound net fishery. So we really basically met daily to discuss uh, what our management would be uh, moving forward. So we were very actively monitoring and managing this fishery. Uh, we do acknowledge that that's problematic for commercial fishermen. We're going to open today. We're going to close tomorrow. We're going to open back up the next day. We, we understand how that play is problematic for them. Uh, but I can also caution that I expect that's the way this season is going to look uh, while we're under these 72% um, uh, reductions. We learned a lot this season about how the fishery is going to respond to the new regulations and the new management, and we'll carry that forward into next season. We will, um, again, be monitoring this fishery very actively. And, um, you know, we can all, we also welcome to hear from commercial fishermen or stakeholders if there are things that we can do to manage differently to help um, them managing their activities as well. We're more than happy to try and do that, but we just don't have a whole, there's not a whole lot of a room, wiggle room uh, considering the reductions uh, in this fishery. So moving on to striped bass, uh, ASMA fall recreational season. They want to, oh, sorry, oh, Commissioner Roller, yeah. go ahead. Uh, th thank oh, you. Sorry. Do, do you mind if I ask just a quick question? I, I was curious if you could provide any insight onto how the pound net fishery has changed under this reduction. Is there any preliminary um, information you can give? Is, is effort down? Is participation down? So one of the things that we, we do think um, that we don't think that most folks are setting their entire uh, gang of nets, um, they may, if they have a five set, uh, a five pound set, they may only set two, or if they have 10 different sets, they may only set one or two instead of all of them. I think a lot of the fishermen have um, erred on the side of, I'm just going to set a couple of my sets if they have more than one, uh, because it's just, you know, and I think a fisherman talked about this in public comment, it costs a lot of money to get those nets set, and when you only can catch 72% of what you were catching, and you may not need all of your nets. Now, we did see um, some fishermen in different areas took a different approach, and they set all their nets. Um, but if I had to, you know, pencil out a number, guess, I would think that it, it is down uh, for sure as far as what the fishermen are, are setting. 
Are you going to have any hard data or information on that? I mean, it'd be interesting to see how, you know, the sustainable fishery is impacted. So we can look at, um, we can, we can look at the number of sets that were active. Uh, we, we can, we can look at that data. The one thing we can't tell is if a fisherman, for instance, if a fisherman has a set that has three pounds in it, he only he or she only has to call that net in once he sets one pound. He doesn't necessarily have to set the other two, and if he does, he doesn't have to call us. So he may have he may be permitted for a three pound set, but he may only set one of those pounds, and we wouldn't know if he set the other two. So, but we can tell when uh, a set was um, was at, became active. Okay, thank you. Because I was just I was surprised, like anyone, how fast the gillnet quota was caught. Right, I mean, because it was open considerably longer in past years with the same, well, like last year with the same reduction. Yeah, yeah, and like say, when you when you have a such a huge reduction, you don't know uh, how that fishery really will look once you put those those uh, parameters in place. So it was it, it was surprising to. I mean, I didn't think it was going to be long, but I didn't think it was going to be quite that that quick either. But. <clears throat> um, so for back to striped bass, so you will hear from staff on Amendment 2 uh, to the striped bass fishery management plan later today, but I wanted to just update the commission on some of the adaptive management actions that have been taken under Amendment 1 to the striped bass fishery management plan since your August meeting. So first, as just a reminder, uh, I did ask the staff to update the 2020 Albemarle Roanoke stock assessment, which had a 2017 terminal year and they updated that with data through 2021. We got the results um, from that update, and although we, main a, we maintain a high level of concern about this stock, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, uh, both DMF staff and WRC staff expressed concerns about the update results. And I met with the uh, WRC executive director and some of his upper level management staff to discuss concerns about the stock assessment update results and what, what our potential path forward might be. <clears throat> and both, uh, both of us agreed that um, we had significant concerns about the results uh, of the stock assessment, some of the diagnostics uh, of the model and really the estimates of stock size. Um, and based on these concerns, I have asked staff to send the updated results out to the peer review panel who uh, originally peer reviewed this assessment back when it was um, back when it was done and for additional input and discussion. So I think staff is uh, should be reaching out to them soon here uh, to to just get some input on that. We will continue to manage under November 2020 revision to Amendment 1 uh, of the striped bass FMP until we get input uh, from the peer review panel on the stock assessment update results. And just a reminder, the total allowable landings uh, from that revision uh, are 51,216 pounds, and they are split evenly between commercial and recreational sectors. And I will caution that although the results themselves are um, a little squirrely and we want to look at them a little more closely and get some input from the stock assessment folks. We are seeing very concerning trends in this fishery and we, may, we very well may be back here um, in February or after that to discuss a moratorium on this fishery. It is a very real possibility and I don't want to um, you know, try to smooth this over and act like we are not concerned about this fishery and we may ha you may have some uh, tough decisions um, moving forward for this fishery, so we are very concerned about it. Um, but I would like to get the, this input first and see if we can get a better picture of really where we are. Uh, and really, managing 51,000 pounds is difficult um, in, in itself. So hopefully, that kind of clears up some of the the actions that um, that I took under adaptive management for striped bass. <coughs> There, if there are no questions, I'm going to move on to um, ASMFC and, and Mid-Atlantic. Um, so I'll start with Chris Bat-Savage and ask him to come up and uh, give an update on the happenings at those, uh, that commission and that council. Thank you, Kat. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and 
actually do the Mid-Atlantic Council uh, update first. Uh, they, they met ahead of time, and then I'll roll right into uh, a ASMFC. Uh, so the, uh, the Mid-Atlantic uh, Fishery Management Council met back in early October up in uh, Dewey Beach, Delaware. Uh, a couple highlights uh, from that meeting. First was uh, spiny dogfish. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic Council recommended a 12 million pound commercial spiny dogfish quota for the 2023 fishing year, which begins on May 1st. Uh, this quota is 59% lower than the 2022 quota, uh, but it, it's still higher than the 2021 landings of about 10.4 million pounds coastwide. Uh, the reduction is based on the Scientific and Statistical Committee's lower catch recommendation due to observations of decline in trends in several indicators, including survey abundance, uh, catch per unit effort, pup production, and dogfish growth. A spiny dogfish uh, benchmark stock assessment will be completed next year, uh, which will guide management starting in 2024. The New England Fishery Management Council will consider its spiny dogfish recommendations at its meeting next month for this jointly managed stock in federal waters, and ASMFC will set the commercial quota for state waters at their winter meeting. Uh, next item is uh, the right whale vessel strike reduction proposed rule. Uh, I think I mentioned this at the, the last time we met. Uh, but just some follow-up on that. Uh, the Council received a report from uh, its Protected Resources Committee on a meeting they had to review the right whale vessel strike reduction proposed rule, and uh, the committee recommended that the Council submit uh, a comment letter to NOAA Fisheries. Uh, just as a reminder about the proposed rule, <clears throat> the changes, uh, proposed changes uh, would expand the uh, mandatory speed restrictions of 10 knots or less in designated areas of the ocean to include most, most vessels from 35 to 65 feet in length and broaden the spatial boundaries and time into the seasonal speed restriction areas along the U.S. East Coast. Uh, the Council agreed with the committee's recommendations uh, to write the comment letter that includes uh, points that uh, were brought up during, during that, that meeting. And those points include uh, a consideration of the proposed timing uh, and area of speed zones given the scale and potential of the potential impacts to recreational fisheries, especially during the month of May in the Middle Atlantic region. The enforceability of this rule in state and federal waters, uh, the need to clearly, uh, for clearly defined speed zone uh, exceptions for safety under a variety of uh, emergency situations uh, besides just uh, gale warnings, uh, and urge NOAA fisheries to uh, consider stakeholder comments since there, were no stakeholder, there was no stakeholder engagement throughout the development of this, development of this proposed rule. <clears throat> so, as I said, moving right into ASMFC, where they met uh, last week. Oh. Yes. Let me ask you a quick question. Um, have they determined is it going to be a year-round speed restriction or by months when the right wheels are migrating, or what, what are they looking at? Yeah, no, good question. Uh, they're proposing seasonal speed restrictions um, and for areas uh, North Carolina. So from Wilmington uh, to just north of Kill Devil Hills, it would be November 1st to April 30th. Uh, from Wilmington south to Brunswick, Georgia, be November 1st to April 15th. And then from north of uh, uh, Kildova Hills to um, roughly uh, Cape, Cape Ann, Massachusetts, so kind of the northern part of the state, uh, November 1st through May 30th. So it's just timing of when the uh, right whale migration and distribution yeah. is. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, ASMFC met last week up in Long Branch, New Jersey for their annual meeting. Um, just as always, I'll just hit, um, hit the highlights uh, from, from that meeting. <clears throat> and um, uh, as usual, I'll start with striped bass. Uh, the striped bass management board reviewed the striped bass stock assessment update that included data through 2021. And just as a reminder to the commission and anyone uh, listening, uh, the public, uh, direct ASMFC management of striped bass in North Carolina only applies to fish caught in the Atlantic Ocean. So this stock assessment and any resultant management um, does not apply to the state's estuarine striped bass populations. Uh, the results of the assessment found that the stock is still overfished. However, overfishing is no longer occurring. Uh, the female spawning stock biomass uh, in 2021 was estimated at uh, 143 million pounds, which is below the spawning stock biomass threshold of 188 million pounds and below the target of 235 million pounds. Fishing mortality in 2021 was 0 0.14, which is below the threshold of 0 0.2 and the target of 0 0.17. The uh, 2022 assessment update also included uh, projections to determine the probability of the spawning stock biomass being at or above the target by 2029, which is the uh, stock rebuilding uh, deadline. 
the projections assumed a period of low juvenile recruitment, which is which currently matches what we're seeing with the striped bass population along the Atlantic coast. Uh, those projections found that the stock has a 79% chance of rebuilding to the target by 2029 under the current fishing mortality. So no additional management measures to reduce harvest were implemented at this meeting. Uh, however, there were some uh, board members that raised concerns that maintaining uh, a fishing mortality rate this low is very difficult, uh, especially if fishing effort and catch increases as the stock increases, which is a very likely scenario. Uh, however, uh, there will be two more stock assessments in the next five years for striped bass that uh, track uh, stocker building progress. The board, uh, in addition, the board will also uh, use um, the annual FMP reviews to see how the annual catches compare to the catches in the stock projections required to maintain a fishing mortality rate of 0 0.14. So therefore, the, uh, the board has opportunities to implement man management measures if it appears the stock won't rebuild by 2029. Uh, at this meeting, the management board also approved draft addendum 1 to amendment 7 uh, to the striped bass FMP. The uh, draft addendum considers uh, allowing for the voluntary transfer of striped bass commercial quota in the ocean regions between states that have uh, ocean commercial quota. Uh, the draft addendum proposes a range of options that would uh, permit uh, voluntary transfers of commercial quota, including options based on uh, stock status and options allowing the board to set the criteria uh, for transfers on a regular basis. Public comment period and public hearings will occur uh, in December and January, and I suspect the public hearing schedule should be posted uh, pretty soon. Uh, North Carolina has requested a webinar-based public hearing uh, for, for this addendum. Um, the board will then uh, review the submitted comments and consider final action on this addendum at their meeting in February. Uh, next up is, uh, is Atlantic Menhaden. Uh, the Atlantic Menhaden Management Board uh, set the 2023 total allowable catch uh, to 233,550 metric tons. Uh, to put that, convert that over into pounds, that's 515 million pounds. Uh, that's about a 20% increase from the 2021 and 2022 total allowable catches. And uh, it's based on the positive stock status of the resource uh, under the ecological uh, reference point based management that uh, Menhaden's been uh, under for the last couple of years. Uh, the increase has uh, less than a 40% probability of exceeding the, uh, the target set by the ecological reference point. So it's a relatively conservative increase in total allowable catch. Uh, the board at this meeting also approved Addendum 1 to Amendment 3 to the, to the FMP. This addendum considers changes to the commercial allocations, uh, the episodic set-aside program, and the incidental catch in small-scale fisheries provision to align state quotas with recent landings and resource availability while maintaining access uh, to the resource for all states, uh, reducing dependence on commercial quota transfers and minimizing regulatory discards. The addendum uh, changed the uh, allocations for the commercial fishery by first setting the, the minimum allocations, kind of the base allocations, uh, and then setting the remainder of the uh, total allowable catch, excluding that 1% set aside for episodic events. Um, and that, that uh, remaining tack is based on the landings history of the fishery from 2018, 2019, and 2021. So this is a comparison. The base years before that was 2009 to 2011. Uh, 2020 was not used in this, this latest allocation um, due to uh, COVID restrictions on landings uh, in certain states. Uh, what this kind of means for North Carolina in terms of allocation is uh, North Carolina's allocation decreased uh, from 0.96% to 0.37%. Um, and for under the, the TAC for next year, that comes out to about 1.88 million pounds. Uh, to put that in perspective, um, North Carolina's annual landings over the last 10 years has been less than a million pounds a year. So, you know, don't expect really... Um, any any major constraints over over the the allocation decrease. Um, additionally, the addendum uh, removes purse sains as a permitted uh, small scale uh, uh, directed gear, uh, thereby prohibiting uh, that gear from harvesting under the incidental catch and small scale fishery provision. This uh, this change really impacts the state of Maine more than than anywhere else. Purse sains can still be used, but you can only use them when you have quota. You can't use them afterwards. Uh, and then finally, uh, the addendum counts the incidental catch and small-scale fishery landings uh, against the, the total allowable catch 
And if these incidental catch and small scale fishery landings cause the, the entire attack to be exceeded, then the board must take action to modify one or both of the permitted gear types uh, and trip limits under the provision. Um, all right, uh, next uh, species I'll cover is Spanish mackerel. Uh, the Coastal Pelagics Management Board received an update on the 2022 stock system for Spanish mackerel. And this is some background as far as how management works for, for this critter. Uh, Spanish mackerel are managed in federal waters by the South Atlantic Council uh, and by ASMFC in state waters. The uh, 2022 uh, Spanish mackerel assessment included data through 2020 and is an update of the last assessment that was done about 10 years ago, I think. The uh, South Atlantic Council's Scientific and Statistical Committee reviewed the stock assessment update and had several concerns regarding the data and model fit um, of the results. Uh, the, uh, the, this committee created a working group to develop terms of reference for assessment revisions and a revised uh, assessment is scheduled for completion next April. The SSC will then determine whether the uh, revised assessment uh, should be used to inform management recommendations. So the uh, delay in finalizing the stock assessment has delayed the South Atlantic Council's plans to consider management actions in response to the assessment results. Kind of on that note of, of Spanish macro management, uh, the Coastal Pelagics Board also received an update on the differences between ASMFC and South Atlantic Council um, management for Spanish mackerel. <clears throat> the differences between the, uh, the ASMFC and South Atlantic uh, FMPs exist in terms of commercial management zones, commercial trip limits and closures, allowable gears, recreational season, and recreational accountability measures. The board initially discussed uh, these differences back uh, in February of 2020 and postponed uh, considering action to address the differences until completion of the stock assessment for Spanish mackerel, which of course isn't complete yet. The board uh, at this meeting did agree to hold off on any management changes at the ASMFC level until the South Atlantic Council considers management changes uh, for federal waters. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, ASMFC staff will work with the states to compile information on each state's fisheries to provide uh, the board with a profile of the Spanish mackerel fisheries along the coast, including the growing fisheries at the northern end of the management unit. Uh, so not having an assessment in place uh, at this point is disappointing, um, uh, considering how long it's been since the last assessment and how management is, is due for a review given the changes in the catches and distribution of Spanish mackerel over the last several years. Okay, the, uh, the final thing I'll, um, I'll cover before concluding um, is the uh, North Carolina American Shad Sustainable Fishery Management Plan. Uh, this, uh, I think it'll be found in your uh, supplemental materials, but uh, this plan uh, provides an overview of the status of the uh, Sustainable Fishery Management Plan and the 2023 management measures. Uh, just as some background on this, uh, back in 2017, uh, the ASMC approved North Carolina Sustainable Fishery Management Plan for, for shad for the years 2018 through 2022. Um, the, uh, this plan is evaluated by ASMFC's Chad and River Herring uh, Technical Committee and Management Board every five years. Um, there was, so for this plan, uh, there was no sustainability parameters exceeded, none, none of the sustainability plans exceeded the threshold in 2022, except the Neuse River Relative Abundance Index. Um, however, exceeding a sustainability parameter for a single year does not trigger management uh, in this uh, plan. The uh, 2022 American Shad uh, management measures will be maintained for the 2023 season in all areas except Albemarle Sound and the Cape Fear River. Uh, the commercial season in Albemarle Sound will be expanded in 2023 to provide additional opportunities for harvest with gears other than gill nets. The uh, 2022 American Shad harvest season was limited uh, due to restrictions on gill nets up in the Albemarle Sound to protect striped bass and uh, similar uh, restrictions on these gears uh, will will be in place in 2023, so that's the reason for the, for the change. And, in, and additionally, uh, a one-day season shift is necessary in the Cape Fear River to return to the original season dates. We had a shift last year just kind of based on calendar days. Uh, more details on the Sustainable Fishery Management Plan could be found uh, in the memo. And then an updated Sustainable Fishery Management Plan for 2023 through 2027 with data through 2022 is under development right now and is uh, due to the uh, to ASMFC uh, in December for technical committee review and the board will uh, review and approve that plan at their winter meeting. And that concludes my update, Mr. Chair. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Commissioner Blanton. Uh, could you, Chris, could you expand on the, the sustainable fishing plan for the American Shad for the Albemarle Sound and sort of 
um, explain how that changed and how the characteristics of the fishery are changing based on the striped bass stock and how um, that's going to be mitigated in the future. I mean, um, for the next uh, uh, sustainable fishery management plan, it, it seems like it might be better to explore different options now that based on the status of the striped of strike bass stock and how that uh, fishery is pursued so far as the shad fishery. Um, because um, as we know, we've, we've, we've been allowed to drop net um, during those times, and, and I'm hoping that um, we can sort of start adapting to how that change is being made, I guess, proactively uh, and by proclamation. So it's kind of confusing to those who don't really realize how that fisheries per was traditionally pursued. And so um, I could, if you could just go into a little further detail, thanks. Uh, yeah, no, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, so for 2023, as you know, the past years, the season was March 3rd through 24th, I believe. Um, and we would allow the, the float gill nets uh, in Albemarle Sound, which is the gear that catches the majority of uh, American shad. Um, this year, it's going to be February 15th through April 14th. But as I mentioned, and you alluded to, Mike, that uh, a lot of the gillnet restrictions are still in place in Albemarle Sound. Um, so probably, you know, other, other gears, just giving them an opportunity if they have incidental catch of American shad and, say, pound nets, for instance, um, outside of that, you know, in that longer time period to be able to keep them. Um, and as I mentioned, too, I, I don't know the details on what the new sustainable fishery management plan is going to look like. Uh, you know, staff's working on that right now, and I think they are considering the current uh, management measures in place uh, for Albemarle Sound as well as the other areas when, uh, when developing that plan. Um, yeah, in terms of flexibility, I think it really depends on how we, how we write that plan. I mean, you know, we can, you know, when we present it to ASMFC, it's pretty much what we have to do. Um, if we make it, we can make adjustments to that plan, but we have to get it approved by the Shadden River Herring Board at ASMFC. Just to follow up, would it be appropriate as that plan is being developed in the future to um, maybe have some input by our own advisory committees, Northern um, FinFish, just to sort of take a look at that before it's presented to Atlantic States or some sort of, um, you know, input from the fishermen that are still actively pursuing those fish? And I mean, it, so basically what I'm saying is, is that um, the fishery is changing. The way these fisheries are going, or these these fishes will be pursued, could possibly change slightly, um, either direction. But um, my concern is, is that a plan will be developed without consideration of some of these things. And so, um, maybe I'm requesting that as this process moves forward, it may be allowed to be seen by some of the advisors and fishermen. Okay, yeah, thanks. And I don't know if that's possible for this one, considering we have to get it to ASMFC. But, I mean, I think I just we could talk to staff about working working that into the timeline, um, especially if we, even during the course of this next five-year plan, uh, if there was any needs for adjustments uh, that, that could possibly, you know, we could, we could seek stakeholder input on that. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll have, we'd have to talk about it internally. And as I mentioned, the timeline for at least getting this one in place um, is is a little tight. But uh, I think those are some good points you made in terms of just kind of things to think about in the future. Anybody else? One more follow up on the right whale um, speed restrictions. How far out will that begin? I mean, is it going to be three miles beyond or at the coal regs or where is it going to start? Yeah, so it really depends on where along the coast. In North Carolina, at least south of that Kill Devil Hills line, it's from the from the coal regs out to 20 nautical miles. Uh, and then north of there, it's out even further, um, like off Virginia Beach and other parts of the Mid-Atlantic and even the very northern part of the Outer Banks. It's, it's, it's more than that. I forget how many miles. Um, the uh, letter submitted by the Mid-Atlantic Council to NOAA Fisheries, you know, Kind of flag those concerns and ask really ask about risk reductions. This is all about risk reduction. And um, 
uh, if there's if there's ways to either modify that season closure, especially as it gets into the month of May up north, there's more boating traffic um, on the water. But also uh, one consideration is if there's a higher probability of right whale distribution further offshore in that 20 mile zone, you know, to have the speed zone there. But if there's an area where it could be a, a corridor, a travel corridor closer to shore, uh, is, is that a possibility for, for boats transiting up and down the coast as opposed to just, you know, having to go 10 knots or less uh, the whole way? Um, so the, those, are, those are points that were raised at least by the Mid-Atlantic Council. Um, I suspect some other stakeholders have also had similar um, comments. So we don't know what the final outcome is, but the proposed rule is it's, it's pretty broad, uh, to, to say the least. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you very much, Director. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So Trish Murphy is in Colorado. I, I think there's a pattern here. Trish is in Colorado, and I got to go to New Jersey. I must really not be, I'm not living right or something, but she is attending an ecosystem-based fisheries management meeting in Colorado, and I am going to uh, do my best to give her very lengthy South Atlantic Council report. <laughs> um, the South Atlantic, and there's a lot of lot of stuff going on at the South Atlantic Council, so that's why it is is lengthy. Uh, they're working with the National Marine Fisheries Service and um, North Carolina State University to do a management strategy evaluation uh, for the dolphin fishery, and they are gathering information from stakeholders and on preferences and priorities uh, and concerns of dolphin fishery management. Uh, and I think there are a lot of them up and down the coast. Uh, stakeholder workshops have been held in Florida, uh, Rhode Island, and New York. The work, more workshops will be held in Virginia and the Carolinas the week of January 23rd. So that's a, a, an important week. And uh, Trish wanted to uh, stress the importance of our stakeholders and uh, particularly our charter boat captains to try and participate in the stakeholder workshops. Uh, and as you know, the council is working on Dolphin Wahoo Regulatory Amendment 3, uh, which is considering adding a size limit to dolphin, reducing bag and vessel limits similar to those in Florida. And so she just wanted to emphasize it is very important for us to uh, speak at these meetings uh, in, in December, the <coughs> in January. The, also, the council meets in December at the Wrightsville, in Wrightsville Beach at the Blockade Runner, December 5th through the 9th. So I have talked to the captains at the outreach meetings as well, um, but it's important that we continue to try to encourage them to attend. It's an opportunity to, um, you know, make comments in our home state about the issues that we have on, on dolphins. So hopefully folks will take advantage of that. <coughs> the council's um, making changes. They, they got a, a report. To, or a discussion about making changes to the spiny lobster management in North Carolina. There is a two lobster per person limit, uh, whether commercial or recreational, that's currently the limit. Our North Carolina council member, Tim Griner, requested the council consider a spiny lobster amendment to address North Carolina limits. He's stating that he has been catching quite a few lobster with rod and reel over the past five years while he was snapper grouper fishing. So you just, just want to let the commission know that issue had come up. The biggest issue that they dealt with at the council meeting, which is normally one of the bigger issues, is a red snapper, uh, the regulatory amendment 35, which addresses the red snapper um, acceptable biological uh, catch limit uh, and discard mortality. Uh, there were over a thousand comments speaking out against time and area closures to uh, address recreational discards of red snapper. And the red snapper has been rebuilding faster than projected um, with the highest abundance of small fish that f fishermen are reporting have ever seen. And independent indices are showing increases in recruitment, but the high rate of recreational discards uh, tends to be driving the overfishing status. So after long discussions, the council voted to move forward with Amendment 35 as a short-term approach to ending overfishing immediately. And the draft amendment includes actions to reduce the acceptable biological catch, or the ABC, uh, and the annual catch limits, uh, the ACLs, for red snapper that address overfishing as required. And they also include uh, options to reduce release mortality 
by allowing only single hook rigs and prohibiting the use of automatic or electric reels uh, in the snapper grouper fishery. Uh, it also includes an outreach component, uh, stressing the importance of best fishing practices in improving, in improving survivability of all snapper grouper species. The long-term approach for red snapper management uh, and for the snapper grouper complex as a whole uh, will be through the management evaluation strategy or the MSE that they're working on. Um, the council will be working with Blue Matter Sciences out of Canada on the MSE process and stakeholder uh, input, as in with most things, is a key uh, piece of this process and discussions will center around the uncertainties, uh, the management options, uh, and the management objectives. And, you know, when, he, when she talks in here about the outreach component and the importance of that, a lot of times, you know, people kind of sneer at the importance of outreach and the importance of proper release techniques and those type of things, but they are very important, and I think they are critical in this in this particular uh, situation as well. Um, for blue line tilefish, the council originally had selected a May 1st to June 30th season to match the snowy grouper season because of co-occurrence of the two species. Uh, however, this impacts the recreational fishery north of Cape Hatteras, where snowy grouper do not co-occur co with blue line tilefish. So after some discussion, the council did uh, decide to leave the season as is, uh, which is May 1st to August 31st. The postseason accountability measures for blue line tilefish will allow the National Marine Fishery Service to annually set the length of the recreational fishing season based on cat catch rates of the previous season. The council also reduced the bag limit uh, from three fish to two fish, and the amendment also includes changes to golden tile uh, annual catch limits and allocations, and will have final approval at the December meeting. The council was presented the Spanish mackerel stock assessment, the, and Chris talked about the stock assessment. Uh, this, it does indicate the stock is not overfishing and over, is not overfished, but. They're still working on the concerns with the assessment, and the MRIP data has been um, reviewed and updated, and a subcommittee, and, and again, Chris talked about this, subcommittee will review the assessment framework um, back again in April. Uh, so we're still kind of waiting on, on Spanish mackerel. You, you may remember you had discussions at your August meeting regarding um, false albacore. The issue of false albacore was also raised uh, at the council and similar conversations were had on, it, on its importance. The council will be presented a white paper on false albacore in December. And as you recall, the division is also working on uh, a similar information paper to come back to the commission. Other news from the South Atlantic Council uh, is that Dr. Carolyn Belcher of uh, Georgia uh, Department of Natural Resources was elected as the new council chair, replacing Mill Bell with South Carolina DNR. And our own Trish Murphy was elected as the new vice chair, replacing Dr. Belcher. So they got a lot of work cut out for them in the next couple of years. And again, just a reminder for folks that are listening online and fishermen in the audience, the next meeting of the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council will be held in Riceville Beach at the Blockade Runner December 5th through the 9th. <coughs> so. Questions? Commissioner Rollo. This is just a couple of comments for the record. Um, and I know I've said them before at the previous meetings, but I say them for the benefit of fishermen and people online who are listening. Uh, first of all, um, you know, as a South Atlantic Council member, right? So first of all, you know, we hear a lot of comments about red snapper. One of the interesting components to that fishery is that when you look at the South Atlantic fishery, North Carolina only comprises about 0.6% of overall harvest of that and discards in that fishery. So we're a very, very small component, which makes it very, very difficult for us to manage, right? And there's a, there's a lot of discussion we can have for that, but I just want to leave people with that, how small of a component we are. The second thing is I just want to reiterate the director's comments regarding dolphin management. I've had a lot of discussions with our fishing community, um, with the offshore charter community, and I, and I want to preface kind of what's going on with that fishery. In Florida, they're catching less of them, right? And the fishing community there is very upset. Um, 
no one really knows what's going on. It could be climate, it could be international fishing, but their fishing industry, their charter boats, their recreation, their, their tackle shops, they are involved in the process very, very loudly, and they are begging the council to do something. And what the council is looking at doing really doesn't have much of a reduction for the state of Florida, but it does have a reduction for the state of North Carolina, particularly our for higher sector. And now we've heard for years, particularly from the Northern Outer Banks, of how important our current dolphin fishery is, meaning we don't have a size restriction on them and we have a higher bag limit. So for all the fishermen listening, if this is really important to you, you have got to be involved in this process. Um, I hope that we get public comment. I hope that we get good attendance at the December meeting at the Blockade Runner um, in Wilmington. And I hope that um, we have good attendance at these uh, workshops coming up in January. So I've said my piece on that, but if um, it's very, very important. Yeah, it's just very important that fishermen get involved if they don't want to see changes to this fishery. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you, for Commissioner Roller, for those comments uh, as well. <clears throat> so moving on, uh, shellfish lease program update. Uh, I'd like to ask Owen to come up and uh, give an update on the self shellfish lease program. Check your microphone. I don't know if it's on or not. That working? There you go. Perfect. Thank you, Director Rawls. Today I'll be discussing a few updates on the shellfish lease and aquaculture program activities since your last meeting. Staff continue to implement mandates and recommendations from the 2019 Shellfish Aquaculture Bill and subsequent legislative studies, including the User Conflict Study and Shellfish Enterprise Areas in Moratorium Areas Study. For the user conflict study, the amendments to three of the 11 shellfish lease rules resulting from the user conflict study became effective on August 23rd. Generally, these rule amendments seek to address user conflicts by addressing navigation concerns, improving shellfish lease marking requirements, and generally addressing changes associated with a growing shellfish aquaculture industry. Staff have been working on implementing deliverables from these rules, including a cumulative impact policy and the shellfish leaseholder training program. Other amendments to nine shellfish lease rules were completed to help streamline and shorten uh, processes for shellfish lease applications, application grievances by the public, lease production reporting requirements, shellfish lease transfers and subleases, and further address recommendations laid out in session law 2019-37 and subsequent shellfish aquaculture user conflict study. For shellfish enterprise areas, or SEAs, we are meeting with growers in Bogue Sound to gather feedback on suitable growing areas, which, will present, which we will present to local municipalities to receive their feedback on user conflicts in these areas. Staff are summarizing all the feedback into a final report that will include recommendations on the feasibility of SEAs in moratorium areas in North Carolina and any additional resources required to implement. Once the final report is completed, Staff will incorporate the methodology used for Bogue Sound to study additional areas where SEAs could potentially be viable outside of moratorium areas, for instance, Pamlico Sound. This will be a more comprehensive undertaking because we will need to involve shellfish growers and other stakeholders in this process. The shellfish lease application window closed on August 1st for 2022. We received 85 total applications with 44 being for water column leases and 41 for bottom leases. Many of these applications will be going through the public hearing process later this year and continuing on early into 2023. Aquaculture operations permit renewals were sent out earlier this month to existing permit holders. The renewal process has been streamlined for this year and existing permit holders received a copy of their old completed permit with an option to certify that there are no changes for the 2023 year. This would allow them to renew the permit without having to refill uh, the entire form. Additionally, as part of the rule changes to three of the 11 shellfish lease rules, all shellfish leaseholders are required to hold an AOP for operation. These new AOPs were mailed out earlier this month as well. We will be providing a more in-depth presentation on lease and aquaculture program efficiencies that we have established for you at your February meeting. Finally, the Coastal Resources Commission discussed the potential floating structures issue again at their September 15th business meeting. The State Attorney General's Office presented findings from the analysis completed regarding the CRC's authority to reg regulate floating structures in shellfish leases. 
The determination was that while aquaculture is considered a form of agriculture, it is not exempt from CRC regulation. Therefore, any floating structure proposed in a shellfish lease would have to follow the CAMA process for development and would require a CAMA major permit and variance. DMF still holds regulatory authority on all leases and lease activities aside from floating structures, installation of pilings greater than 12 inches in diameter, and other specific development-related activities. That concludes my report, and I'll take any questions. Questions? Okay, great. Thank you very much, Director. Thank you, Owen. <clears throat> so moving on, CHIP implementation. I'd like to ask Jacob Boyd to come up and give you an update on that. Thank you, Director Rawls, Chairman Bissell. And is my mic close enough? Good? Okay. So today I'll be discussing some important updates on the Coastal Habitat Protection Plan since your last meeting, uh, and specifically progress on implementation of the 2021 CHIP Amendment. So staff continue to work on prioritizing and implementing the 49 recommended actions in the 2021 CHIP Amendment, including establishing timelines for the steps to achieve all of the recommendations and the actions. Uh, in September, we held the first CHIP team meeting for the implementation phase of the 2021 CHIP Amendment. Uh, to discuss expectations and who will be lead staff for each of the recommended actions um, from the other um, DEQ divisions. We are organizing a CHIP steering committee meeting for early December to orient new members, provide updates on implementation of recommended actions, and listen to issues and concerns they have. We're looking forward to working with the Commission's newest representatives on the CHIP steering committee, uh, Commissioner Rader and Commissioner Huggins. The North Carolina Water Quality Summit was held on October 19th in New Bern. As a reminder, DMF and APNEP work collaboratively with a core team of NGOs to form a public-private partnership, which are, we are referring to as the Stakeholder Engagement and Collaborative Coastal Habitats Init Initiative, or the SECI, uh, which was a recommendation from the 2021 CHIP Amendment. The summit was a kickoff for the SECI to strategically engage a diverse group of stakeholders to assist with developing and implementing recommendations to improve water quality and secure stakeholder and decision maker support for actions. Uh, we had a great turnout, uh, over 115 stakeholders uh, were in attendance, uh, including uh, members of the three commissions, the MFC, uh, Coastal Resources Commission, and Environmental uh, Management um, Commission and representatives uh, from local municipalities, state agencies, agriculture, and fishing industries and NGOs. Um, and I want to personally thank uh, Commissioner Blanton for attending and showing support. He, he provided a um, presentation at the beginning of the day on some of the water quality issues that um, he has seen in the Almaral Sound area is experiencing. So the goal was to build momentum for implementing water quality actions among a water public audience provide a forum for good ideas to emerge on specific steps needed to implement CHIP recommendations uh, prioritized by the SECI, uh, receive suggestions for specific actions such as cost, expanded cost share or watershed management that stakeholders can embrace to begin implementing after the summit and initiate formation of an inclusive stakeholder work group that provides opportunities for diverse, action-oriented and innovative stakeholder participation. So the summit, the summit served as a kickoff event to initiate this new SECI Water Quality Work Group to provide these opportunities for stakeholder leadership to implement the strategies that improve water quality. So one example that was raised by multiple stakeholders was to bring the three commissions together for a joint meeting to discuss water quality issues and identify potential actions to support improving water quality. So we will be following up with you, Chairman Bizzle, uh, and the other commission chairs soon to discuss this possibility, uh, and we'll update the full commission um, at its February meeting. There are several recommendations associated with improving water quality to levels that will sustain submerged aquatic vegetation and allow it to return where there have been um, significant losses. Uh, Division of Water Resources staff is the lead on implementing new water quality standards. Uh, DWR staff and the Nutrient Criteria Development Plan Scientific Advisory Council um, have been meeting regularly to develop draft rule language 
for a water clarity standard and assessment process. The Scientific Advisory Council agreed by con consensus with the draft criteria. At the November 8th um, EMC Water Quality Committee meeting, the committee recommended to the EMC to continue developing the standard with the Advisory Council, receive input from the Criteria Implementation Committee, and send the draft rule language to the EMC by the first quarter of 2023. So this is pretty significant because this is some of the uh, regulatory um, recommendations that came out of the 2021 CHIP amendment and is starting to address water quality issues in Almarle Sound uh, and can hopefully be used as a template moving forward in other areas of the state. In October, uh, DMF and APNEP and cooperating universities conducted SAV sampling and core sound Aerial imagery was also taken by DOT during this period. Analysis of this data, as well as data collected in the Pamlico River this summer, uh, are in the process of being summarized. Uh, and lastly, staff continued to work on incorporating the 2021 CHIP amendment recommendations into existing plans, programs, and ongoing efforts to prioritize actions for coastal habitats that will increase climate resilience and carbon sequestration and aligned with the 2020 North Carolina Climate Risk and Resilience Plan and the Natural Working Lands Action Plan. Uh, and that concludes my report, Chairman Bizzle. I'm happy to answer questions. All right. Good report. Any questions? Comments? Good enough. Thank you very much. Thanks. Director. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next will be uh, Colonel Carter Winton to come up and give us a Marine Patrol update. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. I'm Colonel Carter Whitten, and I'm here to give you the quarterly Marine Patrol update. The Marine Patrol education team provides outreach to the communities across the state, educating the public about marine fisheries. The team puts on presentations to the local schools, organizations, and expos. Recently, the team has attended both the Nags Head and Hatteras Surf Fishing Tournaments. They participated in the Outer Bank Seafood Festival, day at the docks in Hatteras and conducted and participated in various elementary school programs. During the 2022 flounder season, Marine Patrol increased patrols as part of the division-wide effort to ensure necessary data were collected to monitor the fishery and to ensure compliance with current management. Based on increased rec recreational efforts and the newly implemented daily quota monitoring requirements in the commercial fisheries, the division mobilized all staff during the recreational flounder season, also performed over 10,000 checks on coastal recreational fishing license holders. This number of checks is roughly double the number of checks from the previous months. Officer also performed over 1,200 checks of standard commercial fishing license holders, which is roughly double the number of checks during the previous months also. During this time, Marine Patrol officers served five notice of violations to Estuary and Gillnet permit holders and 11 notice of violations to Estrin Flounder dealer permit holders. In addition, officers conducted 187 large mesh gillnet observation in coordination with the division's observer program. We have recently hired four new officers who are, will be serving in Dare, Currituck, and Camden counties, and one officer on the large patrol vessel Roanoke stationed in Oregon Inlet. All current Marine Patrol officers have completed their required 24 hours of in-service training along with CPR. The Marine Patrol has been training with the NC Ferry Division to be able to assist them if there was an emergency on the ferry while it was underway. And finally, the Marine Patrol Swift Water Team was activated during Hurricane Ian by the North Carolina Emergency Management, and they were deployed to Marion, where we stood by for any flooding issues in the western part of the state if they would have occurred. The team was comprised of 13 officers. This ends my law enforcement update, and I can answer any questions. Questions? Got, whoop, I got, I got two. <laughs> got two. <laughs> um, how many officers do you have right now, and how many openings do you have? Right now, we have six openings. Um, the majority of the openings are in District 1, which is the northern district, which runs from basically Hyde County to the Virginia line. Um, five of the five of the openings are in are in um, District One. One opening being Surf City in the Southern District. Okay, and I know Wildlife has uh, 
I guess you call it a booth at the state fair. Do y'all do anything like that too? My understanding is we will be back to the state fair this year. Okay, great. Thank you. Director. Okay, let's see. I think this is our last thing, and it's going to be uh, Brandy Salmon, who is a licensed and statistics section chief, and she is going to, uh, at your last meeting, she talked about data that we collect and use in our annual FMP reviews, and today she is going to talk to you about the license and statistics annual report that her section produces, and um, with that, I'll turn it over to Brandy. <clears throat> It's almost lunchtime, <laughs> so I'm going to be quick. Um, so my name is Brandy Salmon. Uh, I'm the section chief for the license and statistics section. Um, so our section has four main programs. So one of them is the license program where they sell commercial licenses, um, coastal recreational fishing licenses, uh, vessel registrations, and permits. And then we have our commercial statistics program that includes the uh, trip ticket program, and then the quota monitoring program. And then a third program or, that we have is the recreational statistics program. We call it CAP uh, for Coastal Angling Program, and that includes um, MRIP, so Marine Recreational Information Program, uh, the Central Southern Management Area Creel Survey, uh, the Cruffle Mail Surveys, and the Highly Migratory Species Catch Cards. Um, and then the last program that we have is the Fisheries Economics Program, and they collect um, a lot of socioeconomic surveys and data. So every year, each of these four programs um, collect data, they compile it, um, and then they add it into this massive document um, that comes out every year, and it's called our Annual Statistics Report, aka the big book, um, for a reason. It's huge. Um, it's valuable as gold, but it is heavy as steel. <laughs> Um, so, uh, at the last commission meeting, I gave a presentation on how the division collects data and processes it. Well, every November, you get to see the fruits of our labor, and that's in this big, massive book. Um, so, each commissioner um, should uh, have a copy on their tablets, um, but if you would like paper copies, we're more than happy to get them to you. Um, if you... Uh, uh, look at this book when you open it up, then you can sift through it, and then you can see that there are six chapters in this book. So um, each chapter has a description of the project, and then how the data is collected and analyzed, and it's got figures and tables in there, um, and then uh, contact information for each of the projects if you have any questions about that uh, subject. So um, the you guys should have a copy in your briefing materials, but if anybody wants to request a hard copy, they can. Um, from our staff, or you can visit our website, and we have it updated on our website every year. Um, and you can either print your own version, or you can look at it electronically. Um, so the big book is, is a tremendous resource, um, and it houses large amounts of data. Um, so if you wanted to know what, spe what species was recreationally targeted, like, 10 years ago, or if you wanted to know how many bushels of oysters were landed in 1889, it's all, it's all in this big book. <laughs> um, so odds are pretty good that you'll find the answers that you need if you just run through this. And it's very massive, so if you need any help, we have the staff that you can contact um, in the book as well. So um, we spend a huge amount of time. It takes us months for us to be able to put this big book together every year. Um, but we analyze data in various different ways um, so it can be viewed for you all to use. Um, so please use this as a guide to help you investigate and learn more um, about our license and statistics section, our data, and the fisheries of North Carolina. So enjoy. Questions or comments? Thank you very much. Appreciate all the work you do. Director? Chairman, that's it for, for me. Okay, well, great. Um, running a little bit ahead of schedule, which is a good thing. Um, <clears throat> why don't we go ahead and break for lunch, and instead of coming back at 2, let's come back at 1.30. That'll give us a little extra time than what we're used to, and we'll move on down with the fishery management plans and addressing the uh, Amendment 2 of the Estuary and Striped Bass FMP. So see you all at 1.30.
have everybody's attention. attention. <laughs> what? What? Woo! I hear the dogs all barking somewhere. Jeez. There we go. More better. Laura, when you can, when you can, step up here a second, please. Get in your seats. We're getting ready to start back. I thought we weren't allowed to accept gifts. Please. Okay, we're starting back with our fishery management plan, status of ongoing plans, core and flora. Please come on up.
I think we're good to go now. Uh, so I am Corinne Flora, the Fisheries Management Plan Coordinator for the division. And today I am giving an overview of our fisheries management plans, which are under review. There is a corresponding memo in your briefing materials under fisheries management plans. And this presentation is for informational purposes and staff will get into more detail uh, in the following presentations with the action items. So the species that we are reviewing today um, are Eastern Oyster Hard Clam, uh, Estuarine Striped Bass, Striped Mullet, Spotted Sea Trout, and Blue Crab. As a reminder, the oyster and clam plans have uh, opened in August, and we are uh, in the extremely early stages of the plan process. Um, internally, the division has established the plan development team. This is the group of staff who work together to draft the documents uh, for the plan. And the PDT is identifying and pulling together data from various sources and beginning to assess uh, wild harvest needs prior to bringing this FMP to the public. Um, and that would be um, at, for uh, scoping before we start writing the document. So moving on to striped bass, uh, at your May meeting, the commission selected preferred management for Amendment 2. The DEQ secretary reported changes to the appropriate legislative bodies, and the amendment was brought back to be adopted at the August meeting. At that time, the commission voted to table the discussion, so new commissioners had time to familiarize themselves better with the plan. Today, the commission will have the opportunity to further discuss Amendment 2 and vote on adopting Amendment 2. In the meantime, due to juvenile abundance concerns, uh, staff has been working on an update to the stock assessment for the Abmarle Roanoke stock. The update includes data through 2022, uh, the division and uh, Wildlife Resources Commission staff continue to work together on this update. Um, Kat did um, inform you on that a little bit, the director, sorry. <laughs> um, and um, with this update, um, just to keep in mind, um, adaptive management in the fisheries management plans allows for management changes to address whatever results are indicated during these stock assessment uh, updates. So the striped mullet peer-reviewed stock assessment indicates that the stock is overfished and overfishing is occurring. Based on the stock assessment results, the DEQ secretary has determined it is in the long-term interest of the stock to implement temporary management. This management is meant to address overfishing status of the stock and will remain in place until Amendment 2 is adopted. The Fisheries Reform Act requires management be implemented to address the overfished and overfishing status of the stock. Prior to the division developing management uh, for Amendment 2 to the striped mullet FMP, we held a scoping period from September 26th through October 7th to discuss management strategies with stakeholders. Stakeholder input is imperative at this stage of developing a plan and for each one of our plans, and is the best way for the public to inform a fisheries management plan uh, because it allows us the most time to develop um, management. So a scoping document was developed by staff to guide conversations during the scoping period. The public had online and in-person opportunities to participate, and staff will go over the scoping insights with the commission tomorrow morning, and you will have the opportunity to inform management strategies further. Also, staff will be presenting you with the Amendment 2 draft goal and objectives at that time, and 
you will have the opportunity to approve those goal and objectives and uh, give any more insight into management strategies that the commission would like to be um, included in the FMP. Now moving on to spotted sea trout. The spotted sea trout stock assessment has been completed. Uh, this stock includes fish in North Carolina and Virginia. A peer review panel and the division agree this assessment is the best available science and appropriate to base management on. Today, staff will present you a bit of background on the data which was used in the stock assessment, as well as a review of the stock assessment. The division will be moving forward with development of Amendment 1 to the Fisheries Management Plan for Spotted Sea Trout. And before drafting that amendment, we will hold a public scoping period in early 2023. And I would like to touch base on blue crab. Um, this plan is not currently open. However, uh, Amendment 3 was adopted in 2020 and included adaptive management. The sustainable harvest adaptive management indicated that the stock assessment would be updated at least once between reviews of the plan. This plan, or <laughs> this stock assessment will be updated um, beginning in 2023 and use data through 2022. Uh, at that time, the division will report results back to the commission. Um, adaptive management in Amendment 3 allows for management to be tightened or loosened depending on the status of the stock. Uh, whoops. Um, also, Amendment 3 uh, contained diamondback terrapin management area criteria. Uh, this is um, this includes a list of approved devices uh, for biological reduction devices, um, which are mandatory in crab pots in the diamondback terrapin management areas between March 1 and October 31st annually. In 2020, North Carolina crabbers proposed a innovative design for crab pots with a narrow funnel for the pot entrance to serve as the reduction device. The plan requires devices uh, reduce terrapin interactions similar or better than the current approved devices. Uh, UNCW and the division have been researching this narrow funnel device and um, are now re reviewing that research um, to uh, hopefully approve that device as a um, available device for crabbers in those areas. Um, the division will need to consult with the Shellfish Crustacean Advisory Committee prior to amending that approved uh, biological reduction device, um, and we plan to do that soon. And so I'll wrap up today uh, on the FMP process graphic as I normally do. Um, this puts into perspective where we are with plans. The spotted sea trout and mullet are at the beginning of the process with scoping and the approval of the goal and objectives, while striped bass is at the end waiting on adoption. Um, and soon the others will follow on this process. Um, sorry about that. Lost track of where I was. <laughs> and um, I just wanted to note that the last uh, bulleted line of our, our FMP process is the Division and Marine Fisheries Commission implement management strategies. And this is why I updated on the estuarine striped bass uh, stock assessment update and the blue crab stock assessment update and diamondback terrapin uh, biological reduction devices because part of that implementation is our adaptive management. And so this is something that continues between plans. Um, so I just wanted to 
kind of fill in those blanks on why I bring those things for items that perhaps are not open at this time, but that is the importance of the adaptive management in our plans. And lastly, um, we've been having some people um, discussing how hard it is to find certain things on our website. So I'm going to um, put up a little demonstration video now on how people access, oh, does it not want to play? Oh, there it goes. So um, if you're on our website and you want to find our FMP items, uh, you this is the mobile device since a lot of people access in that way. And you click on the management of fisheries. From there, scroll down again, and it, there you will find fisheries management plans. Um, with that, you have our um, FMP reviews, our state and our interjurisdictional plans. If you click on the state managed, it jumps you down to those. And then you could click on whichever one you're looking for. I put an example here of Eastern Oyster. And that gives you some contact information and all of the documents for fisheries management plans and um, the stock assessments. So I hope that was helpful, because <laughs> I know lately we've been having a lot of people asking questions on where to find those documents on our website. And that concludes me. Questions? All right, thank you very much. Okay, next up is David Berenger and Lucas Pensinger to do our spotted sea trout fishery overview. Yes, sir. <laughs> don't feel bad about jumping up and going. Yeah, somebody hang <laughs> There he is. Oh, it's not my car. It's cool. I go to the bed. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Lucas Pensinger, and I'm one of the co-leads for this Spotted Sea Trial Fisheries Management Plan. Uh, up here with me is David Berenger, and he is the other co-lead for the Fisheries Management Plan. Uh, immediately following us, you'll hear from Yan Lee, who was the lead scientist for the Spotted Sea Trial Stock Assessment. Uh, in a little bit, Yan will come up and talk about that assessment and the results of that model. Uh, but before we get started there, we wanted to uh, start off just by talking a little bit about some of the data sources uh, that we used in the model and that decision-making process as far as uh, which, which of those data sources to include and which not to include. Uh, I do want to mention that there were a lot of folks involved in this process who spent a lot of time working on this assessment um, <clears throat> and considering a wide variety of both DMF and non-DMF data sources. It uh, really was a true collaborative effort, if you will, um, both within our division uh, and across other agencies and states. To start off, it's really important to define the unit stock that we're actually assessing. Uh, this defines what data we can use uh, and make sure that we're covering the entire range of the stock. For spotted sea trout, as Corinne mentioned, that uh, stock is all spotted sea trout in North Carolina and Virginia. Uh, tagging studies have shown that there's a moderate degree of movement between North Carolina and Virginia and some overlap in those fish, um, but really not that much between North Carolina and South Carolina. Uh, the maps that we're looking at here were generated from a, uh, NC, an NC State uh, spotted sea trout tagging study. And if you look at that left panel, uh, you can see that they tag fish all along the North Carolina coast uh, in, as well as some fish in Virginia. On the right panel, we're actually looking at the locations of tag fish that were recaptured. So when those recaps are uh, called in, that's what we're seeing on the right panel. Uh, and you can see that most of those tag fish were recaptured right here in North Carolina, uh, along with plenty of fish that were recaptured in Virginia. But really, uh, you know, there are a couple fish down there in South Carolina, but really not much to speak of. <clears throat> this tagging study took place from late 2008 through late 2012. 
Uh, and is actually the reason that the, the division added spotted sea trout to our tagging program in 2014. And that's what we're going to look at next. So these maps are actually generated from the division's uh, spotted sea trout tagging efforts from 2014 through 2012. On the left in yellow, uh, we're looking at the tagging locations, so the locations where those fish were tagged. And then reported recaptures of those tagged fish are on the right in red. Uh, division staff and volunteers tagged 9,406 spotted sea trout over the time frame of this stock assessment. Uh, and I'd actually like to take a moment here to shout out our uh, multi-species tagging program. Without the volunteers that were trained through that program, uh, our tagging efforts really wouldn't be nearly as prolific as they are. Um, <clears throat> in addition, I'd also like to thank everybody that called in tag recaptures. Without those folks, uh, we put a, a good amount of jewelry in fish, uh, but we don't actually get any data back if nobody calls in the recaptures. Uh, these data really highlight the importance of the tagging studies and help ensure that our stock assessments uh, produce as, uh, uh, that the stock assessments we produce are as accurate as they possibly can be. Um, <clears throat> one big difference between the division's tagging efforts and the NC State study is that, as you can see on that map on the left uh, with the, the yellow points, we don't actually tag any fish in Virginia waters. Um, but on the, ta on the map on the right, you can see that there are a decent number of fish that are recaptured in uh, Virginia waters. But again, not really much to speak of in South Carolina. <clears throat> uh, we also use the data from these tagging studies for more than just the, you know, big part was helping to determine the unit stock. But we did use them for more than that. Uh, I'm going to let David get into the details of that. But I will just mention here uh, that these data has helped confirm that our model picked up winter cold stuns. Uh, or picked up the increased mortality from winter cold stuns and then helped inform the size selectivity of uh, recreational and commercial discards. Uh, in addition to tagging data, uh, there are some recent genetic studies that support a, um, you know, one unit stock for North Carolina and Virginia. <clears throat> in my next slide, I'm going to characterize the breakdown of the spotted sea trout fishery. And we'll start by looking at landings and discards. Uh, of that combined North Carolina and Virginia stock. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about some of the other fishery dependent data that went into the assessment. So here we're just looking at a breakdown or at a description of the fishery from the perspective of total removals in number of fish over the entire time series. Total removals are the harvested fish then combined with dead discards. So obviously harvested fish are removed from the population. Uh, there's a percentage of discarded fish that die due to that fishing interaction. Um, and those fish are considered dead discards. <clears throat> These data are from each state's trip ticket program and uh, MRIP, which is the Marine Recreational Information Program. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we're looking at annual removals, which are showing uh, the number of fish combined by sector, so either commercial discards or, or, or commercial or recreational, and then dividing and divided into landings and dead discards. As I mentioned before, it's a combined North Carolina and Virginia stock, so we've combined North Carolina and Virginia removals in this graph. Uh, the model actually splits out removals by season. Uh, here we're looking at annual removals, just because I, I felt it was a little easier to uh, provide an overall snapshot of the fishery. In a little bit, when Yan gets up here to talk, you'll see this data just broken out by the season which again, I'm going to let David uh, talk a little bit more about the justification for those seasons. Uh, both in the graphs here, uh, in both graphs here, the recreational landings are in green, recreational dead discards are in blue, commercial landings are in orange, and commercial dead discards are in black. It's important to note that uh, commercial dead discards are actually only available for North Carolina. And those discards are relatively difficult to see, uh, but if you look at 2015 there, um, you're able to see those. <clears throat> in the top panel, each bar is just total removals of fish shown in number of fish. The bottom bar, or the bottom graph, uh, each bar is then the proportion from each sector uh, compared to the total removals. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry, I lost my place there. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so de those dead discards are important because they represent uh, that discard mortality, which I explained before, just the dead fish that, or the fish that die due to the fishing interaction. 
And then landings are important because they are the main source of uh, removals by the fishery. And that's actually exactly how these numbers are used in the model as uh, removals. So then on the left, uh, on the table beside the graphs, we're just looking at the average percentage of removals by sector across the entire time series. Uh, so on average, just under 90% of removals have come from the recreational landings and discards. So again, that total removals, combining of landings and dead discards while about 10% uh, or just over 10% come from commercial landings and discards. Uh, in the mid to late 2000s, we, we did see an increase in recreational uh, discards. So if we look at that same percentage over the last 10 years, so kind of that mid 2000s timeframe, um, recreational sector accounts for just under 95% of removals and the commercial center uh, sector accounts for just over 5%. Uh, that's driven by that increase in dead discards or recreational dead discards. Um, really, those numbers uh, fluctuate. As you can see here, they fluctuate uh, year to year, but they do hover right around that 90-10 breakdown. Some years, they're a little more. Some years, they're a little less. Uh, in addition to removals, we also collect biological data from each sector, uh, such as length, maturity, and age. And those are collected through fish house sampling and MRIP. Uh, these data help inform selectivity and model, model parameters like growth and uh, the number of female spotted sea trout that are in the population. Ultimately, that's, you know, those were a lot of words, but there are three main points I'd like you to take away from this slide. Uh, one, I just want to reiterate that this breakdown by sector uh, is exactly how removals are used in the model. Uh, and two, this really is a recreational dominated fishery. And then three, in the more recent years, uh, those recreational dead discards have become a larger source of mortality. There are actually some years uh, that, that, uh, that discards are outpacing all other sources uh, or other mortality sources. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn things over to David, and he's going to walk us through some of the uh, more fishery independent sources that we explored. Y'all hear me all right? Awesome. Uh, so my name is David Berenger. I'm the other co-lead for Spotted Sea Trout, uh, and I'm a biologist out of the Manio office. Uh, so today I'll be reviewing the fishery independent data, uh, all the data that we considered uh, for using in the model, and I'll go over both uh, data sources that uh, were included as well as data sources uh, we determined uh, were not informative for this model. Uh, so the first uh, division survey I'd like to review is our independent gillnet survey. Uh, sampling for this project began in the Pamlico Sound in 2001 and was later expanded to the Pamlico, Pongo, and Noose Rivers in 2003. And so here we have two maps on the left is the sampling areas for uh, the rivers, and on the right is the sampling areas for the Pamlico Sound. And the areas that are in the grid patterns with the different colors represent different areas, and so we randomly sample within each of these different areas uh, each month. We sample uh, from mid-February through mid-December, uh, and so it ends up being over 600 samples, uh, 600 samples per year. And these samples consist of gill net uh, comprised of gangs of net of multiple mesh sizes so that we can capture uh, fish, you know, both the, the younger fish as well as the older, larger fish. And this data, um, you know, based on the number of fish, we can come up with an estimate of abundance and I'll get into a little more detail about that in just a minute. Um, but in addition to just counting the number of fish we catch, uh, we also weigh the fish, measure them, and uh, age them using their otoliths. And so this additional information helps inform the model and some of the additional parameters of the model. So here we have the indices. Uh, that were created based on the 
data from the independent gillnet survey. On the left, we have a spring index, which uses data from April through June, and a fall index, which includes data from September through November. Uh, it's a little small, but on the x-axis, we have year, and on the y-axis, we have abundance. Uh, and so these abundance values are the number of fish per sample, uh, but they've been standardized to account for um, factors such as area, water depth, temperature, salinity, and other environmental factors. Uh, and by accounting for these factors and having um, you know, many years of data, we can uh, compare abundance across years. And one thing you'll see here, um, you know, we, it definitely fluctuates from year to year. Uh, you will notice that in 2019, both in the spring and the fall, uh, we did have a large increase in fish uh, for that terminal year in 2019. And you may be wondering why we split the data out into spring and fall uh, versus just one annual index, like you may have seen in uh, past stock assessments or stock assessments for other species. Uh, and so we broke it out to basically to be able to assess different uh, biological factors um, that are specific to spotted sea trout. So by looking at just the spring data alone, uh, we can kind of capture uh, the influence of cold stuns and the uh, potential increase in winter mortality. Uh, and then by looking at the data from uh, the fall, from September through November, uh, you know, we can look at overall abundance as well as um, the, once you get to September, October, uh, the fish that were spawned the previous year are now large enough to be caught by the gear we use for this survey. Uh, so in this way, uh, we get a sense of recruitment from the previous year. Uh, I'll now go over a number of other surveys uh, that both the division has and um, outside of the division uh, that were ultimately not used for abundance indices. Uh, the first one is our juvenile trawl survey, which occurs statewide in uh, nursery habitats in May and June. Uh, this data uh, we tried to incorporate as a recruitment index and also uh, as an environmental parameter. Um, but for a number of reasons, uh, it just it didn't really fit with the model. Um, the fish we catch in this juvenile survey are much smaller than the smallest size class of the model. Um, and so it just doesn't fit well with the style of the model and the other data. And then also, um, yeah, so, that, so that's the main reason, and then also, um, when we did incorporate the juvenile index into the model, it didn't change the outcome of the results of the assessment. Uh, we also have uh, the Pamlico Sound Trawl Survey, which uh, is a trawl survey that occurs in more open waters of Pamlico Sound, as well as the Pamlico and Noose River. Uh, we have a juvenile red drum seine survey that occurs statewide uh, in the fall months. And we have a striped bass gillnet survey that occurs in the Albemarle Sound in the winter and spring. And these three surveys catch very few spotted sea trout, and for that reason, uh, the data was not used in this model. Uh, in addition to the uh, gillnet survey in the Pamlico Sound, as well as the Pamlico, Pongo, and Noose Rivers, we do uh, gillnet survey in other regions of the state. Um, we sample in the Cape Fear and New Rivers. Uh, this sampling for this area started in 2009. Uh, there's also some differences in the soak times we use uh, for this region. And there's also some genetic evidence that the New River is a mixing zone um, of the North Carolina-Virginia stock and then the stock of, um, to the south of us, the um, fish from South Carolina. And then for, um, we also do a gillnet survey in uh, the areas around Moorhead City, uh, but this sampling only started in 2018, so it's just not a long enough time series uh, to really inform the model. Uh, 
There's a trawl survey, survey that occurs in the Chesapeake Bay, as well as a nearshore survey that occurs from New England through Cape Hatteras, uh, as well as a second trawl survey that occurs uh, from Cape Hatteras through Florida. These surveys also don't catch very many spotted sea trout, uh, so they were not included in the model. Um, like Lucas mentioned, we do collect age data and maturity data uh, from both our independent surveys as well as uh, dependent sources, so both the commercial and recreational fisheries. And this data helps inform model parameters such as uh, growth and uh, reproduction. We also spent a lot of time trying to incorporate um, estimates of natural mortality from tagging data. Uh, however, when this data was incorporated directly into the model, the model would not converge. And just overall, the, the estimates of natural mortality uh, were unreasonably high. Uh, however, we did use uh, the tagging data to help set the ratio of natural mortality between winter and non-winter seasons. Um, and we also used tagging data to inform the selectivity um, of discards in both the commercial and recreational fisheries. Um, we also uh, spent a good amount of time looking at temperature data from our temperature loggers we have throughout the state um, to see if there's a way we could incorporate that to, um, to kind of, I guess, address the, the cold stuns and the variable uh, mortality across seasons. Uh, we ended up not using this data, but it did um, help inform some of our discussions. And so lastly, I would just like to kind of talk about why we chose the model uh, we used. This stock assessment used a different model than the last assessment, uh, and there's a few reasons for this. Uh, in the last assessment, uh, a single rate for natural mortality was applied to all years and across all seasons. And so the previous model, the way it's structured, is unable to account for variable uh, mortality. So if there's a year um, you know, with a big cold stun, that couldn't be accounted for in the previous model. Uh, the new model is able to incorporate this variability across seasons and years. Um, this is a size structured model, and there's some benefits to using a size structured model versus an age structured model. Uh, we manage based on length of fish and not the age of fish. Um, using lengths rather than ages removes any potential bias for age length conversion errors, uh, and it's easier to obtain uh, lengths from you know, a greater number of fish compared to needing uh, to age the fish with the otoliths. Uh, this model, which Yan will describe in detail, um, allows for non-stationary biological processes to be incorporated. Uh, so things like growth and mortality uh, can change from year to year. Uh, there's also, this model also uses a seasonal time step so we have a winter season and a non-winter season. And uh, we really wanted to make sure we captured this chain or this, the difference between seasons, uh, because in the last assessment, it was noted by both the peer reviewers, uh, the public, and staff that um, you know, being able to account for cold stuns and warning mortality would uh, result in a more accurate, uh, biologically sound model. And so for those reasons, uh, we went with this new model, um, which Jan will go into detail. Um, but that's it for our presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Questions or comments? Commissioner Roller. I guess my mic was on. Sorry about that. Um, would you mind going back to the annual removal by fleet graph? I just have a couple questions. There we go. Um, quick, so that this is North Carolina data, correct? North Carolina and Virginia. So you added Virginia. So okay, 
that was what I was getting at. I think that would be helpful for us to have those numbers. I know this is for assessment purposes, but as far as removal by fish in North Carolina terms, it would be helpful to see that with just North Carolina data, right? So because the component of the Virginia fishery is much different than North Carolina. Um, I would like to see that anyway. Um, and my other question is, I'm, I'm trying to remember when our last cold stuns were, right? So I imagine when we look at recreational discards, some of those big discards years are probably the year following a cold stun, correct? Um, so if we go... Trying to think, like, you know, because you're going to have, we always know after a big cold stun, we're going to have tons of 12 inch fish, we're going to have more discards. Yeah, so, so the last cold stun we had was in 2017. Okay, so. And so. And what was the one before that then? 2014. 2014. Okay, can we go back to that graph then? Yep. So, yeah, so 2018. Yep, so okay, so a lot of discards following it. What do you think is driving the increase in discards? Is it the drop, the increase in the size limit, the drop in the bag limit? Is it effort? What sort of insight can you provide? So as um, Lucas, you can uh, jump in here as well. Um, but if you'll see right around um, 2009, 2010 is when kind of the first year you see that you know, real significant jump in recreational discards. And that was the year, I believe that was the year after uh, we went from 12 to 14 inches. Um, but then from 2010 to 2019, it does fluctuate from year to year. Um, so as far, yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to say, but yeah, if there's cold stuns and you have a lot of um, smaller fish, that, you know, that could impact it. So, but going on to that note, discards are also being driven by a restrictive. I'm not making an argument for a bigger bag limit or, you know, a smaller size limit. I'm just pointing out that with our restrictive regulations, they probably are driving more discards in the recreational sector, is my point. So I, I think there's definitely an increase in effort as well. Um, and that's in, in both sectors, uh, you know, especially in recent years. That's not just a recreational thing, but I think definitely there is an increase in effort that has driven those discards at, as well. Though I think for decision-making purposes, when we're going to be looking at the component of the fleet, we're going to need to see this in North Carolina terms, right? And I understand for assessment purposes, when you have a you know, you know, stock that's two states, why you do this, but I'm going to need to see that with just North Carolina data. Yeah, we can get that to you. Okay. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Who does? Oh, Doug. Commissioner Roller. I actually asked for that earlier today, and there it is. <laughs> Last three years, just North Carolina data, because I was like you. I didn't want to see a skewed picture from. Oh, I, I mean, I like this graph a lot, right? Yeah. And I and I have that data as well. I just think when we see it here and when it's presented, it's very helpful to have that sourced out. So. Right. Um, just two or three quick questions. Um, you didn't. I noticed you didn't sample from the Bay River Jones's Bay area. Any? Mm -hmm. Why? So that's just, um, you know, when we were selecting the areas we would sample, um, yeah, I, I wasn't around when, when the exact areas were selected. Um, so I don't know that I have an exact answer if there was a specific reason why that area was left off, um, but I could get back with you. Well, that's one of the hot spots that's always argued about when it comes to uh, fishing for speckled trout if you don't believe it come down to that landing in Vandermeer on a Saturday and uh, they ain't know where to park I mean that's why everybody's fishing that area because there's so many fish so that that alone can start skewing numbers right there uh, yeah. the second question I've got is did you or do y'all ever contract uh, commercial fishermen to actually help with these surveys do you actually get people that know where the fish are at catching the fish and all that to help you with some of these surveys? Yeah. yeah, so I guess to, I guess, answer the first question, um, yeah, so you're saying, you know, that that, that certain area is a hot spot, um, you know, why aren't we sampling there? Um, that's, that's a good point. One thing I will point out is that the abundance values we're presenting, oh, sorry, 
the abundance values we're presenting are um, the relative abundance indices. And so you know, we're, we're comparing across years. So if we are sampling in the same spots or the same regions, that, that value will be comparable across years. So it's not necessarily a total abundance, but it's a relative abundance. And by the stratified random sampling design we have, and we're sampling all those areas, we can compare from year to year. But when it comes to overall abundance for the stock assessment, I know what you're saying, but I mean, every, every hot area should be, I mean, if it's a ton of fish in there, then that's going to affect the survey one way or the other. I mean, I'm not, numbers are numbers. I understand what you're saying mm -hmm. on average, but, you know, my second point when asking commercial fishermen, even if you don't hire them out, you know, these guys know where the trout are at. I mean, you, anybody go in the middle of the river and set a net and fish ain't going to be there. You, you got to have the nets or catch the fish where the fish are at, just like recreational. So, I mean, when it comes to overall overall numbers so far as what we've actually got, I would think you'd want to be in the better spots to catch these fish to have for your data is what I'm getting at. Yeah, and so I guess with the independent surveys, um, you know, when, when the commercial fisherman goes out, or recreational for that matter, you know, they are going to those hot spots trying to catch as many fish as they can. Um, and that's not necessarily our goal, is not to catch as many fish we, as we can in these uh, surveys, but it's to have a consistent sampling design that enables us to, um, you know, compare between years. Um, and then as far as, um, you know, do we contract or consult with commercial fishermen? Um, you know, I know our Manio staff, um, you know, will reach out to fishermen from time to time, and, um, but we are restricted by the protocols of the sampling design. And so we do, we do settle on contours, um, you know, and we'll, we'll, we'll sample in areas, you know, where we think there's going to be fish, but ultimately... We have to put the nets wherever, uh, you know, the random grid that got selected for that, for that week. Okay. Commissioner Reiter. Excuse my ignorance, but so how does, it's a shared stock with Virginia, and so how does that, what is Virginia doing on their side to manage the shared stock, and is there a mechanism to look at at affirmatively setting targets together and dividing those among the states. I mean, I know obviously there's an ASMFC spotted sea trout plan, but it's just in terms of co-managing uh, that particular shared stock, what's the plan? I think um, as far as that goes, uh, you know, for that kind of coordination, uh, I mean, I would I would assume as possible, but I think it would those conversations would need to happen um, at a a uh, way higher level than uh, you know the two of us sitting here. <laughs> um, I would honestly uh, punt to uh, uh, the director for that one. Because uh, I believe those would have to be conversations that she would have uh, with her counterpart in Virginia to set that up. So currently we have not <clears throat> discussed management because we are just in the initial phases of uh, stock assessment. We're just presenting the results. And um, certainly those are de depending on what comes from the uh, um, the FMP. We can have certainly have those discussions. Um, and I do not recall, uh, somebody else, may, Chris may recall, or somebody else may recall um, what, because we used Virginia data, I think, in our last um, stock assessment and amendment as well, and I don't recall them implementing any management based on um, our uh, FMP, and they may not this time, but certainly um, there are discussions that we can, we can have with, with them if the time, when the time presents itself. Any other questions, uh, Commissioner Blanton? Um, so, what what percentage of the landings are in Virginia, and what percent are in North Carolina? Just let's it's, figure that out first. And that, but, and then our additional question is, 
was this a stock managed once by Atlantic States Marine Fish Commission and they dropped this species or in mind? Because um, I'm the, just trying to find a little history here on where we got um, to independently managing the stock ourselves. And I, I feel like at one point in time this was looked at by Atlantic States. So could we get a little bit of that information? They, they defer to the states um, as far as that management goes. And a lot of that is uh, that it's just not really a coastal stock. Um, but it, it does still fall under that uh, umbrella of, of ASMFC managed species. Um, but they defer to the states for those individual management. Um, and as far as the breakdown between North Carolina and Virginia is, is roughly 70, 30. Uh, and again, a lot like the landings that varies a little bit year to year, but overall it's about 70, 30. Okay. Anyone else? Um, commissioner Gardner. Uh, need to speak in your microphone, please. Is there a way to look at stock movement within the state through the course of a season? I, I fish for speckled trout in two very different parts of the state, and the fishery is completely different between what I see up in the Albemarle Sound area near Oregon Inlet, and then down towards the Cape Lookout area, and then even up further into the news, it seems like there are dense populations at very different times of the year. And is that something that is taken into account? And is is it important to know about? It's I see that and notice that, and my fellow guides see that. And it, it's it's almost like it's a different animal at times. Okay. Fair enough. Um, I do know the tagging studies have have shown exactly what you're seeing. There is a seasonal, move, seasonal movement, uh, so they do uh, generally tend to move uh, north in the summer and uh, south in the winter. And I do think that's where, where uh, some of the crossover between North Carolina and Virginia tends to happen is during those seasonal movements. Um, in general, though, uh, you know, outside of those seasonal movements, they're considered to have pretty high uh, site fidelity. So you probably would see them in, you know, depending on environmental conditions, obviously, but in, in those same spots at the same time of year is probably pretty consistent. Um, I mean, I would, our, our uh, independent gillnet sampling uh, does have a pretty, uh, um, you know, wide, wide uh, scale throughout the year. Uh, so we should see those abundance shifts uh, throughout that. And I think as far as how that would um, uh, influence things going forward, um, you know, that uh, kind of falls, uh, in my mind at least, in the, in the uh, scoping conversation of, you know, what are the, what are the concerns uh, of the public as far as management and things go. But I do think our, um, you know, I can let David uh, speak more. He's a little more familiar with the surveys. But I do think they um, should catch those seasonal shifts in abundance. Yeah, so just to follow up with that, um, the surveys do, um, yeah, if we look at the maps, they do cover, you know, a wide portion of the Pamlico Sound and the tributaries. Um, and so, like you said, there's certain times of year where, um, you know, they may be up in the rivers more than in the lower sound, but we're sampling all these areas at all times of the year. So, um, you know, our catches may go down in one area, but then they're going to go up in another. Uh, and so that, that concern you have about, you know, the fish moving and are we capturing that, uh, you know, by sampling all those areas at all times, we can capture that. Anybody else? Uh, Laura? I just wanted to clarify for um, Commissioner Rader's comment about are we managing with Virginia. Um, they, uh, Virginia staff are on the plan development team, so they are part of our um, plan development process um, and will remain so. So we are in contact and actively working with them in terms of larger management decisions. That's something that will come later. Thanks, Laura. That's great. I was just trying to imagine in my mind how if you have a biological model that suggests a, a stock status and then an, um, an attack or ACL or something else, and 30 percent you know, for argument purposes is being caught in Virginia, then how do you integrate that 
uh, mortality into your overall management planning. That's what I was trying to imagine. Okay. Anybody else? Commissioner McNeil. Uh, can you get back to that other slide, the, the graph, real quick? I'm trying to understand that. I'm having trouble really seeing it from here. Uh, the removal slide? Yeah, that one. Um, so commercial landings, 60, 66%. I mean, uh, recreational landings and then recreational discards, 23. And then, so you've got zero percent for commercial discards. So you're saying that, I mean, they're, they're keeping all of them. They're not discarding any. It's, yeah, the discards from the commercial sector are, you know, from what we've seen, relatively minimal. Okay. Yeah, so they're allowed at, um, a 75 fish bag limit on the trout per day. And uh, most of the times they are catching you know, less than 75. Um, and then, you know, the gear they're using, you know, for the most part, they're getting fish that are um, above that 14-inch minimum. So. Zero percent. So it's in all the time, not some of the time, right? So that, that's 0.1% oh, of... Oh, one okay. Of, I can't... Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, 0.1% <laughs> of the total removals. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Mr. Roller, did you have something? Okay, got a few more questions about this. Um, so Maryland isn't included. They don't have much of a measurable catch. I know they don't have much of a commercial fishery, so not much of a recreation. I know they have a recreational fishery, but I assume that would be the same stock. It's just, just don't, not included. Yeah, the Maryland is not included, yes. Okay, yeah. um, I'm getting there. Hold on a second. Um, so you said a good approximation, if we break down North Carolina versus Virginia, 70% North Carolina, 30% Virginia, and their commercial fishery is quite small, correct? It's very, very small. So it's mostly recreational fishery. So again, another reason to see this separated out. Um, when we talk about commercial discards, do we have any post-release mortality studies done? And the reason I ask that is, you know, I do a lot of trout fishing. I catch a lot of trout with net scars, right? And we know a lot of those fish aren't going to survive. They're going to get infections, so on and so forth. Um, what, what sort of inputs do you have on that? So there, there have been studies that look at that. Um, and those are, you know, we, we absolutely looked at those and considered that. Uh, I believe uh, we broke down the, and we did the same thing with the recreational fishery. You know, there are a lot of studies that looked at it. And there are some pretty wide estimates, uh, you know, from... Uh, small percentages to large percentages in, in both of those fisheries. Um, I think the uh, important distinction there is uh, on the commercial discards, like the, the dead discards, uh, the, so the at net mortality that we see in that fishery is accounted for separately from uh, these commercial discards. You know, that's accounted for in the uh, uh, you know, commercial removals, uh, I believe, as far as landings go. Um, so here we're just looking for that, uh, the commercial discard mortality is that, uh, the unknown, uh, fish. So those fish that are released, uh, mm -hmm. alive, but you know, like you said, do they, do they actually survive that? Um, and we have actually separated that out by, uh, you know, there are some studies that have shown at higher salinities, uh, fish tend, uh, these fish tend to, uh, have better survivability after a fishing interaction. Uh, and that's both uh, on the rec or commercial side. Um, so we actually broke that down by, you know, the more out further uh, towards the uh, uh, higher salinity areas and then the lower. In the end, it comes down to uh, roughly 30% is our estimate there. Uh, so 30% of the fish discarded in the uh, commercial fishery, we estimate, uh, don't survive that interaction. Okay. Um, okay, that's good. Um, I guess just... From my experience in career, I, I see 0.1%, and that's kind of a red flag to me, right? I, everything I've seen, there's considerably more discards. Okay. Commissioner Cross? Um, just, Robert, uh, one of the reasons you, you'll see that low number is because they're using a selective mesh site, a mesh size, and they are targeting the larger fish. So basically what they're catching, they're keeping up to 75 fish. That's why the dead discards are so low because 
uh, they're using a, a greater mesh size and they're not catching that smaller fish. So that's one thing that does help. I mean, when you use the selective gear, when you use the right mesh towards the right, towards the right species, I mean, that's what you end up with. So. Okay. Commissioner Roller. Uh, maybe it's not the right time to ask that. I remember we had, you had a, um, I saw it in the, in the present, in, in, I guess in the stock assessment, the length, a, the length distribution between sectors really looked quite similar between commercial and recreational, and obviously recreational, weren't they a little bit catching slightly larger fish in the commercial sector? Yeah, it's a, they, yeah. It's very, it's not like the striped bass where this, the no. commercial sector is catching a lot of the big fish and the recreational is catching a lot of the small fish. It looked very similar, correct? They, they are similar. Uh, the commercial sector does, it did, uh, length distribution is slightly larger, I believe. Okay. Anybody else? Great. Good discussion. Good presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now we're going to bring up Yan Lee to talk about the spotted sea, sea trout stock assessment uh, yes director thank you real quick just to remind the um, Commission that we do have our annual FMP updates and the data that is included in those and those documents that you got in August you can always look back uh, for spotted sea trout or any other species that you're interested in because there is some commercial landings data recreational uh, data included in in those as well Jump the gun and get out of here. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Yan Li. Uh, I'm the Senior Stock Assessment Scientist with the Division, and I'm the Lead Analyst for Spotted Sea Trout Stock Assessment. Uh, here I'm presenting a stock assessment of spotted sea trout in Virginia and North Carolina waters from 1991 to 2019. And please note this assessment has been reviewed um, by external peer reviewers, and the reviewers agree this assessment is the best scientific information available for now, and they recommend using this assessment for management for the next five years. Uh, so just a brief introduction about stock assessment process in the division. In a stock assessment, uh, we input data into a mathematical model and input data for stock assessment can be a variety of data sources, including landings and discards, uh, survey abundance indices, biological data such as length, weight, age. Uh, we can also incorporate tagging information, environmental information, genetic data, um, and even economic data into the models. It's, it's like uh, this model is more like a model system, including a lot of submodels in this system will work together. Uh, so this model, uh, the model is developed based on biology of the species, data availability, and the management interests. Uh, the model draw information from all data sources and uh, estimate uh, important parameters, including spawning stock biomass, short for SSB, and fish mortality, uh, short for F, uh, along with other uh, parameters. SSB is the total weight of fish in the stock that are old enough to spawn. And here in this assessment, SSB for spotted sea trout refers to the total weight of mature females. Uh, it is usually used as a measurement for how much fish resources available out there. Um, the F is the rate of removal of fish from a population by fishing activity. And the stock status will be determined by comparing the model estimated SSB and F with the biological reference points. So for this uh, assessment, the time series from 1991 through 2019. And uh, as mentioned in the earlier presentation by Lucas and David here, uh, for this assessment, we have two seasons. The season one is a non-winter season from March 1st to November 30th. Season two is a winter season from December 1st uh, to the end of February of the following year. The input data for this assessment include fisheries dependent and independent data. And the fisheries dependent data are North Carolina and Virginia 
uh, data combined, including commercial landings and discards, recreational landings and discards, and also biological information, uh, such as length, weight, and, weight and age. Uh, please note the recreational landing and discards data are new calibrated MRIP data, which is three times the values used in last assessment. The fishery independent data for this assessment are all from North Carolina and include the program 915 gillnet survey spring and fall indices. The data, um, and also we have biological data from this survey. Uh, the data present uh, data presentation earlier um, done by Lucas David has covered a lot of details of the data sources. Uh, so here again uh, shows the landing and discard data for uh, by season, um, instead of by the uh, like annual time step as you have seen in Lucas and David's presentation earlier. So here we see the data for season one, non-winter season, from March first to November thirtieth. The orange bars here represent recreational landings, and yellow bars represent recreational discards, and blue bars represent commercial landings, and the gray bars represent commercial discards. Uh, as you all can see, uh, recreational removal is a big component of these fisheries. So this figure shows the landing discards data for season two, winter season, from December 1st to the end of February. And again, uh, orange bars the rec is the recreational landing, yellow bars the recreational discards, blue and gray bars are the commercial landings and discards. So again, here shows um, uh, the, um, the standardized abundance index values from the program 915 spring index uh, during April to June. And here's a figure again, it's for the full index for from program 915 survey. It's still it's from um it's a, from the based on samples from September to November. So for the ref, reference points in this assessment, so in this assessment the stock status is is determined based on the spawning potential ratio SPR based reference points. The threshold is set to be 20% SPR and target is set to be 30% SPR. For fishing mortality F, the threshold is F at 20% SPR and the target is F at 30% SPR. So we calculate the ratio of F at the terminal year relative to the F 20%, which is a reference point, uh, the threshold, and then compare this ratio with the ratio of one to determine stock status. If this ratio is greater than one, then the overfishing is occurring. So for spawning stock biomass SSB, uh, in the sim similar way, the threshold is SSB at 20% SPR and target is SSB at 30% SPR. So we again, we calculate the ratio of SSB at terminal year relative to the SSB at 20%, which is the threshold. And then we compare this ratio with the ratio of one to determine stock status. If this ratio is less than one, then the stock is overfished. In this assessment, uh, to best uh, represent the stack stock status of the terminal year, which is 2019, we use the three-year average from 2017 to 2019, weighted by the inverse of their uncertainty, which is represented by the uh, coefficient uh, of variation value as the terminal year estimates. This method is actually uh, recommended by the peer reviewers. This method is to reduce the impact of the high uncertainty estimates in the terminal year. So here show the stock status in terms of the fishing mortality F. So the y-axis is the ratio of F at a given year relative to the F 20%, the threshold. Uh, the black trend line is the ratio over years, and the dashed line shows uncertainty represented by two units of the standard deviation. The horizontal black line shows the ratio of one, and the terminal year 2019 estimate is sh shown with an open circle at the very end. Um, the ratio is greater than one. So 
So for the terminal year, fishing mortality is estimated as point seven five, and the threshold F twenty percent is estimated as point six. The target F thirty percent is estimated as point thirty eight. The ratio of F um, at terminal year twenty nineteen relative to F twenty percent threshold is estimated as one point three, which is greater than one. So we conclude overfishing is occurring. So here show the stock status in terms of spawning stock biomass SSB. The y-axis is the ratio of SSB for a given year relative to the SSB 20%, uh, which is the threshold. The black trend line shows the ratio over years, and the dashed line shows the uncertainty represented by two units of standard deviation. The horizontal black line shows the ratio of 1. The terminal year 2019 estimate is, is shown with an open circle at the very end of the trend line. Uh, the ratio is greater than 1. So for spawning stock biomass, SSB at the terminal year 2019 is estimated as 2,259 metric tons, which is 4.98 million pounds. The threshold SSB 20% is estimated as 1,143 metric tons, which is 2.52 million, pound, million pounds. The target the SSB 30% is estimated as 1,714 metric tons, which is 3.78 million pounds. The ratio of SSB at uh, 2019 relative to SSB 20% threshold is estimated as 2, which is greater than 1, so the stock is not overfished. So in summary, the 2019 spotted sea trout with North Carolina and Virginia combined is not overfished but overfishing is occurring. The next step moving forward will be development of the fisheries management plan. So with that, I would like to take any questions if you have. Questions, comments. Okay. Very good presentation. Looking Thank forward you all. to your rest of your work. Okay. Um, before we move into um, striped bass, let's take a quick 10-minute break this time. So I would so Laura, 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 where's Paula? Oh, about there. I know, I, I know, she, I saw, oh, there it is right there. So sorry. Did you find it? Okay. I did, sorry. We hit it. No, you didn't. You hit it, you hit it in, you hit it in plain sight. <laughs> is this going to show up anywhere? Is this going to show up anywhere? It should. I mean, in le not until I hit presentation mode, right? Correct. You want me to go ahead and hit presentation mode on the first slide so it'll be up there?
these Okay, everybody, let's be getting our seats. I am not going to miss supper tonight. I hope we will. Okay, we're going to take back up Amendment 2 of the Estuary and Striped Bass FNP draft. Got Nathaniel Hancock, Todd Mathis, Charlton Godwin, and Joe. Francindola, I guess. I call them the Gang of Four. So, Gang of Four, proceed, please. That, that was fancy enough on Joe's Francindola name there. <laughs> I've been challenged it this weekend. <laughs> we just call him Joe. Okay, so thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Charlton Godwin, um, Todd Mathis, Nathaniel Hancock, and Joe behind us, and Steve's up here with us today, too. Um, so we're all kind of co-leads for Amendment 2 to the Striped Bass Fisheries Management Plan. Um, today we are here to continue discussion on Amendment 2 to the Striped Bass FMP. Uh, so to bring everyone in the room and online up to speed, um, at the August business meeting, the Commission uh, tabled further action on the Estuarine Striped Bass FMP until um, this November meeting. Uh, today we are here to present to you again where we are in the timeline and to provide a brief overview to the MFC of its preferred management strategies from Amendment 2 that were voted on at the uh, May meeting. So here's your timeline. Um, as you can see, we are almost at the finish line, um, and I do just want to remind the Commission the Estrine Striped Bass FMP is jointly developed uh, by biological staff from the Wildlife Resources Commission as well with the uh, Division of Marine Fisheries. So at the May 2022 business meeting, the MFC selected its preferred management strategies. Uh, draft Amendment 2 was then forwarded to the Secretary of the Department of Environmental Quality, who notified the appropriate legislative bodies on the progress of the FMP. At the August 2022 business meeting, the MFC voted to table the discussion of adoption of the FMP until this November 2022 meeting, allowing the new commissioners time to get up to speed on the complicated issues surrounding the various striped bass stocks in North Carolina. Uh, today, the commission will have today the commission will have the opportunity to vote on final adoption of Amendment Two. If approved, uh, the Division and Wildlife Resources Commission will implement management measures beginning in 2023. Uh, so, just as a reminder, this FMP is a bit different from other FMPs in that we have different management strategies for the different striped bass stocks, spawning stocks in the different river systems throughout the state. Um, you will remember that Draft Amendment 2 contains three sustainable harvest issue papers. Uh, one issue paper that deals with the potential to use hook and line in the striped bass commercial fishery, and then one information paper about the history of striped bass stocking in North Carolina. Uh, Appendix 2 focuses on the Albemarle or Al uh, Albemarle Roanoke or the AR striped bass stock, while Appendix 3 is focused on the striped bass in the Tar Pamlico and Noose Rivers, and Appendix 4 is focused on the Cape Fear River stock. Um, and Appendix 5 is the issue paper that addresses that uh, hook and line as a commercial gear. So the next slides, we're just going to review the MFC's preferred management strategies uh, chosen at the May business meeting. And don't forget, you have your um, decision document that uh, you can kind of follow along a little easier than the full FMP for the recommended management strategies for each of these options in each issue paper. So I just want to point out on the slide here, and I, th I think it's noticeable enough, um, I've included the preferred management strategy the Commission voted on. Um, that's in black font, uh, but I also included uh, in gray font the other options for, for each issue just to have them up there. 
So the first option we review is uh, contained in Appendix 2, which deals with the AR striped bass stock. Um, so for the very first issue, manage for sustainable harvest through uh, harvest restrictions, uh, the Commission uh, chose to continue to use stock assessments and stock assessment projections to determine the total allowable landings that achieves a sustainable harvest for the AR stock. So for the second um, issue, uh, management of striped bass as a bycatch fishery, the Commission chose to continue that, uh, which basically means striped bass harvest is going to occur while targeting other fin fish species. Um, striped bass cannot be greater than 50% by weight of all other uh, fin fish species landed per trip. Traditionally, that harvest, at least um, uh, traditionally, that harvest in all systems, um, when they were open, occurred during the American shad fishery in the spring, uh, but that has shifted some in the Albemarle Sound as the uh, shad fishery has um, shrunk as well. The, the time shad is allowed, so. All right, so the next issue for the AR stock was accountability measures. Um, the commission voted for option 3D, which is if landings in any fishery exceeds their allocation, then all landings in excess will be deducted from that fishery's total allowable landings in the next calendar year or until the overage is paid back. For option four, um, size limits to expand the age structure of the stock. The commission voted for 4C and 4E um, which is in the Albemarle Sign Management Area to implement an 18 to 25 inch harvest slot for commercial and recreational fisheries. Uh, and then in the Roanoke River Management Area to maintain the current harvest slot limit of 18 to 22 inches with the additional regulation uh, which will make it unlawful to possess fish greater than 22 inches. Um, currently, anglers can now keep one fish greater than uh, 27 inches in the Roanoke River Management Area. So the option five, uh, gear modifications and area closures to reduce discard mortality. Uh, the commission chose preferred management to continue with commercial harvest of striped bass with gill nets and recreational harvest and catch and release fishing in the ASMA and RMA, uh, including on the spawning grounds, uh, and to implement a requirement to use non-offset barbless circle hooks when fishing with live or natural bait in the inland waters of the Roanoke River uh, from May 1st through June the 30th. So that's uh, upstream of the Poway 258 bridge. Um, that's during the catch and release season. And then finally, um, for adaptive management, which we have used for the AR stock for years, um, to use peer-reviewed stock assessments and updates to recalculate the biological reference points and our total allowable landings. Um, stock assessments will be updated at least once between benchmarks. Um, if F, or uh, fishing mortality, exceeds the F target, reduce the towel to the F target. Uh, it, this adaptive management also gives us the ability to change daily possession limits to keep landings below the towel, um, to open and close harvest seasons, uh, to open and close harvest season in areas to, uh, to keep, sorry, to keep landings below the towel, um, and then the ability to require gear modifications and reduce striped bass dead discards. Um, so that does it for the Aramal Sound stock. Um, so moving on to um, Appendix uh, 3, which deals with the sustainable harvest for Tar Pamlico and Noose Rivers. The Commission chose preferred management to continue with the no possession measure in the Tar Pamlico and Noose Rivers uh, to maintain the gillnet closure above the ferry lines uh, and the three foot tie downs below the ferry lines to the current tie down line. Uh, which basically runs east of the mouths of the Tar Pamlico and Noose Rivers from Ruse Point south to Point of Marsh. Uh, the Commission also approved adaptive management, uh, which is uh, the uh, 2020, in, in 2025, review the data through 2024 to determine if uh, populations are self sustaining and if sustainable harvest can be determined. So, this will basically be a discussion on whether to um, open harvest or continue. Uh, with the moratorium based on uh, evaluation of the various independent survey data uh, collected by the division and the Wildlife Resources Commission. Um, these surveys include an electrofishing survey on the spawning grounds conducted by the Wildlife Resources Commission, uh, then the gillnet survey conducted by the division, which is the same gillnet survey that was um, shown in the uh, spotted sea trout assessment, um, and then also a juvenile survey um, uh, looking at uh, young of year fish um, conducted by the division. And I'm trying to, well, I can get my talking points to go down, but. Yeah, no so, anyway, um, moving on to the next one. Or maybe not, moving on to the next one. Uh, 
Oh, there it goes. Sorry. It, yep, you scared it right into uh, scared it into action. All right, good job. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so moving on to the Cape Fear River issue paper. Um, the commission chose option 1A as preferred management to maintain the Cape Fear River no possession measure. Um, I did want to mention that in the most recent WRC's business meeting held October 20th, uh, the uh, Wildlife Commission unanimously voted to approve notice of text for rulemaking for the 2023-2024 inland fisheries rule proposals, uh, which does include a proposal for a permanent rule to open striped bass uh, harvest in the Cape Fear River and its tributaries upstream of Lock and Dam 1 to Buckhorn Dam from March 1st to April 30th, which would include an 18-inch um, minimum size limit and a two-fish daily creel limit. Um, I believe these rules will go to the North Carolina Register December 1st um, for public comment, 30-day public comment period. All right, the commission also chose uh, adaptive management uh, for the Cape Fear River stock, which is continuing the young of year surveys uh, and the genetic parentage-based tagging analysis to inform adaptive management. Uh, management measures may be adjusted to include means and methods, harvest areas, season size, and creel limit. So that would be um, if we decided to, you know, at, at some point to open, open harvest uh, based on uh, these continued surveys. Uh, but that would be evaluated by staff uh, and then present that to the Marine Fisheries Commission uh, FinFish Advisory Committee for consultation before that would happen. All right, the last one, if you remember this issue paper, examines management considerations with implementing the use of hook and line as a commercial gear on, and if it is an appropriate time to allow that gear. Um, the Marine Fisheries Commission selected preferred management option 1A which, uh, and the adaptive management which is to basically to maintain hook and line as a gear option if needed as stock status improves. So the action item before the MFC at the conclusion of this presentation is to vote on final adoption of Amendment 2 to the Estrine Stripe Bass FMP. Um, with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions about the presentation before moving to your action item of selecting preferred management. I'll just point out that our, um, our contact information um, Charles, myself, and Nathaniel are, are up in the Albemarle Sound area. Um, Todd is um, the expert on CSMA, Tarpam News, uh, and Joe is uh, in the Cape Fear area. If you have any um, questions, um, you know, please feel uh, free to reach out to us. Um, and with, with that, before we move on, I think um, Steve has a few comments. All right, maybe that'll work. <clears throat> All right, uh, good afternoon. I'm Steve Poland, Fishery Management Section Chief uh, here at the Division. Um, and I just wanted to take a few minutes of your time before you begin deliberations on adoption of Estuarine Stripe Bass Amendment 2 and discuss our recommendations on actions in the amendment and our thoughts on next steps. So by tabling the action to adopt the amendment at your last meeting, the division took this opportunity to continue internal discussions on the actions and recommendations presented in the amendment, as well as other ancillary topics discussed at previous commission meetings. This is not uncommon for us to do because we strive to constantly review, discuss, and communicate back to you and our stakeholders potential management actions for our fisheries in North Carolina with the best available information we have as we gather it. So after looking back at the amendment, we have a few things we wanted to highlight to help you all in your decision today. <clears throat> First, uh, the division did not support the action by the commission in 2019 to instruct the director to close the Noose and Pamlico rivers upstream of the ferry lines to the use of gill nets. This recommendation was based on available data of uh, gill net discards and observer program. Um, survey and a study conducted by division biologists investigating setbacks from shore to reduce striped bass interactions in the fishery. Uh, the observer data at the time indicated that the incidence of striped bass discards was low under the current gill net management measures and that the distance from shore restrictions were effective at moving the nets out of areas where striped bass were most prevalent. However, it has been in place now for three years, and the division acknowledges that based on the uh, subsequent CSMA estuarine striped bass stocks report, the sustainability of Tarpam and Noose River stocks of striped bass, and this is quoted from the report, is unlikely at any level of fishing mortality. 
The division is committed to managing these stocks for sustainability, if possible, and providing the commission with the information needed to do so. Under current management, um, the primary source of discards now for these stocks comes from hook and line gear. Because of this, we'll be taking a closer look at hook and line release mortality and how to minimize it in this system, particularly in the summer months. Actions have already been taken in other systems to address these issues, and you'll be considering more action today for the Roanoke River management area relative to uh, hook and line discards. Uh, there was also uh, some discussion at previous meetings about the need of a study to investigate the effects of the gill net closure on fish stocks. After consulting with the striped bass leads and other fishery science staff that conduct our numerous and varied fishery sampling programs in these systems um, and statewide, the division feels that the appropriate level of data to address many of the questions the commission may have are already collected by ongoing studies. Because of this, at this time, we do not see the need in having a uh, site-specific or stock-specific specific study for these areas and resources can be more effectively focused on the continued collection of data for these systems um, and statewide. However, if the MFC um, has a specific research question that cannot be addressed um, with the current sampling program, we are open to the possibility of undertaking a study if resources allow us to. Um, and I also wanted to note with that, um, as Charlton mentioned, um, in the preferred management um, for Appendix uh, 3, um, if the plan is approved with that preferred management option, the division and WRC staff will undertake a review of all available data um, through 2024. Um, but just depending on the type of study, um, if there's a study um, in addition to ongoing um, uh, sampling programs, um, any study that may be added uh, may not have um, an appropriate amount of time to evaluate at that time. Uh, lastly, there's been some discussion about the future of this amendment and the possibility of not approving it completely. The division would like to reiterate our support for the actions in Amendment 2 that we recommended for management and would encourage the commission to not discard the amendment for the sake of not supporting one action. It is true that management is currently in place for this species across its discrete management areas. However, actions and recommendations developed by the joint DMF and WRC plan development team and recommended by the division would have a positive impact on the conservation and management of this species. So with that, Chairman Bizzle, myself, and staff uh, would be happy to address any questions y'all may have. Questions by the commission. Commissioner Roller. First of all, thank you all for giving this presentation for what feels like the 950th time that I've seen this. You're very well, you know good at you, it. You know what you can do to prevent us coming back up here again in February, right? <laughs> working on it, Charlton, working okay. on it. Uh, I bet you could do it blindfolded. Um, so the question I have is in regard to the WRC decision to allow harvest in the Cape Fear. Could you provide more insight on what that means for our joint plan or whatever? I'm very confused as to why this is going on or why they chose to do that. Uh, well, um, I'm not sure I have the exact answer of, of why they chose to do that. I, I know in, in PDT discussions, um, you know, they, they felt like that uh, the, the stocking had um, gone on long enough or the no harvest provision in the Cape Fear had, had gone on long enough. And if things would have turned around, they, they probably would have by now. So uh, some of their anglers had showed an interest in harvesting those fish. So they uh, moved to that decision. Um, our reasoning for not allowing harvest was that, um, I mean, yet to continue the no harvest provision for a few more years, um, we've just, uh, in the Cape Fear River, they just uh, have finished redoing the, that rock ladder arch pathway again uh, with improvements to, to increase um, striped bass, hopefully increase striped bass uh, passage uh, over Lock and Dam 1. Um, <clears throat> there are several researchers looking at um, passage over Lock and Dam 2 and 3 by working um, with the Army Corps of Engineers to increase flow uh, during the spring and basically overtop the Lock and Dam 2 and 3. 
Um, uh, Joe is working with some folks um, from Auburn University, I believe, uh, with some Vimco tags, looking at um, how those fish can get up and if they can get all the way back up to their historic spawning grounds. Um, in addition, um, they have seen uh, some uh, wild reproduction in the Cape Fear River. Looks like it may be in the northeast Cape Fear River. Um, but at any rate, we just decided that we, um, we have not had a lot of interest from anglers um, expressing an interest to open harvest. Um, and with these most recent developments, uh, you know, we just felt like we wanted to give it a few more years in the Cape Fear. Now, how, how that plays out with back and forth in our plan and stuff, I think that's a, either a WRC question or a lawyer question, but not for me. Fair enough. Um, you know where I'm going to take this. I've actually received several phone calls on this from fishing guides and recreational anglers in the area, and it didn't go regarding along the lines of, I'm biologically concerned about this fishery. It went, this is one of the most contaminated water bodies in the state of North Carolina, and striped bass are not something you should be eating from the Cape Fear River. There's a lot of subsistence fishing in that area, and I'm really bothered by the fact that we're going to opening up a fishery, well, not us, opening up a fishery with PFAS-contaminated striped bass. And, you know, I'm a cancer survivor, and I wouldn't wish that what I went through on anybody, and I am really bothered by that from a human health standpoint. And I know that's not part of a discussion. I know that's not out of our purview, but I think it's something that we need to put on the record. So, well, yeah, we, we certainly, you're right. Um, that's not really in our wheelhouse, the contaminations. That's with the Department of Health and Human Services, but obviously we have to understand the implications of our actions. Uh, so we certainly did discuss that at the PDT. Again, um, Joe and Chris uh, down there uh, with the division in the Cape Fear are collecting additional samples um, to provide to DHSS to uh, get some uh, better information on a wider range of the fish species and, and what kind of contaminants they do have in their system. Um, so that it was certainly a, a concern that we had um, as we were uh, discussing whether to open open harvest or not, and yeah, and with, with their sampling in in WRC waters, the inland waters above Lock and Dam One as well. So, and I don't know if anybody's got anything else to add. They can. Okay. All right. Other questions from of staff at this point. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Don't go anywhere because we may be needing you. So sit tight. Okay, we need to address Amendment 2, and the chair would entertain any sort of motion towards this. Is there a motion about Amendment 2? I was just going to say, Mr. Chair, if there's if there's some way that um, yes. you want me to go back through the individual slides that have the options in the appendices, I'd be glad to. This slide has them kind of all lumped into one, but um, if any way to help facilitate a discussion about the options, I'd be glad to scroll back through the slide. If you it, it, would, it wouldn't hurt, but leave off uh, the Cape Fear because we know where we stand with that. Um, let, let's let me go back through this first, then then I'll open it up. Just real briefly. And I just want to say the last page of your decision document has all of the um, actions all on one page. So putting a plug for our wonderful decision documents out there. Okay. I've got your decision document where you can refer to the specifics. Chair is still looking for some motion. Commissioner Roller. Well, I mean, I'm not sure I'm ready to make a motion because whoever makes the motion will probably just get substituted. So well, it's like the okay corral in here. <laughs> I'm, I'm not Marshall Dillon. Who am I? I'm, I'm a, one of the ERP boys, I guess. Uh, yes, go ahead. So I'm, inter I'm, uh, I'm interested in the question, in the answer that you gave about the questions related that have been uh, surfaced as this discussion has gone on, and particularly the way I look at it, at least as a scientist, as to whether or not the 
Gilnet prohibition in the new Centaur Pamlico enhances the likelihood of spawning stock biomass uh, creation in either or both of those. First question. Second question, whether or not the uh, increased survival or presence of large fish there, mostly of Roanoke origin, the way I understand it, 80 percent or so from the tag returns, uh, are the, um, whether that actively contributes to Roanoke albemarle spawning stock biomass enhancement. And then third, the degree to which um, a more general mortality avoidance in the gillnet closure area contributes to other estuarine species spawning stock biomass enhancement. My view, view, those are the three key questions on the table. The fourth one that Anna keeps revi reminding me of is whether or not the non-fishing threats and opportunities that have to be faced in fully rehabilitating, restoring, and maintaining the, uh, any or all of these stocks in the future um, have been adequately addressed in the plan or could be re-engaged through the Habitat and Water Quality Standing C Committee and other mechanisms. So there are, are those are the questions in my mind, and you're uh, saying that those you believe could be answered in a relatively short period of time. Is that true or not? So I'll start since that was four questions in one. <laughs> um, so, you know, as far as my comments relative to a study, um, you know, the idea of a study came up, I think, two meetings ago. Um, and there was never really a question articulated as far as what is the research, you know, question there. Um, we feel with our current sampling programs, if it's a question of how has abundance changed in the system, um, be it for striped bass or any of the finfish that occur in these systems, we have that data already because, uh, you know, with the um, ferry line closure, uh, we didn't stop any of our sampling programs. So we have, you know, pre and post closure um, data on um, the abundance and distribution of fish in these areas. Um, if it's a question of um, how, uh, you know, the gillnet fishery may interact, we you know with the fish in this area now, um, or what you know discards you know look like. We really don't have a way to do that now since there is no fishery there, you know, um, you know um, targeting those fish. Um, as far as um, what we've seen so far with how abundances um, and the size of uh, striped bass and other fish have changed in those systems, I'll turn it over to Charlton to address that because um, I know we have. Uh, you know, looked at that already, um, and I think he's got some interesting input on that. So, so thank you. Um, so, yes, as far as the data that we have so far um, in the CSMA, and again, just to get back to uh, options that are in the FMP, you know, we had a lot of discussion about this at the PDT level, um, which, of course, PDT includes staff with the Wildlife Resources Commission. So, you know, that's why we have in there an adaptive management um, in 2025, you know, uh, before not waiting the whole another five years once this plan gets approved to look at it. But in 2025, that would have been going on. Um, going that closure was in 2019. We'll have five years of data. Um, between the wildlife resources, uh, electrofishing um, survey on the spawning grounds and our gillnet survey and our young of year survey, uh, within, within those five years, we should certainly see if um, the mortality was due to um, harvest and um, gillnet discards when the harvest season closed, we should see an increase in the size structure. Um, to date, um, we have not seen um, an increase in abundance in the, in the gillnet survey in the Tarpam Noose area or an uh, expansion of the age structure. Again, as our director mentioned earlier, every year, um, for every uh, FMP that we have, for every species, state managed and um, federal, we update all of our indices, all of our surveys, all of our landings data, um, length, frequency, age composition. We update that every year. So we have that um, updated through 2021. So far, we've not seen an increase. I think actually um, in 2021, the, the gillnet um, abundance in the tar pam noose was the, the lowest it's actually been in the time series. But So I think we have the... Uh, information available uh, to assess um, in 2025 um, 
you know, whether this closure has ind indeed increased uh, striped bass abundance. Um, and then at that point in time, the decision would just be made to, you know, whether we continue with the harvest moratorium, possibly uh, shift gears with looking at different brood stock. You know, maybe it has something to do with the eggs, flow, habitat issues, uh, compatibility of eggs with the flow in there. Um, um, so I, I think we do have those um, tools in place already to to study the effects for striped bass, um, you know, of this of the closure and the ban. Um, I think your other question was AR uh, stock exchange between um, the AR system and the tarpam noose. Um, so yes, we we um, Todd and the uh, folks in the Washington office put uh, Vimco tags um, in fifty striped bass, 25 in each of the Tarpam new system, um, and we were focusing on ages that were in that 2014, 2015 year class, which is um, uh, part of the reason that we put the uh, closure in in the first place was, you know, we saw a bunch of fish in those areas starting in about 2017, a lot of undersized fish. The thought might be that they had some um, natural recruitment. Um, Based on the results so far from the Vimco uh, tagging, maybe 75, 80% of those fish that were identified as, and of course, we still have the genetics on them. So some of them were uh, hatchery fish that we tagged. Some of them were non-hatchery fish. Those non-hatchery fish, um, the majority of those ended up making spawning runs up the Aramal Roanoke. Um, the Pamlico Science System, you know, has always been a mixing zone, it seems like, between the AR fish, but also, um, you know, coastal migratory uh, fish. Um, they tagged some large 35, 40 inch striped bass in the Pamlico Sound in 2013 or 14. Uh, some of those fish showed up in New York on arrays up there. So, you know, there's a lot of mixing going on in there and those fish don't have a tag on them saying, hey, I was spawned here, I'm, I'm here. So it, it is, um, it's an interesting system there. Uh, has fish from, from several different places. Um, if that answered your first two, I do not remember your third one. But I kind of do remember the fourth one. Well, in answer most of the first two, the part that, I, to me, in my mind at least, is still hanging is whether or not uh, either one of the central and southern management area systems are likely to be able to sustain self-producing populations or not. I mean, I understood from people I've talked to, and it's, actually, I guess I should say in the beginning, I've been the grateful recipient of an outpouring of information from all sectors. <laughs> but I haven't heard anybody assert that, that that's likely in either the Tar Pamlico or the news. And I'm just trying to get a feeling for whether or not that, you know, we're kidding ourselves about what would be required with the uh, dam uh, altered flows and the uh, habitat changes and the water quality problems we all know very well in both of those systems and it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I mean, is this a, a pie in the sky thing or is this a, a priority that we ought to set our cap to and, and, and find a way to do it? So yes, that's a, I mean, that's a, that's a big question and it is, is the, I guess the, you know, one of the most important questions. I just don't think we really have an answer um, for that right now. I mean, um, we have seen a couple of wild um, fish uh, last year, I believe, um, they captured a couple of young of year fish that were non-hatchery fish uh, in the Tar River. Haven't seen any in the noose yet. Um, you know, they have, we have removed uh, Buckhorn Dam and another dam in the noose. Um, I say we, they were removed, um, you know, several uh, years ago, which did um, increase some access to uh, traditional spawning grounds. But, you know, there certainly are flow issues in there. Those systems probably never had the striped bass population abundance that was in the uh, Elmore Roanoke uh, in any way. Um, but, you know, um, we certainly have tried to tie our uh, coastal habitat protection plan with our FMPs, you know, our, our specific state species FMPs are not really the place that we do the habitat stuff. That's where we tie it to the chip and all of the other collaborative processes that you know, you're know you probably more aware of than I am going on with habitat stuff, but that's where we tie that in and, and try to get to some of those questions about will the habitat um, support this one species or not. We, we certainly are um, also planning on, I think the biggest thing, it's not really a habitat thing necessarily, but maybe a, a flow. We are certainly getting ready to start talking to um, a group of experts for stocking stuff and genetics about looking at a different 
uh, brood stock of fish for those systems. Maybe it, maybe that's something traditionally those brood stock have come from the AR um, or the eggs perfectly suited for the, the lower flow systems, uh, the lower flow in those systems. We're not sure. So we may look at different um, brood stock that have lighter eggs that may increase um, Ha, um, you know, juvenile production, but I just really don't think we have the information to say yes or no, it, it's possible or it's not possible, or it's possible if we do A, B, and C. I mean, I think we know, you know, again, from the chip, we know that those systems are nutrient-rich systems. We know all the issues with, you know, the, the summertime low uh, dissolved oxygen levels and harmful algal blooms. Um, so I just don't think, though, that we can put our finger on one thing and say, or, or actually really probably could put our finger on it, but don't have the ability to, to fix those things we may like to. Great. Well, I would um, suggest, and I think Anna would agree with me as co-chair, that the Habitat and Water Quality Standing Advisory Committee would love to get that charge directly. And if, if you don't give it to us, if we don't give it to us, then I suspect we'll resurrect it ourselves in January at our upcoming meeting where we're trying to look at the priorities for the coming year to try to lay out those kinds of relationships. The third question, just to f finish, had to do with the degree to which we have the information to characterize the degree to which um, mortality avoidance in the gillnet prohibited zone is, is amplifying or enhancing spawning site biomass for other estuarine species. That is, if we have the data to quantify, model, estimate that, and if not, what more would we have over two years, two more years, or five more years, or seven more years, or, or ever? So for, for our other species, you know, um, so you're asking to, to, to evaluate the effectiveness of the gillnet ban on our other species? Well, that's what but, the public brought to us as comments. Yeah. You know, and so if, if, it's, if it's a striped bass-centric management structure, then we should evaluate it with that in mind. But, and if it's multifactorial, we need to understand the degree to which it's working, right? Well, for, so for spotted sea, you know, for striped bass, let me start with them, they, they kind of hang out um, in, that, in those river systems. You know, um, there is some uh, exchange between the um, tarpam and the noose. Um, of course, there's some exchange between the tarpam, noose, and AR. The, the Cape Fear River fish tend to stay down there. But in general, you know, those striped bass stay in those river systems. They tend to stay in the middle to upper part of the system, really. They're not out in the middle of the Pamlico Sound. Um, species like uh, speckled trout, red drum, um, any other estuarine-dependent species, um, you know, they, they're just kind of hanging out in there along with everywhere else. You know, it's a very small relative to spotted sea trout. It's a pretty small area. Um, when you look at the relative spotted sea tripe population across the whole state. And, of course, they go out and spawn in the sound, and they're all mixed together. They don't run up each individual river and spawn. Same thing with red drum. Um, you know, we've had a very unusual year uh, for salinity-wise. Um, so there have been a lot of big red drum up in those rivers that anglers may not normally catch in the fall time of the year. They'd be a little further out in the sound. So is it going to help those? You know, I think those other species just use that part of those systems at a smaller amount, and there's just so many more of them throughout the rest of the state. I don't really think that we would, I mean, our gillnet survey certainly covers that entire river area, you know, but I don't think if we, if we saw a increase, for example, this year we've seen a ton of bluefish in the gillnet survey that we hardly ever see up, up that high. I don't really think that we can say, well, because of the gillnet ban, We've seen all this increase in bluefish. Bluefish stock abundance is going to increase. You know, so I think it's probably going to be the same for our estuarine dependent species too. I hope that answers your question. It does. What it fear what it means to me is we won't know in twenty twenty five under the current amendment really whether or not that measure has worked. And I just am worried about as a scientist mm -hmm. about putting a boat, yay or nay. To, do, to be honest about it, on you know whether or not to do this, because e either way, to me, is uncoupled from the goal of the plan and plans, and the likelihood that it's going to work. So I'm, I don't, I'm sorry to dominate. I didn't mean to do that, but I'm just, I'm just as a scientist, that's what that's what worries me. Yeah, and, and I'll expand just briefly on you know Charlton's response. I mean, it would be very easy for us to just compare the abundance upstream and downstream in those systems, um, you know, of key 
fish from our you know independent gillnet survey and maybe even our, our, our trawl survey. I think the difficult part is going to be teasing out um, if there is a difference. You know what what was that causal factor? I mean, um, obviously, if you remove a gear from an area, um, re if you remove a source of removals, you know, you would expect that, you know, removals, you know, would be less in that area. So it might look like, you know, higher densities, you know, higher abundance because the other source of removals, um, you know, they're getting all the fish as opposed to, you know, having, you know, to share those fish. Um, to Charlton's point about, um, you know, the, the spatial extent of, of this closure. I mean, for striped bass, um, you know, it seems like there is a lot of resident striped bass in these systems. So, you know, there may be, you know, a, uh, an effect on abundance there with, without that other source of removals there. But for a lot of our other species like red drum and, you know, spotted sea trout, um, the question really is, is that area that's closed, is it large enough to affect um, the abundance or is it recouped very quickly once they move out of those areas? And I can't really say without us looking at the data if those are questions that we can answer at this time. I mean, we can certainly evaluate it, but it might not be, a, you know, a, a, a smoking gun, so to speak. And let me just I add one more second to that, and then I'll let y'all talk some. Um, you know, relative relative to striped bass, I, I think we all on the PDT have this. This is why we put the specifically in the adaptive management that we were going to look at this closure. Um, originally, it was the closure, but of course, the gill, the gillnet band glows along with the closure because this was all for striped bass to protect a couple of year classes. In 2025, uh, we're going to have the data uh, to answer the question: Did the closure? increase age structure, increase abundance enough to start having uh, successful natural recruitment. We're going to be able to answer that question, I think, in, in 2025 for striped bass. So, um, and, and then the, the, we'll move on to, well, you know, uh, open harvest back up again, um, continue. That doesn't mean that we're going to give up on trying to restore striped bass to natural spawning populations. Like I said, we're still looking at um, different brood source. Um, but for striped bass, I think we're all, uh, everybody on the PDT agrees that we will be able to answer those questions uh, in, in 2025 by looking at our data uh, through 2024. Okay, before we go any further, uh, Council and I have been having some what if discussions over here. If we do not have a vote one way or the other on Amendment 2. Amendment 1 with its supplement stays in place until the next cycle. So just want to be totally up front with everybody. Hey, I but says that, that includes a proclamation that's tied. Is that true? You know, as well, if it's not the proclamation, the, the closure proclamation, it also would stay in place. Is that true? Yeah, every, everything would stay in place as is, yes. And Commissioner Roller. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, I've heard some of the previous comments from a lot of different sectors before saying, I don't think we can rebuild this fishery. Let's just make it a put and take fishery. Yeah, I'm not in that camp. You know, I think this is a historic, important fishery and a really important river system that has maintained many anadromous species populations for a long period of time. I'm not willing to give up on it and turn it into a stocked fishery. Um, at least I won't shut up about it. Y'all can. I'm only one person up here, but the traditional spawning area in the noose is below the falls dam, correct? So it's below some of the most recent removals. Is, is that not right? Yeah, so it is It is at, uh, roughly at the falls of the noose. Um, but you're saying it's, it's, what was the last part that you I, said? I, I, don't, I just remember the history, where the striper spawn is below any current dams, correct? Uh, yeah, right, right at it, I guess. I mean, I think, I think the dams and, and the Wildlife Commission may know better, but I think that dam may have covered up some of the fall line. But, it, but it's basically at the fall line. So, yes, sir, it, okay. it's, it's below. But I, I think the flow issue is probably the biggest part. bigger yeah, than not actually accessing their historic spawning grounds. Yeah, and I mean, striped bass, let's be frank, they're not doing well within most of the range on the East Coast in a recent decade. They, you know, a lot of river systems are, are declining up and down. This isn't just unique to North Carolina. This could be a climate issue. It could be a lot of other things. Um, but while I have the mic, could you pull up my favorite slide? The can't catch length distribution. So that is the recreational, 
right? You can see mostly right, 18 to 24 inches. And let's look at the commercial. So this is this is yeah. the recreational for the Elmore Sound um, management area. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, um, majority of them are below 24, 25 inches with just a, a few larger ones. This is the uh, recreational length frequency for the Roanoke River management area, um, which has had, uh, for this time series, has had an 18 to 22 inch slot with only one fish uh, greater than 27 inches allowed. So obviously that has constrained the harvest to mostly 18 to, to 22 inches. What about the commercial? There we go. Yeah, and then so here's the uh, commercial. Again, um, I've kind of added two lines up there to show the 18 to 25 inch slot that we're proposing. Um, so you can see that yes, we, we do see uh, a little bit more harvest of larger fish in the uh, commercial sector. Um, so that was really the, you know, the reason uh, that we wanted to put a, a slot in is to protect all of, same thing with red drum, you know, just protect those fish uh, once they get a little bit bigger. Uh, it's still a, a pretty insignificant uh, amount of on a year-to-year -year basis of, of the portion of harvest is above 25, 26 inches. You can see the bulk of it is down there. And again, that's because of gillnet um, mesh size selectivity. We could, if you change the mesh sizes that you let those guys catch fish with, you can move those two lines to 12 to 16 inches or 30 or wherever you want them to. But, but we also have a lot less of those larger fish in these river systems. And I, it's important to point out because this is what the, uh, the FMP group or whatever you know, really focused on a lot. And this has been brought up at the commission multiple times. I brought it up multiple times. When you look at the harvest in these different sectors, a lot more larger fish are being caught in the gillnet fishery. And I want to point out, this is a bycatch fishery. We're not even allowed to target these fish. This is what, shad and flounder nets, correct? And we're catching a lot more larger fish. So if we're really concerned about protecting these bigger, older fish, well, maybe we should really be looking at those net fisheries that catch a lot of those larger fish. So, you know, that's that's exactly why we would like to uh, put a, a slot limit in. Um, those fish will, a lot of those fish are, it's in the early uh, part of the year. Water temperature is still cold, pretty cool when the shad uh, fishery is occurring. Um, so, yes, some of those fish that are incidentally caught uh, that are larger than, you know, 25 inches are, are going to be released. Uh, there will be some mortality, but they're also, uh, most of them are going to survive at that time of year. So that's kind of the whole purpose of this um 18 to 25 inch slot. Um. Okay. Chair is still waiting for a motion of some sort. Commissioner Roller. Um, I move that we approve the uh, amendment for final approval. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? I'll second that. Second, Commissioner McNeil. Discussion. Commissioner Cross. <laughs> That's why they call me Doc Holliday. Uh, I'd like to approve the FMP without option two in appendix three, which would be the net ban up the rivers. Okay, is there a second to that uh, motion? Is there a second to I'll that? I'll second motion. Second by Commissioner Blanton. Okay. I think I'm correct. This option, approve the FMP without option two in appendix three, which should be the net ban up the rivers. Okay. I got lost in discussion. There we go. The chair, point of order. Uh, hold on one second. Is that the motion as you made it? That is correct if that's the gill net, the appropriate numbers on the gill net. Is, is that, that appropriate numbers, Charles? All right, okay. thank you. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, this is a question for council. Um, if this were to pass, does this have to re do we have to send this back out for public comment since we are changing the preferred options? Yeah. There's a reason I didn't get a microphone. I've been trying to duck this all, or having to talk all meeting long. Like I talked enough during my first five years with y'all, I think a lot of people would agree. Uh, so I think I know what you're referring to. 
there was a letter sent to each of the members suggesting that you didn't have the legal authority. Um, there are many points in that letter that I do not disagree with, uh, but in my view, it fails to take into account the purpose of going out to, to get uh, review and comment both by the public and by the advisory committees as well as the legislature and the secretary, and that is to, con to, um, to determine whether you want to take final action in the form that you went out or if you want to modify that action in some form. It is true that you all have, uh, in going out, decided to um, leave in the uh, and it's not really even an option to leave in the preferred management measure of removing the gill nets above the ferry line. Uh, but that is just a draft preferred management measure. It's not the final one. Uh, so not unlike the whole reason why you send rules out to public comment, if you get public comment back, and in this instance that would include the comments by the, the department and what their recommendations are, which is, which is different than the preferred management measure, then it would seem to me that theoretically you, you absolutely have that ability to, to either proceed with your preferred management measure or not to. Because again, it's a draft preferred management measure, not the final one. Now, uh, would you also be in your, uh, well within your rights and be consistent with the statute to send that particular issue back out again? Sure. Uh, but in my view, you heard both last night and this morning, as well as from the department and throughout this process, you have heard folks saying, leave in the ban, take out the ban. So clearly everyone had noticed that you were considering leaving in the ban, which was put into place, put in place by proclamation. And by saying you're considering as, a, as your preferred management measure to leave the ban in, you're necessarily indicating that there's the potential that that is not what your final plan is going to be. In other words, if you couldn't change your preferred management measures, why go out to public comment? So that, that's the one area I disagree with on that letter. Uh, but it certainly is a strong indication that, that, that your intention is to stick with the ban, but you have received comments both in uh, in favor of it and opposed to it, and as well as uh, comments from the division and their recommendations regarding it. So that, that's where I stand on it. Okay. Any other discussions on this substitute motion? Commissioner Cross. I'm just going to legitimize my motion with some comment that when this started back in 2019, number one, it was then presented at a meeting that was a special call meeting against the desire of the secretary, then Michael Regan, uh, the then director uh, of Marine Fisheries. He was against it. Uh, there was a lot of comment against it, but it, it passed. And here we are, and it passed with the presumption and the rhetoric that it would be a temporary measure that would be looked at two to three years down the road. Well, here we are three years down the road. We're here. And now we've heard comment from Division, again, that they don't support it, that it, in fact, in effect, is not having an effect on the striped bass, that the other species, because of where they're located in relationship to it, basically are not being affected by it either. Now, I sit here last night and listened to a well-oiled, political, coerced machine talk about different things that, you know, it's working. Working for who? It's working for a group, a select group of small fishermen. I love to fish. I love to catch trout. But it's working for that group and the group that they represent and it's working for the people in that area, but it's not working for the consumers of the state who outnumber all of us by millions. We're, we're dropping the bucket. It's also not working for the commercial fishermen in that area that, if nothing else, if they targeted one species, and that was menhaden this year, 
with the way crab bait went through the roof, they could have saved and made a lot of money. Then I hear sacrifice. You know, I look around at all the bait and tackle shops, and there's more and more fishermen showing up on the East Coast, especially in Eastern North Carolina, every day. So there's more business and more stores being put around on that side of the equation all the time. But talk to that guy that didn't have the money to go out and buy a car because he couldn't catch fish up there, even though it may be a small area of fishermen. And then we talk about, is it really working? Well, let's, let's really look at that. That's what really gets me. I mean, when we sit here and we talk about, is it really working, the nets being out of water while there's fish are up there, I guess they think there's enough smoke and mirrors involved in that little bit of webbing being out of the water that created all these fish. Let's look back at 2018. We had a little storm called Florence, I think. And just like Fran, just like Irene, just like every daggone one we ever had, it flushed Noose River down right on out in Pamlico Sound, and it flushed the fish out with it. It flushed the fish, the crabs, everything out with it. So here we are now in 2021 and 22, and we've got one of the highest concentrated salt wedges we've seen in 20 years because of lack of rain that's moved back up that river. And what do you think's moved back up the river last year and this year with it? Oh my God, it's a miracle fish. They've moved with it. It's biological. It has nothing to do with that little bit of webbing that got took out of the river that everybody so thinks is a miracle. It's got nothing to do with it. This is nothing more than a political bouncing ball trying to set a precedent to which build prominence upon. It has nothing to do with the webbing in the river causing problems with the stocks. It has more to do with trying to set a precedent, or if not at least that, create a private little fishing ground for you know a certain segment of fishermen. And I, and I don't have a problem with everybody wanting to catch fish. I, 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 I applaud it, but... Let's look at the real reasons this is going on and not just anecdotal, it's working. I'm seeing, you know, more fish and stuff like that. There's more trout around every river right now, and, I, and I'm going to, we'll get to that when we get to the trout plan, but there's more trout around right now. I mean, you can go in a Walmart catch pond and catch trout. It's a daggone mini trout. So when they start saying they can't catch fish, then again, I, I go back to my original uh, loft theory on that, and I can't say that in a public arena, but. You know, I would think that the commissioners would take into consideration of the division's recommendations or lack thereof when we go to voting on this because we're already three years down the line and those guys are still waiting to go back to work. And if it takes another mechanism, observers of some kind or whatever to make this program work, they need to go back to work. Then if we do go back to work and there's a problem and we do recognize a problem with the women, we take it back out. But we're still causing hardships on families that don't deserve it and don't need it. And that's why I made this motion. Other discussion? Commissioner Roller. You know, we've had data that's been pointed out to us before at the previous meetings that has shown that revenues, commercial revenues, have not decreased in these areas, that they've actually gone up. Now, first of all, Commissioner Cross, I hope you weren't disparaging some of those public commenters by calling them a well-oiled political machine, because I, I saw a lot of people come here and provide really interesting individual comments about their experiences in this waterway. I also have seen at the previous three meetings a lot of professional watermen come here and talk about how important the changes were due to this change in the news in Tar and Pamlico River. They're called fishing guides. They may not sell their catch, but they make their money on the water, right? And, you know, I learned early in my career, it was about 2009, there was this sea turtle lawsuit. And it closed a lot of our areas in the state to gill netting, particularly this area called D1, which is most of Carteret County. And it turned from one of the worst areas to fish in the state into one of the best. It was really remarkable when you took a few nets out of the water how, how greatly it changed and how fast it did. Um, kind of got off on a tangent there. But um, obviously I'm not going to support this. I think that we're ending it too soon. 
But I want to point out, I, I'm, I'm getting really tired of hearing the word net ban used with this. Whether you work for the state, you're a recreational or commercial angler, this isn't a net ban. This is a closure of nets to a part of a river. That's it. And if you really value the use of gill nets in our water, maybe we need a few areas like this. Okay, Commissioner Cross. Number one, I'm not disparaging anybody. In fact, there was one gentleman that I believe spoke last, uh, actually this morning, I believe, that is a true conservationist. I believe his name was Mr. Buddy Garrett, and he made a suggestion that absolutely resonated with me all over. If you're in this for the conservation, if you're in this to save the species and not have issues across any user group, when you shut down an area like this to anything, shut it down to all gear, including hook and line. That man made one hell of a suggestion. If you're going to do it in the guise of conservation or make that argument, shut it down to everybody. But I don't think that's what this is, and I don't think that the fishermen should be denied to catch those fish up around Newburn and these places they've come back. I don't, I, don't, I don't believe that at all. I believe they should be able to catch all they can catch. I just believe that the resource should be shared equitably where it can be. And in this particular case, everything from division points to the fact that it can be. Thank you. Commissioner Ryder. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. As a totally personal comment, I, uh, I'm in despair that we aren't working together the way that Mr. Garrett suggested last night. And I think that is really a shame and that there's no reason that we can't get together because we are different but all conservationists. And the fact is, is that we've got plenty of people to band together against to be able to make a vision of um, a, a more prosperous future for North Carolina, one that really works for all of us. And so gi given that, you know, I feel like both of these motions to me are unsatisfying. And I'll just tell you, I'll just admit it now, part science and part isn't. You know, I, I think that um, the truth is, is that yes, the the commercial fishermen have been have not been asked, they've been told to miss opportunities for a set of years, N maybe not long enough to actually prove because of, for whatever set of reasons, the data haven't been taken to try to put final paid on some of these questions. But part of that is not whether or not the current gear net prohibition ought to be maintained in its current form, but rather how we ought to configure a broader set of gear net and area closures and other tools like that together that we can live with. And so I would be uh, willing to craft, I think, an in-between motion that, that, may, that would not take the, put the nets back in the water tomorrow, but would, and would give us some more time to maybe maybe we can't director get uh, everything we need to know from the science standpoint done in two more years perhaps on your original time frame 2024 20, 25 but that we can um, agree if we can't show that the thing is working by that time frame to have pre-planned that it goes away you know, or that it's adapted uh, with a broader set of tools that we can between now and then agree on, that we could build into the plan now uh, a sunset, whatever you want to call it, uh, for that, and also have the commission go on record specifying what the questions are that we want answered between now and then. So that we, and, and if you can't deliver, that's on us to help you find the partners and resources to to deliver. But I, I believe that, um, I, guess, I guess you're not supposed to announce how you're going to vote, but I would either oppose or abstain on both of these motions and would rather support a 2024-25 um, a prearranged um, sunset unless it's shown to, to be working uh, with a set of 
translations of what that means into something specific about striped bass spawning stock biomass in the Noose and Tar Pamlico, the broader question about uh, striped bass spawning stock, spawning biomass. And I'm, I don't mind including the broader question about other species. Fine. But let's do it. You know, I mean, we need to know whether or not and how to use this set of tools. So I, I'm sorry to be on the soapbox, and a, parliament, a lot got lost parliamentarily completely. But I think we, if there's something like that that we could put on the table, I would vote for it. Uh, yes, Director, please. Just really quick, just want to remind the Commission that this gill net restriction uh, was put in place for striped bass protection and not other species. And, I, and, I, and I'm not saying that one way or the other. I just want to clarify that in um, Appendix 3, Adaptive Management 3, to review the data through 2024 to determine if populations are self-sustaining and, and if sustainable harvest can be determined is strictly in regards to striped bass. And I just want to make sure that that's clear. Uh, yes, please. Yes, and because I think one of the big problems in the way the commission has chosen over the years to implement the FRA is by going the most convenient route and most traditional route of breaking this multifactorial, multidimensional beast into species by species FMPs. And as you know well, that's not the way, it, that's not required. You, know, you can break it at, down by any combination of areas and gears and species and however the interactions are most acute or rather however the entanglements are least able to be untangled, Gordian knot wise. And it may well be that the western Pamlico Sound and the Nusantar Pamlico estuaries are together a, a place where we ought to be putting our best attention to building a multi-species FMP and that recognize that uses all of these tools and recognizes the trade-offs. I mean, if you, uh, you, you I'm preaching the choir, you go and take a, f a fisherman of whatever ilk away from one species, they go where to another species. You take away one gear, they go to another gear. That transfer of effort, transfer of effect across those species is something we are always fighting. We're always running a step behind, and so I can imagine that it doesn't mean you have to do all of the stock assessments all at the same time, but rather as you, as you draw the pieces together, you can necessarily look at that. And I just believe that in this case, um, I wouldn't, I, I doubt, I seriously doubt that it honestly was about striped bass in the first place, because I really think the likelihood of rebuilding the stocks, and this is me as a scientist speaking, I think the likelihood is low in the noose and tar pamlico. I, uh, Commissioner Roller, I, I would absolutely join you in, in not giving up on that. And let, let's charge the Habitat and Water Quality Committee and everybody else that wants to play and go commit ourselves to, to solving those, identifying and solving those problems. And I just remember when I uh, chaired the South Atlantic Council's Habitat and Environmental Protection Advisory Panel, we wrote for the South Atlantic Council and they adopted a policy in a, a federal essential fish habitat policy on river flows and that is actionable on federal expenditures and, and permits. And so all of those, the, the, the noose, falls of the noose dam, you know, flows could, are actionable under fisheries law. And if we put our mind to it, I think we could do that. I'm, ju I'm, just, I'm just saying, anyway, I've talked too much, but, but I hope there is a middle ground. Commissioner Gardner, do you have something? I do. I, and I turn wanna, on your mic and speak into it, please. I, I want to thank um, Doug Grader for, for, for being persistent about this because I think I've developed, like, the fastest growing ulcer in the world. Like, coming into this, I have, this, is, this has been keeping me up at nights. And I don't want it to, but because, because, of the way that I came in to the, the uh, fishing community in North Carolina. I came in to a community that was everybody together, whether you were a recreational fisherman, whether you were a charter fisherman, whether you were a boat builder, whether you were commercial, we 
are together. And the way that this stands right now has me very concerned that the commercial aspect of the striped bass fishery will be written out completely eventually. And I have a big problem with that, but I also have a bigger problem with the fact that the 900 pound gorilla in the room is not being addressed, and that's water quality and habitat issues. And I just don't, I, I really feel like they go hand in hand. You cannot have a healthy fishery in sick water. And I, I think we all, as a group here, have to acknowledge that, and this is our opportunity to find a way to work together. And it just breaks my heart to see really good friends on all, all fronts here going up against each other. And it really makes me feel badly that when I walk out of here at the end of the day, I may not have half my friends or more. And, and I just don't feel like that's the right way to manage this fishery. Like, we have to come up with, you, or you, you, as, as I've committed myself to this, I've, I've committed to take, like, every time I show up to a meeting, I'm losing a lot of money because I'm not on the water. Like, a lot. This is my full-time business. And, and I just, now I've just lost what I was going to say about that, but I've committed myself to this, and I just feel like there has to be a better way to do this, to, to approach, especially these, the fish that are, that are, are anadromous fish, especially, they're coming and going, and they're so prone to so many different cycles and, and, and so many different factors that we can't manage for, like cold stuns, like climate change. And it's, I just, I plead with you to please, let's, let, if, I, I just feel like, the other thing, too, to Doug Rader's point, you're not going to get good data if you're not including the netting that's going on that would and should be going on with Amendment to, with, amendment to, with continuing to allow netting during that time. I, I feel like you have to have the full picture. So if that means... If it means... Going with, with Doug and Mike, then, then I, I feel that because I'm really worried that at the back end of this, we're going to be losing nets in other places and in other ways. And I'm really concerned that this, isn't, this is a backdoor way of, of putting an end to something. And I'm really sorry. I really didn't feel like I would have to speak like this today. I really was hoping <laughs> because... I just feel like this should be, when we say resource first, I really feel like it's the resource isn't just the fish. It's the entire fishery. It's the whole ecosystem. It, it, and it's so complicated in North Carolina. So I think I've, I've really gotten off on a tangent here, but I don't want, I just feel like this, we have to find a way to work together. Okay, other discussions? Uh, Commissioner Blanton. I've, I've really enjoyed this today. And, and, and I'm going to tell you why. And last night as well. Because it showcases the mentality that she just described of this clash between one group and another, one interest over another. The comments last night extremely showcased that. You have people coming in here giving public comment grumbling about seven boats. Seven people. Just seven. Count that on both hands. That, that they saw behind their house looking for a fish. Seven. I've, I can remember times going out in the Chesapeake Bay talking about striped bass years ago, and there would be 500, at least that many boats in the mouth of that bay. 
every one of them limited out on beautiful striped bass, charter boats going three trips a day. But it's not the hook's problem. Those, all them fish were caught by nets, and that's just one example of what I'm hearing here today. You hear about all these fish. Oh, there's so many more fish up there. It is so salty in our, in our system right now. Them fish are running, looking for something that's not choking them off. The crabs did the same thing this year. They caught crabs all the way to Gatesville in the Chowan River. That ain't been done in a long, long time. That is a very one-off scenario. This is a perfect storm, and I'm jaded by it because I have, I have been in this process of this FMP from the start. Even before that, when this little line got drawn in two river systems in Kinston by five commissioners writing a letter which was opposed by the DEQ secretary at the time, the director at the time, and four, three commercial commissioners, which it dealt completely with a commercial issue, and one other at-large commissioner that, that kind of got it. It's just wrong. We would, we would be done with this. We would have been done with this last, last um, meeting, had this, this, this ban, whatever you want to call it, wasn't even included in this. This would have been done. We'd have been moving on. These conversations would have never took place. A net catches a fish. A hook catches a fish. Discards are, 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 are way more considerable in a hook and line fishery than they are in a, in a net fishery. Why does the division use gill nets to do surveys? Why does the entire world use gill nets to do surveys? They're selective. They set them. They know they got to, they got to vary the mesh sizes. They see a juveniles to adults. It's plain and simple. It's the best way of doing business. They don't have to go out there and throw a million hooks. They don't have to go set a million hooks to hope something bites it. I just don't know what to say anymore. But it is not fair. To listen to these people come in here last night and this morning and, 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 and in multiple other meetings and just point the finger at gill nets over and over and over again and never take a look at themselves in the mirror. That's hard to swallow, seriously. All these people come in here and all they do is point their finger at one thing and it's a gill net. But they never take a minute to look at themselves in the face because I've, I don't know how many pictures I've seen on Facebook of people holding up fish with blood running right out their gills. I caught this fish. Ain't no problem, they're bleeding, throw it right back, discard. How many, how many of those fish did they catch that you, they didn't take a picture of were bleeding the same way? You don't ever know. But that's the problem I have is that, that, that we should not, absolutely, I agree with, with Commissioner Gardner, we should not be in this situation arguing about whether or not we're going to let somebody set a net. They catch fish just like a hook does. What's the problem with that? They're way more selective, way more selective. You know, I can't understand when you sit here and you look at a presentation that we just looked at from spotted sea trout, 90% of the catch is recreational. And you know what the questions that were, we had asked? Recreational commissioners asking about point or zero point one percent of discards in the in the in the overall fishery that were contributed to or to uh, commercial. Really, that's what you're worried about. Seriously, 
Those of y'all's questions, oh, it was, there was 0.1% of commercial discards, and I'm super concerned about that, and yada, yada, yada. Really? It is a slap in the face to all those in the commercial industry that try to survive, just like Mr. Caton Daniels pointed out last night. You cannot continue to take away and take away and take away and set this precedence that we can just rip and snatch away from the commercial industry, and it really just doesn't matter anymore. Eastern North Carolina is changing. The environment is changing. I can't tell you how many times I heard last night to reiterate, well, I moved here in 2017. Well, I moved here in, in 2009. Well, I moved here in 2014. Good, great. That is wonderful. The economic development of, this, of Eastern North Carolina has, has, has come up, I don't know how many fold, but quite a few. But it's getting more pop, densely populated, quite a few more opinions, but there's a traditional way of fishing in this state, and we have done all we can do to put in the regulations by proclamation, rule, FMP, statute, whatever have you, to mitigate any and every problem that we have come across with gill nets, hooks, uh, crab pots, and we're still continuing to work on these issues. But it doesn't make it fair to draw lines and say, you know what, because you're this user, you don't get to go up here and access none of these fish. But we do. We do. Because we're using a hook and we're recreational. And we're not bothering a thing because nobody stopped to look at themselves in the mirror. And it's, it's come due time to change the mentality. And I'm super jaded with this FMP and the way it was built. And it's been a, it's been a knuckle dragging fight the whole way to now. And we still can't make a decision. Okay, I want to kind of wrap up this discussion. Commissioner Roller. Chairman, do we have, um, can we make water quality decisions here at the Marine Fisheries Commission? Uh, no, we can't. We just have to regulate what we have in front of us to regulate. Yeah, and, and it was, you know, obviously a rhetorical question. Thank you for your answer. Sometimes we kind of get lost in the fact that what we do here is manage the fish that are left at the end of the day after the poor water quality farm runoff, climate change, that's what we have to do. And quite frankly, a lot of the times we have to make really crappy decisions. We also have to ask what we want our fisheries to look like because it's very clear that our fisheries are not performing for our stakeholders like they should. Our economy is changing. The makeup of our fisheries are changing. The makeup of the fishermen are changing. The makeup of the economy, who's fishing, you know, in Carter County, the young kids are becoming fishing guides now. They're not becoming mullet netters. So that's a thing we have to ask about. You know, we hear a lot about climate change. There's really nothing we can do here. My argument with climate change in fisheries, because I believe it is the number one threat, is that we need to be a lot more conservation-based. Right? And I also keep hearing about, well, no one can commercial fish up in the upper news. That's not true. You can commercial fish. You just have to do it differently than with nets. Now, the commercial community has been really resistant in the past to using hook and line and other methods. Maybe that's, you know, coming to bite them in the rear a little bit. Things need to be changed. You know, that's another thing that needs to be changed. And we can't make all those decisions here. But we have to remember this question. It's just, it's, it's, a, lot, it's a lot bigger than that. And I'm done. Okay, I think we've probably said all that there needs to be said, but I do want to ask the director two questions. Anytime a management measure is put into place, can you know if it's successful or a failure in two years, or two and a half years? So I think it depends on what it is and what we're trying to address, but based on the comments from staff, they feel like that in 2025, we can evaluate whether or not this gill net removal was effective for its intended stated purpose for the protection of striped bass. Am I, did I, is that correct? 
Yes, ma'am, and the harvest closure. Oh, yeah, right, and coupled with the harvest okay. closure. And the second question I have for you, if gill nets are let back into both the ferry lines, will, in your opinion, a species, a stock that is being overfished could be even further overfished, the striped mullet? So that that that's a tough uh, answer. I mean, a tough question. Um, but what I would say about strike, and we've had this d d this discussion internally. So you don't really know what the impacts would be. You don't know, you know, who would go back fishing. Would they go to those areas? Would they go to other areas? But what you what you also could say is that whatever measures this commission takes on strike mullet those measures would apply in those areas if the nets were back, whether they're, for instance, to supplement. If, the, if this commission adopts a supplement and some sort of management closure, closure uh, seasonal closure, those um, restrictions would apply in those areas. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to call for a vote on the substitute motion. Laura, would you conduct that, please? Yes, Chair. Commissioner Cross? Aye. Commissioner Blanton? Aye. Commissioner Huggins? Aye. Commissioner Gardner? Aye. Commissioner McNeil? No. Commissioner Rader? Abstain. Abstain. Commissioner Roller? No. Commissioner Shalom? No. Chairman Bizzle? No. So the vote is four, four to one. The motion fails. So now we go back to uh, the initial motion. Would you pull that up, please? Okay, we have this motion in front of us. Um, uh, the other motion. Okay, the original motion. Okay, scroll back down to. And um, Commissioner Rader, I know you mentioned something about a potential amendment to a motion. Do you care to make one to this? I'll make a uh, substitute motion that we approve Amendment 2 as written, except um, continuing the gill net prohibition through 2024 to allow for an assessment of its performance. And when I, when I say that, um, that includes the things we talked about specifically before to include the effect on stripe Mass, biomass in the central and southern region in the broader Roanoke and Albemarle region and of ancillary effects on other managed species. Okay. okay, we have a substitute motion up there uh, with, in a minute. Restate it, pl restate it, please. To approve Amendment 2 as stated except to um, maintain the Gillnet prohibition through 2024 to allow for an assessment of its performance according to the criteria that we just that I just enumerated. And your opinion, your your motion is stating that in 2024 we'll determine whether this is an effective tool for conservation. Yes, or absolutely. Not. absolutely. That okay. uh, to, right. Or whether we should continue it on or. 
ended. Right, as a, as a decision, yes, in, in, in order to decide at that point whether to continue it or not. All right. Is there, is there a second? Second. To this? Who seconded? Uh, Commissioner Shellam. Okay. Hold on. The director had a comment. Just one question about the specifics of if we, if we sunset in 2024, we will be analyzing that data in 2025. So are you... Is the motion uh, indicative of opening the fishery or the gill nets in 2024? I actually, actually kind of like pressure on us to, to get our act together between now and then, all of us. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm not I'm not kidding about that. Well, <laughs> then, but but I mean, data through 2024, we can't analyze until later on in 2025. Well, you can analyze the data that you have now to an begin answering questions that are on the table, and then as other data comes forward, you can do you can uh, you can do that. Would you rather have 2025? Is that what you're? Well, we should probably. Discuss well, I'm just that. I'm just trying to get clarification. I mean, um, we we. No, I'm, I'm actually just, not, you, I'm not presupposing what the outcome is. Right. You you would point. just. So the way this is written, this fishery would open back up while we're still analyzing data for success of its effectiveness of of it of the removals of the net. If, if that's what what the best that we can do, I, mean, I don't know. That, that I, have, I don't know. I have no idea what the alternative is. I mean, you know, how long, how long do you go? Twenty thirty, twenty forty. I mean. It, no, I, I mean I think twenty twenty five. Um, I, we just need clarification. Do you want us to? Allow the nets back in in 2024, and then no, no, no. Uh, closed, th th maintain the prohibition through 2024. Includes the, the year year of 2024. Right, and so, so that data five is a decision. That data that we need to analyze, we will not have until 2020, sometime in 2025. You complete the complete the complete series. That's yeah. true. So uh, that that was just clarification. My opinion is, well, I think we're in discussion now. I don't have a second. Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, we so do. My, my opinion is that that we will have most of the answers to most of these questions between now and then, and that a lot of them are, are relatively straightforward to I answer. I don't know if that's really the case. Can I Charlton, you, what, 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 what do you guys? Yeah, so first off, I guess, you know, the confusion is, you know, in the adaptive management, it says in 2025, review data through 2024. So it really is clarification of do you want to change that time frame? And it sounds like, you know, you do. As far as the data, um, really, I mean, we can, you know, start looking at this now. I mean, we look at our data annually, and we report that to you all through the FMP um, update. It's really a matter of, um, you know, how many years of data do you want to consider before making a decision? And just want to remind, um, you know, the commission, um, we've got a big data gap in 2020 because we didn't perform a lot of our sampling, you know, during the COVID year and that kind of stuff. So, you know, if you know, you want, you know, say three years of data, so, you know, you can do, you know, standard statistics, you know, all that on it, you know, you know, we, we need to take that in consideration. But, I mean, 2024 or 2025 would give us, you know, that time. What I'm really thinking is that the uh, Roanoke Albemarle stock is likely to require action anyway, and that that you will be doing and bringing back to us anyway. So that that piece of the question and answer is going to happen independent, I think, of this. And I, I suspect the first part would be relatively easy if you go to the plan development team and simply inquire about what a, a the likelihood would be of restoring those spawning populations in those rivers. I think everyone's going to say it's going to be low, and in order to do it, you would have to do A, B, C, and D. I have a lot of other stuff written down. One of them is actually I'm going to follow up with a, a a motion to request the Habitat and Water Quality Standing Advisory Committee and the CHIP Steering Committee together to identify and recommend priority non-fishing interventions necessary to promote these outcomes. And so that's coming, that's going to come next. Um, and so I think those things then go that way. And we have other, the Strike Mullet FMP will, will now beg this same question here as we move into that. So I'll just bet you that by the time 2025 comes, we will have broken this thing back apart and answered each of the key pieces. That's my opinion. Let, let me get some personal clarification on, on what you are proposing. If the data is available 
in 2024, we're going to make the decision then about the gill nets. And if not, as soon as staff can get it together, is that what I'm understanding you, you to say? Yes, I think it implies that we will have to act again in 2024 for the 2025 fishing year. Well, we'll have to <coughs> accumulate the data and know where we stand for yes. 2025. Yes. Okay. Commissioner Cross. I just want to ask a question based on leaving, uh, keeping a net. How are we going to determine if the nets are actually affecting the stocks if they're not in there? Now, if you can explain that, I mean, uh, I understand the premise behind it, but without some test of some kind, some control of some kind, how are you going to know if they're affecting it or not? It's a good question, Commissioner. And, and, and the way it's written on my pad is to um, allow the director to work with fishermen to implement a well-managed and monitored experimental fishing program in that zone targeting non-overfished species such as Min <coughs> Minhaden to provide important fishery-dependent data. And I, there, was some, there was some question about whether we ought to be specifying things like that. Well, then I would suggest you include that in your motion so that we know what direction we're heading in with the director so she's on a clear clear path. Is that possible to do, director? So we've, we've had some a few internal discussions about what that might look like uh, because we've talked about that, that this in the past and potentially having 100% observer coverage uh, and that would not be possible if everyone or potentially would not be possible if it was a completely open fishery uh, for everyone because we just have limited resources. Um, but we could do something uh, on a smaller scale, uh, allow you know a smaller uh, opening of those allowance of those gears in those areas that would require observer coverage if that's where, where um, Commissioner Rader is headed with this. Okay, I think we've had a lot of discussion on this subject, and I'm going to call for a vote. Would you do the roll call, please, Laura, on this substitute motion? Mr. Chair. Commissioner Cross? Nay. Commissioner Blanton? No. Commissioner Huggins? No. Commissioner Gardner? No. Commissioner McNeil? Yes. Commissioner Rader? Yes. Commissioner Roller? Yes. Commissioner Shellam? Yes. Chairman Bizzle? Yes. Motion passes five to four. Okay. So we will not take up the initial motion since we had the substitute motion that did pass. That ends our work for the day. I'll see everybody back here at nine in the morning. Thank y'all.